It's Championship Showdown Day. The final round of Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup, brings us to the Circuit de Catalunya. We're outside Barcelona, and it is a two-way fight for the overall crown. It is Mercedes versus Ferrari. Antonio Fuoco, the Ferrari driver, takes on the Acodis ASP Mercedes might. Rafael Marcello, Jules Gounon, and Danny Joncadea lead the championship, and they are in the pound seats with the final three-hour race of the season to come. The Mercedes has been a mighty car all season. Although mechanical woes did put it out of action last time at Hockenheim, it means they didn't score there, but they're still ahead in the standings and looking to take the crown this weekend. Well, it's not up to us, you know, it's up to our rivals to... They are the ones that uh, need to do something about it. We just focus on ourselves. We have a really strong car. We've always been very strong here, so we are confident that we can bring this home. And especially for me, I mean, it's my home race, so I'll enjoy it double if we win and if I do it in front of my home crowd. As Danny said, we've always been quick here. I mean, we, we don't have to find anything crazy. We, we have to be close to the Ferrari and then everything will be okay. Last year, uh, we had a quick car, but this year is different, different tires and stuff. We just need to be humble, work the way we did the whole season, continue to, to give everything, and then we see what happens. Antonio Fuoco didn't score either at Hockenheim. That means that he's on the back foot coming into this weekend. He's doing the chasing, but he's got a quick car, he's got two quick co-drivers, and the Italian former single-seater racer knows he's in with a good chance. We felt quite ready. Uh, we want to give our uh, maximum. We were a bit unlucky the last race, but uh, uh, we, are, uh, we arrive here in Barcelona with all the team. I think we are on a good position. We know that 11 points is not easy, but we need to do our best. We need to try to do a really three good laps on, on quali and then uh, push for the race. That We know it's a three hour is a long race, but uh, somehow it's also a short race. So we need, to, we need to push from the beginning until the end. In the Gold Cup, it is the inception race in McLaren that leads the way. Oli Milroy, Frederick Chandor, and Brandon Arib have taken two victories this season, and they are ahead on points coming into this last round. And Brandon Arib is flying in from America on race day morning in order to try to go for gold in the Gold Cup. Yeah, we had a strong one at Hockenheim uh, to take, retake the lead after Spa. Uh, the 83 Ferrari had a really strong showing at Spa. But yeah, it was a good day, and hopefully we can carry that momentum into this weekend. I think strategy is going to come into play and staying out of trouble. So that's the exciting thing about GT World Challenge, really. And it's good that the championship's this close at the end of the season. It's probably suit more the Ferrari than us at the moment, uh, but let's see. We are def working hard on the car, and I'm sure we're going to have it back in a good shape for, for the race and hopefully we can keep it good for, for the championship. Opposition to the McLaren drivers, though, comes from another Ferrari team. This is the Iron Danes entry, run by Iron Lynx. Rahal Frey, Sarah Bovi and Michel Gatting won at Spa. They took a bag full of points there and could take the title this weekend. So far, it's been a very, very good season. Honestly, I don't think we expected to come here for the final round of GT World Challenge this year and actually be fighting for the championship. At the end of the day, we know it will be tough, but uh, I mean, we don't want it to come easy either. And we are going to be fighting the three of us. And uh, if you ask Sarah, she's going to say that we're going to bring it home. Where I'm <laughs> probably more a bit like, mm, let's wait and see. <laughs> we know that to win a championship, especially when it's that competitive, you need a little bit of everything. Of course, you need a lot of performance, but you need that little bit of luck. I really believe we can do it, but what I hope is especially that we go back home with no regrets, that we give everything we have here, and then whatever happened, we have to be happy about what we did this season, you know? Pro-Am is up for grabs as well this weekend. Louis Machiels and Andrea Bertolini are serial winners of titles in SRO GT Championships. Stefano Costantini is the third driver, and they are, again, the favourites. They want to win the class this weekend on track, but just finishing should net them the title. It's true that we have just to finish, but uh, the mentality, they have to be always the same one. So we have to try to do the, our best and why not also to win the race. We are here to fight. We are racing drivers and yeah, we always want to win. So the overall, it would be a dream. And of course, we have to stay calm and enjoy the weekend. That's the most important as well. Alexander West and Miguel Ramos are chasing hard, joined by Enrique Chavez this weekend for Garage 59 within this Pro-Am battle. And again, the McLaren is a car that's competitive, but they're going to have to really score well to take the crown here. You never know. Uh, it happened also to us. 
several times this year in endurance, uh, bad luck in the, uh, going to the win and then in the last hour having whatever technical issue. So it can happen. So we are here to win. So we'll try our best and then we'll see. We'll try our best and as Miguel said, we can only try to win our race and then we'll see what happens. Another car to watch in Pro-Am is this Mercedes, the SPS Automotive Performance Entry that Dominic Bauman and Valentin Pierberg have shared for the bulk of the season. But at Spa, Dominic Bauman found himself with different co-drivers and therefore is on a different number of points than Pierberg. He's therefore handed back some of the points that were scored there so he can be on an equal number with Valentin Pierberg and hopefully, with him, take the crown. To be a professional driver and winning it just by myself is not really fair. Uh, I understand the rules, obviously it was a bit of a mess, like a lot of changes in Spa. Uh, I swapped the car in the same class, so I got more points than the others. I was leading, but now I'm back together with Valley on third position, and the team is still able to win the championship at least. In silver, the car to beat in both endurance and sprint this year has been this WRT run Audi. Jean Baptiste Simonal, Thomas Neubauer, and Benjamin Goethe have worked really well as a team. They're already the champions, and Benjamin Goethe has dyed his hair in celebration. I mean, we were all three meant to change our hair. Thomas got a little haircut. JB will shave his head by the end of the weekend, don't worry about that. But yeah, I had to do something special for the last race of the year. It was, a, I think, a very good year from like Christian and Audi, so it was very intense this season. For the race, I think the focus would be like the other, just focus on the race, on what we do, and not really on the result, and it will come uh, with a performance. Well, obviously, we want to win the last silver race we have, uh, and obviously do a, a great result overall, and, and obviously to grab this, uh, this championship for the team, so yeah, that's it. It's our final Endurance Cup race of the season. There are, of course, sprint championship points that have already been scored to add to these Endurance to give you the full season overall combined championship. The overall class for any drivers. In Pro-Am, you've got a makeup of platinum and two bronze. In the Silver Cup, it's silver drivers only and a maximum of one platinum, one silver and one bronze within the Gold Cup. For a race like this, we've got 48 cars from seven different manufacturers. Audi, BMW, Ferrari, Lamborghini, McLaren, Mercedes and Porsche all represented on the grid. There are mandatory pit stops in which all four wheels must be changed. You do a driver change as well and a maximum driver stint, 65 minutes. And there's a minimum refueling time as well for every car. That's the time that the fuel hose has to be connected for. There's one point for pole position in each class. And for this race, it's 25 for a win, points for the top 10, with just one point scored for 10th position. For the teams, there's also the Fanatec points boost, five points for the winning team, based on the results of the pro esports race held on the Saturday evening in the Fanatec arena. And this Fanatec GT race, part of the global competition, which is being led by Mercedes AMG from Audi Sport. And third and chasing is Ferrari. And so we are almost ready to go racing. It has been a really interesting weekend thus far because so much of yesterday was down to tyre usage uh, when we had pre-qualifying and free practice this morning's qualifying session uh, in pretty chilly conditions. And uh, now as the grid starts to form, temperatures are much, much higher than we experienced this morning. And for the teams, this is the first time really they will have run new rubber in these much warmer temperatures. Uh, the grid, uh, based on the average of the time set this morning in qualifying, it puts the Ferrari of Antonio Fuoco onto pole position, thanks to his efforts, as well as those of Alessandro Pierguidi and Alessio Rivera. David Addison and John Watson trackside. Uh, it's that time of the year, John. There's a, a calculator on the desk, but there's also a race to worry about in isolation. There are people out of that championship hunt that want to finish off the season in style as well. Yes, it's a, it's a race to win, and there's four categories within that race, so everybody will be looking to do the best that they can within their respective class. But um, we saw this morning in qualifying, it was cool as it was on Saturday morning, but the big trouble, as is ever, when you get 48 cars on a racetrack and three 15-minute qualifying segments, where do you find the clear lap? And some drivers did better than others, and some cars are certainly out of position in relative to their normal performance. And now we've got a track temperature very similar to what we had yesterday in that pre-qualifying session, but the ambient temperature is up. Now, whether that's going to have a bearing on what happens to drivers, cars, tires, tires don't want to start talking about tires because ultimately, 
it will be about the preservation of as many sets of new tyres as is possible that will see you have a bigger advantage over your competition. So there's also the traffic to factor into all of this as well. It is a big grid, which is what we like, but the drivers don't like it when they get to the last sector, which is with the chicane. It's a bit like a car park there at times this morning. Uh, now, one of the drivers that's in with a chance of winning the championship comes here as the championship leader is Jules Gounon. Let's hear his thoughts. He's with Gemma Scott. Jules, great to have you back racing again. How's your back? It's OK. It's a bit sore, but uh, when you're playing a championship, you don't care how sore you are. So. We had a lot, of, a lot of work to do, but my bike is okay. Well, the most important thing is, of course, is always your health. But uh, like you say, there's a lot of work to do. It looked tough for you this morning in qualifying. Yeah, it was uh, as expected. You know, we always uh, give it all in free practice to show the pace, and we had nothing left on the table. And this morning, we, I don't know, we just had no, not so much pace. We still uh, qualified on P8, and uh, there is still a lot of stuff to do. So maybe we missed a bit the, the quality setup. I don't know, but we will uh, investigate that after the race. Now I think we have a strong race set up, so hopefully we can go forward and uh, fight the Ferrari. Which stint will you take? Uh, so we decided to change a bit, then you will go for first, and I will go second and Lelo third. Leave him fighting through to the end. Thank yeah. you very much. Have a great one. Thank you very much. So Jules Grunard then just uh, touching on that different driving order. And uh, the number 88 Mercedes then is uh, good to go and is uh, going to take the fight to the Ferrari. Danny Junkadea to go first, but the Ferrari starting on pole position very much is in the box seat, isn't it? Yeah, and as Alessandro Pierre Greedy will do that first stint, and he was pretty impressive this morning in qualifying, and uh, I think that that's a big task right now for the 88 Mercedes AMG GT3 to get on to terms with the Iron Links Ferrari, and of course traffic will be an issue. We saw, well, we, we saw, I certainly saw the start of the GT4 race some hour and a half ago, and it was chaotic. And in fact, a lot of that race was run under safety car conditions. So hopefully, hopefully, we will not see a repeat of what we had in the GT4 event earlier. And we can get a clean start and get this race underway and not have safety car breeding safety cars. And on it goes. Track conditions are lovely. It's a bit warm, but track conditions are lovely. The circuit looks absolutely stunning. It's a beautiful day here in Barcelona. And you know, what a great location for the finale of these 10 rounds, sprint and endurance. And who will be the worthy winner? Well, nobody can predict that. Indeed so. And uh, there's already a point for Antonio Fuoco for pole position. So that has to be factored in now to all of the calculations. So we've heard from the Mercedes corner. What about the Ferrari corner uh, going into this? The Iron Lynx team then looking after Antonio Fuoco. And Antonio is with Jam. Antonio, it's busy down here. I think it's possibly the busiest grid we've seen since Spa, and the pressure's on for you guys now. Obviously, starting in pole this morning, you really pushed hard in qualifying, and it's just going to convert now with everything <laughs> crossed. Yeah, I mean, uh, for sure, we'll be, we'll be really tough. Uh, we did a really good job this morning, all the three drivers. We put a really good lap together. Uh, I mean, we are here, so we are on uh, best position to start. But uh, as I said, we will be really, really hard. We, we try to do our best. Uh, Halle, we start the race. We know he's uh, a really good driver. He has a lot of experience, so we, we do our best and we see at the end. What are your main concerns? <laughs> um, I hope the best for us, but I mean, as I said, the race will be, will be long, so we just need to focus on ourselves. It's quite, uh, quite warm today, so we will be really tough in terms of tyre degradation, so we try to manage uh, as much as we can, and then we see, we see at the end. Thank you very much. Have a good race. Thank you. So Antonio Fuoco potentially to do the last stint, because quite often you will keep your fastest driver in at the very end. If you get a late race safety car, that's when you need the fastest driver to gain places, not lose them. Uh, other teams trying to keep some of the uh, temperature out of the cars. Now, we were saying yesterday, just going back to the Ferrari for a moment, that Iron Lynx, of course, did have the opportunity to have uh, another competitive car up the front to help. It's the 51 entry of Nicholas Nielsen, Miguel Molina and Giancarlo Fisichella. Well, Fisichella didn't get a time in in Q3 because uh, there was a coming together between him and the McLaren of Dennis Lynn. So Fisichella actually starts on the back row of the grid. From there, he can't be much help. All he can do is just hover around the back of the field and when the 71 comes through, assuming it's in the lead, give it the best opportunity to get through quickly and cleanly. And then whatever might be following, whether it's the 64 or 54 Porsche, the 159 garage uh, uh, McLaren or Emil Frey Racing's Lamborghini, make their life more difficult. That would maybe be an unfair strategy, but it, you know, in love and war, all counts. Absolutely right. So uh, 
Let's hear the thoughts from Emil Frey. Albert Costa, Spanish driver, home ground. He is on the second row of the grid, again with Gemma. Albert, your home race. Everybody here just for you, of course. Well, I've got to ask you, last time you started here in third, and we spoke, I believe you won the race. There's a bit of a superstition there, because you asked me to come back. This is true. Last time I was here in 2019 in P3, we were starting uh, at the end of the straight, I was P1. Unfortunately, this time I will not be in the car in the start. I will be in the second steam. But uh, yeah, at the end, uh, we're going to get it as a team. And uh, yeah, I hope the race is just solid. We can show the real pace we have and we can bring it home. I think it's very important, this race for us, as we never did any good result uh, in, in endurance. So I cross fingers. Let's push until the end. Well, hope, hopefully me coming to speak to you again has helped. I hope. I hope. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Albert. Have a good bye one. Bye-bye. <laughs> Well, let's see whether it is going to be a lucky charm. Uh, Victoria's here in the past, and of course, one car, one driver, around whom there's a huge amount of attention. Number 46 Audi, Valentino Rossi's fans are here in big numbers, and uh, the number 46 Audi, he will start from the sixth row of the grid. So, uh, Valentino's last uh, race of the season, as far as we're aware, he's, he's got a, a, an idea to try and do the Gulf 12 hours, but let's find out. There's Vincent Voss, who comes over from WRT, the, Team principal to wish him well. This starts to bring to an end the Audi WRT Association. Again, there are these IGTC races to factor in, but as far as Fanatec GT is concerned, uh, it's the end of an era. And uh, WRT and Audi, something like 30 titles won uh, in GT racing. Chris Reinke of Audi, the uh, head of the customer racing division, also comes over to wish Valentino Rossi well. Am I right in saying this is the first endurance race that he started? I know he'd have started sprint races, but ask me another in endurance terms. I think, I think you, you may well be right. I mean, it's a big ask for yeah. Valentino. He's on the sixth row of the grid, so he's just at the very back of that front group of cars. And of course, going into turn one, into turn two, then all the way around that long turn three, he will have to be on his toes because there'll be cars alongside him, there'll be cars behind him. He'll be looking at the car directly in front of him. You need to have almost eyes, sort of 360 degree eyes, to make sure that you stay out of trouble and. You know, there's always a little bit of danger. You go into those first three corners a little bit too cautiously, and that's worse than going in sometimes being over ambitiously. This the 60th Endurance Cup uh, race since the championship began in 2011. And uh, you've seen the uh, thank you, it's been a blast uh, legend on the WRT run Audis. Uh, from the four occasions that Barcelona has played host to an endurance race, Mercedes AMG has taken three wins. The exception being in 2019 when it was a, a Lamborghini win. And uh, Miguel Ramos, having already won the class, the Pro Am class in sprint, could also do so the same in endurance and also, uh, therefore, the combined Pro Am titles. And uh, we are about set, I think, to get things pretty much underway. Drivers getting into cars, seatbelts being done up. The race due to start at 3 o'clock local time, so we're just over 10 minutes away from that. Valentino Rossi did start at Paul Ricard, yes. So he has been, if you like, in the firing line before for the first stint. Uh, that was a, a race to put him in at the start, given that uh, that was constant light at the beginning of the race. But, uh, yes. He takes the start here for the final Endurance Cup race of the Fanatec GT season. So there is that mighty grid stretching all the way down the pit straight. All of them, of course, the same spec of car, all GT3, but across the classes of overall of Pro-Am, silver and gold. So it is the end of an era. Vincent Voss and Audi. Uh, and uh, Vincent can reflect on this time with Gemma. Vincent, 13 seasons with Audi. This is going to be quite an emotional race for you guys. Yeah, it has been already uh, quite emotional. I mean, yeah, 13 uh, exceptional, exceptional years um, with a with a great partner and uh, with a great partnership, a lot of success. And uh, yeah, this is the last one at least. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's open a new chapter. But let's finish this one on a high. Absolutely. Have a great race. Thanks, Thank Vincent. You. Thank you. So Vincent Voss, who of course was no mean racer himself, we tend to talk of him as the man behind WRT, but uh, he was uh, a pretty competitive single-seater racer before going to GT races, won the Spa 24 hours in a Chrysler Viper, of course, and uh, then just about anybody who is anybody in Belgian motorsport has gravitated to WRT, and it's been an absolute powerhouse, winning race after title after title after race in GT, and of course a very successful DTM period recently as well for, with Audi.
So it's the national anthem of the home nation is played. The grid is getting closer to being released on the formation lap. The number 159 Garage 59 McLaren, Nicolas Schiergaard to start that car and it will start from fourth on the grid. He, along with Manuel Maldonado, Dean McDonald, looking really impressive this morning. In fact, John, all the McLarens had good pace this morning. In fact, they've been all very strong and the fact that that car, Dean McDonald, set the fastest single lap over those three qualifying sessions. One of two drivers to get below the woman at 44 lap time and uh, Dean McDonald has got that honour. Only by a few thousands of a second, but nevertheless, He'll be very proud of that achievement. So the grid formed. Let's have a little wander up. And you see the Ferrari of Antonio Fuoco and the Porsche alongside of Klaus Backler, the second row. Lamborghini Jack Aitken to start alongside Nikolai Sheergaard and then Christian Kleens, McLaren, Lucas Legere's Audi for company. Charles Witt is alongside Danny Junkadea. Then you've got Mario Engel and Luca Giotto uh, ahead of Rob Bell in the green McLaren. Valentino Rossi alongside him. Leo Roussel's Lamborghini and then Kim Louis Schramm ahead of Benjamin Goethe. Nicholas Bart's Red Audi alongside. Constant Lapalainen is next. Philip Eng in the BMW ahead of Tom Adroe and then Giorgio Rowe. Go back a row, Sebastian Bode lines up alongside Alex Arca, Neil Verhagen and Sarah Bovey come next, ahead of Alfaisal Alzuba and Jens Liebhauser. Ezekiel Perez, Compank and Jordan Love, both in Mercedes, ahead of Alexander West and Ralph Bohm. Then there's Hubert Hauptler's Arnold Robin, Benjamin Heites and Thierry Vermeulen, ahead of the Ferrari of Hugo Delacour and Brendan Arive in from America in the McLaren. Alex McDowell and Finley Hutchison are next ahead of Alex Malikin and then the Lamborghini of Baptiste Moulin. Ian Loggi and Carrie Moje on the next row ahead of Louis Machiels and Chris Froggatt. Then Nico Gomar and Isaac Lopez. And at the back of the grid, Giancarlo Fisichella and Maciej Blazek. Ferrari and McLaren then rounding out the grid. So that is what a 48-strong lineup looks like. And in a moment, then they're going to be released. And uh, yeah, John, it, we've seen this in other races this weekend. Keeping out of trouble over the first few corners is going to be absolutely key, isn't it? I mean, let's hope so. I and mean, we've always seen incidents in turn one, turn two, that sort of bottleneck going in and then the transition through turn two. So hopefully, and we say it every time, hopefully everybody will be aware it's a three hour race. We do want to spoil it by having incidents and then having to spend a period of time behind you know, a full course yellow or a safety car deployment. In fact, in the, in the, uh, the GT4 race, they had a red flag at... Uh, That's right. Yeah. Basically, there were so many cars off the racetrack, I think there wasn't enough support vehicles to be able to get them onto the back of flatbed trucks or however to get them out of the gravel. So hopefully, hopefully, we'll have a clean start and a clean series of opening laps. Indeed so. And uh, if you run wide at turn one, then, OK, you get out of trouble, but the regulations for the circuit say that you must go behind a bollard so you're not gaining any advantage by that and uh, fingers crossed it's going to be a clean race we want it to be interesting we want it to be exciting we don't want it to be as destructive and uh, as fragmented as the gt4 showdown was but with lots and lots of fans here which is great to see all looking down onto the grid right now and many of them only have eyes for audi number 46 but there's a lot more to this race than just valentino rossi and so the Instruction will be given in a moment then to release the cars, ready to get the formation lap underway. Off blasts the lead Green car. Flag. Green flag is waved. And the voice in the background, you just heard that of the race director, Alain Adam. And I suspect you'll hear more from him as the race cycles through, especially when it comes to any interruptions or any penalties that will need to be offered. So they're all on Pirelli rubber, and this lap gives them a chance to get some temperature into those tyres as the cars now head towards Turn 1. Fantastic sound just beneath us as the grid is unleashed and down through Turn 1. It's a long, long straight, isn't it, that pit straight? It drops downhill, and then straight away you start to climb up the other side. Yes, but it is the bottleneck into Turn 1 that's always been a, a feature here in Barcelona. Then it releases coming out of Turn 2. The very long turn three, but you've got to be careful because you run too wide on the outside. That's a penalty zone. If you get four wheels off the basic, what is the, they call the racetrack, then the white demarcation line, there's a bit of green tarmac. Anything beyond that green tarmac is into penalty area. 
Now, we've had a look at the grid already uh, in terms of the cars. Now you can have a look at what the start drivers look like, as uh, you see, for example, starting from the sixth row of the grid. Uh, Ollie Wilkinson, normally Rob Bell takes the first stint, so quite a few other teams doing something different here on the driver rotation at the end of the season. And uh, it was Rob, of course, who was involved in that first lap prang at Hockenheim. Further back on the grid, Philip Eng returning because clashing sports car races this weekend have shuffled driver lineups in one or two cases. So Philip Eng steps in for Nick Katzberg at Rover. Alex Arker, who won the silver championship in the eSports Pro Series last night. Neil Verhagen won to watch in the junior. Uh, team BMW run by Rover. And 25th on the grid, Alfaisal Al Zuba, quickest yesterday in pre qualifying. So he's going to be a, a man to watch as well. Number 33, Audi, Arnold Robout starts. That was in the wall yesterday. Suffered a bit of damage, uh, but uh, has been repaired and was looking pretty decent this morning. And Brendan Areeb did his minimum two and a half hours in the States in the race out there. Jumped on a plane, got here overnight straight into the qualifying and he will be the start driver and he'll sleep well tonight I'm sure. Alex Malikin in the Allied Racing Porsche sharing with Aitch and Guven. that could be a car to watch as the race goes through. Ian Loggy, the British GT Championship leader will start the SPS Automotive Performance. Mercedes Louis Mackey is looking for yet another Pro-Am crown and Chris Froggett for Sky Tempesta Racing just looking for a good result to round out the season and Giancarlo Fisichella he's going to be a man to watch in this first stint up from the back of the grid he didn't get a time in Q3 therefore you couldn't average out the three qualifying times any car that doesn't take part in all three sessions automatically it goes to the back same true for Matthijs Blažić starting alongside him that McLaren had problems this morning and therefore uh, unable to average three lap times across the board it is the final round of Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup. It's three hours of action at Barcelona, and we are about to go racing. Is this going to be a Ferrari circuit? Can Mercedes get up the order? We're about to find out. Tires, tires, tires. Boring subject, but it will be absolutely crucial. Apart from how you use your tires, be aware that around the circuit, certainly coming out of turn 16, all the way around turn three and others within the infield, there will be a lot of rubber being shredded off the tire, and that will then effectively narrow in some parts of the racetrack. The racing line that might only be little more than a car wide. And again, that's something drivers are going to have to be on their toes and be aware of. Well, they're also going to have to be aware of track positioning down to the first corner. So the safety car, the pace car as it is, is in. And the field up through turn 16. Look at that, what a sight. And it is then on pole position. Alessandro Pierguidi alongside him, Klaus Backler. The final round of the championship is go, go, go. Lights are green. It's Ferrari that will lead. Porsche, then Lamborghini on the run down towards turn one. So Alessandro Pierguidi gets the drop on everybody. Klaus Backler is second. And an effort being made on the inside line there by Jack Aitken to try to get up the inside of the blue Lamborghini from Emil Frey Racing. He's done it. He's gone through. So Jack Aitken is second. And now we need to see everybody making it through safely. There's one that's run wide and off the road and back on again. It's one of the Audis, I think. Also, Philip Eng's BMW was off the track and back on. But so far, so good. But a really good getaway then by Pierguidi. He used every advantage of being in pool position and then uh, ran down into turn one clearly in the lead. But a great start by Jack Aiken to get that 63 Lamborghini ahead of Klaus Backler. That's a difficult car to overtake under normal circumstances. To do it into the first corner will give Aiken that opportunity to now focus on the back of the 71 Ferrari. You never know what's going to happen at the end of three hours. Indeed so. But right now, Pierre Guidi is trying to build that lead. Jack Aitken in second place, and there on the outside line, number two, that's Mauro Engel, and he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Audi of Charles Wirtz. Look, as they come up the hill and stays ahead of him, so the Mercedes fends off Audi. What we haven't yet really factored in is whether rival Mercedes teams might help Akodis ASP, because it's the same brand, even though it's a rival team, to take on Ferrari. Big dive to the inside by Ollie Wilkinson in the McLaren. That's Valentino Rossi ahead of him and alongside him, but Rossi goes a little bit wide and the door is open, but the McLaren now tries to get up alongside Rossi will have the inside line look for the next corner stays ahead yes came in enough room in turn 10 and got through turn 11 cleanly and got ahead or kept ahead of Ali Wilkinson in the 38 Judah McLaren so Valentino Rossi has survived the first two-thirds of the opening lap here in Barcelona but down into the very tight and 20 and look 38 Lamborghini sorry 38 McLaren has to shortcut now did he make up a position or not in the process if he did he'd have to give that back would like to see that again because it all happened in the blink of an eye. 
Well, he didn't gain a place, I don't think, but he gained time, didn't he? Because he was able to go quicker through that section, came out ahead, and we've got a car that's run wide coming off turn 16. He's already in the background. It is one of the Emil Frey Lamborghini, his number 19 it was, that ran wide. That's Leo Roussel. He's got going again, and we've got a car coming into the pit lane as well, and that's 188. So one of the cars fighting for the Pro-Am lead in the championship, Alexander West, at the end of the opening lap, has just come down the pit road. So drama, there he is in Pro-Am right from the start. Alexander West to the pits. And there's nothing obviously wrong with that, and the team not looking as though it was ready for him anyway. No, I don't know whether he didn't give them enough warning whether he was coming in the pit lane or not. So we've got another car in the pit lane been pulled back. So one of the that's a GT4 car, so that's it coming is. out of scratch, coming out of the uh, park for May, being pushed back down the pit lane against uh, slightly late in the day, one would say, but. The McLaren is in the pit lane up in the air. Jacks, the car is off. I can just see it was pushed into the garage. Whatever the problem is, it needs more than two people working on it to rectify whatever the issues are. Now, this is fun and games coming from the chicane down towards turn 16. And getting turned around was the number 31 Audi. And oh, that's why 188 is in the pits, because it got caught up in that incident as the Audi of Finlay Hutchison was turned around and the McLaren glanced it. And there's probably enough damage to put that well, it's going to be as good as out of the race, because it's going to lose a, at least a lap, if not two. Yeah, not that's you can see carbon fibre being shredded between the Audi and the McLaren. So McLaren, an innocent victim of that incident, incident and very frustrating for the Garage 59 team. Now, the leaders come through at the end of lap two, and it's still Pierre Guidi ahead then, so he's trying to build that lead as the cars go down towards turn one. 2.3 seconds, Jack Aitken in second place there in the Lamborghini, third the green Porsche, Klaus Backler, fourth Christian Klein, fifth Nikolai Sheergaard, Danny Junkadea is sixth then ahead of Charles Witz, then Luca Giotto, Valentino Rossi is in tenth place and a big dive there was being made by Philip Eng on the inside down towards turn one, you're on board with Rossi. So Klein Leo to turn two, got his focus on Luca Giotto in the car collection, Audi directly ahead of him, there is the BMW and hearing very positive comments about what BMW have got. The technology in that car is pretty very, well, they call it virtually a race car more than a production car. And waiting to see whether that will be further progress, but look at the McLaren under threat already. Into the pits has come Leo Roussel, into the pits has come Finlay Hutchison with his damage. Philip Eng then uh, onto the back now of the Costa Lapa line and driven Lamborghini. And they're down at turn seven, that left-hander. Go right at eight up the kerb, and then the climb up the hill. So as they get to the top of that part of the circuit, over the brow, then the fast straight down towards turn ten, which has a sort of narrow feel to it with walls on either side. There is the Iron Dames Ferrari battling in gold with number 911. So that is uh, Sarah Bovi fending off Ralph Bone. And Giancarlo Fisichella is making very, very good progress as well. At the end of the second lap, he was up into 32nd, having started 47th on the grid. Well, so much from me suggesting he might be hanging back to wait <laughs> and let uh, Alessandro Pierguidi gain an advantage. But there is Fisichella, and with such experience over many, many years behind a wheel of a variety of race cars, now behind the Sky Tempesta, Mercedes AMG GT3. And will he be able to gobble up the Mercedes coming down? into turn one at the beginning of what will be lap four. Well, that's Brandon Areeb, who is hustling along in gold. Of course, looking for the championship title against the Iron Dames Ferrari. Right now, the Gold Cup being led by Mercedes number five, which is Hubert Haupt, who's got to disappear after his stint to get to an important business meeting. So that's why he's the nominated start driver. And there, side by side, down towards turn one. Audi on the inside, Lamborghini on the outside line, the VSR. Lamborghini number 163 is the one under attack, and Thierry Vermeulen tries to squeeze through and retake the place. He's up on the inside line there to get himself past Baptiste Moulin. The road comes to the Audi. It certainly does, and of course, turn four is to the right. Lambo runs wide on the exit, and uh, that allows the Audi just to consolidate its overtake. And once you've got ahead, then you can make life very difficult for the car that you just passed. And there we see Valentino Rossi in relatively clear air, nobody really behind him whatsoever, and he's been pulled along by uh, Giotto, so that's giving Valentino... He can see what a competitive Audi is capable of doing, and maybe that'll help him in this stint that he's going to be behind the wheel just for one hour, I would imagine. And he's staying with them, of course, yep. as well. He's not dropping away. Valentino Rossi is hanging on in there, doing a good job, and as the fuel load comes down, and the 
uh, tyres get warmer, he should go quicker. But an incident between uh, number 19, which was the Leo Russell, and 46 Valentina Rossi Audi has been noted. Now, Emil Frey have just asked to retire number 19. Car 19 and car 46 in turn one noted. Incident between car 31 and car 7 in T15 noted. 31 is Finley Hutchison. We saw the damage and the other car that got involved with him. Number seven, Brendan Areeb. So the gold cup leader being looked at for an incident. On the uh, apex of T14 drivers noted. watching in the pits as down towards turn one comes Oliver Wilkinson in the McLaren Lucas Legere is behind him and then number 30 out in the Gulf delivery car in the hands of Benjamin Goethe. So just to go back to that, Valentino Rossi has been involved in an incident that's being looked at and so is Brendan Areeb. Significance of Brendan Areeb is that he's fighting for Gold Cup honours. Didn't really see any of the incidents that have been noted, so whether they occurred on the opening lap or the laps following there, you can see the gaps between 11 and 12. Well, this, I think, is the Valentino Rossi incident from the start. Have a look at the yellow Audi. There to the inside line goes the Lamborghini, and that's delayed as a consequence. And then the incident with Brendan Areeb was Finley Hutchison being turned around, which we did see, and Hutchison then being collected by Alexander West. Yep. Can't really tell whether there was contact between the Audi and the Lamborghini going into turn one, or whether just he got the Lamborghini got squeezed by Valentino taking what he thought was his race line. Whatever way around is, it's going to be investigated. But very, very competitive down into turn ten. Will it be Philippe Eng in the 98 BMW just hovering around, waiting to see how the two Audis and the Lamborghini look? How close it look? The BMW almost shoving the Lamborghini through the corner of Lapalan and it's not going to be overly happy if there's contact from, from behind. Very true. This is Lucas Legere, who is on the back of Ollie Wilkinson. Now, this is, if you like, the second wave. They, they are losing time. They're a bit stuck behind Wilkinson at the moment. Eng all over the back there of Lapalan and as you say, 14th and 15th, those two. Uh, for the championship, Pierre Guidi still leads. Junkadea is in sixth place, so Danny Junkadea not yet making further progress. Replay here. This is going to be Brendan Areeb and Finlay Hutchison because as they come out of the corner, around goes Hutchison. Bang! That was Alexander West collecting him. And that's why Brendan Areeb is being looked at. And the fact that the far-reaching consequences won't help his case. Well, that's just raced out by the way, not by a race leader, but by Jack Aiken charging in second place. But 2.7 seconds down there is Jack Aiken. So he's got close Butler all around the back of the Lamborghini and the field's really stretched out pretty quickly. Normally we don't see this kind of stretch so early in a race and Valentino Rossi still hanging in the tail of this lead group of cars. So right now we're on lap six and the lead gap, as John says, 2.7 seconds. There's Valentino Rossi, who is currently running in 10th spot, chasing after Luca Giotto. And number 111, Christian Clean, is in fourth place, but he's got a transponder that's failed. So there he is, coming down towards turn 10. That is Christian Clean, just ahead of Nikolai Sheergaard, who is at the moment the driver leading the Silver Cup for Garage 59. So again, two McLarens looking really racy there, one from the Pro, one from the Silver category, but they are together, and they've got good pace, keeping, of course, ahead of Danny Junkadea. Yeah, that'll be a frustration for the 88 Mercedes team, because... They, would, they need to get to the front as quickly as possible. OK, we've still got the option of the two pit stops that will come later in the race, but you want to try and make progress while your tyres are still fresh and you've got the opportunity. Uh, but getting ahead of Sheergaard and Christian Klein, who are in their own little McLaren war, will no be easy task. No, indeed. Hubert Hout leads gold at the moment in number five. So the very experienced Hubert Hout, he was part of Audi's DTM works program back in what 1990 and, uh, and spent some time in America took a few years away from the sport came back all rejuvenated and uh, owns the team as well as races and has even gone back to the DTM in the last couple of seasons as well uh, as far as the gold championship is concerned right now it's an absolute tie between the Iron Dames and Inception Racing so that would come down I can't do it quickly enough to the number of wins that each of the two teams has had because if it's a tie on points then you go to wins then you go to seconds and so forth Chris Frog had also making progress and in the gold uh, category at the moment on track running ahead of Brendan Areeb so it's down to Ollie Milroy and Frederick Schandorf to try and bring that car further up the order and they should be able to do it they're quick drivers both well on board with the McLaren looking at the back of the 93 Sky Tempesta Mercedes down into the braking zone into turn four 
get the nose in looks pretty good from the McLaren perspective looking to the rear of the Mercedes to see whether the back of the car is planted at the point when you get back on the throttle and that would give any sort of indication oh and runs slightly wide on the exit coming through turn five so you can see how much stretch has gone to the advantage of the 93 Mercedes and oh up the inside Fessy Keller didn't need to be asked twice but that was the error coming through turn five and not just one car two cars have gone through the McLaren one now, that, corner two cars pass you that Porsche is another gold cup class car so the Porsche of Ralph Bone has gone through that's I mean I know things won't stay as they are but to go back to the points that's just taken points away from the McLaren which therefore means there's no longer a tie if things were to stay as they are now, that would be the gold cup in the championship to the Iron Dames because Brendan Areve has just lost a place and now he's been given a hard time and he's tagged into a spin by the Lamborghini. Around he goes. 27 was Isaac Lopez who gave him a bit of a tag in the tail and Brandon Areve, while his lap's gone from bad to worse, he's lost places and now he's going to try and get going. This is not good news at all for Bas Linder's team. And he hasn't got enough steering lock, I think, to get the car turned with that Certainly getting some of the car onto the gravel, but that was... All started in turn five. He went wide at the apex. That allowed Fisichella and then the Porsche following to get through and almost unsettled Brendan Arib. Then up in turn 12, just at the critical point of the corner, he got tagged and around the back of the car spun. Well, that is certainly going to get looked at, isn't it? Because oh, no doubt. Uh, it was very definitely a collision that was caused by the car behind. But uh, as far as the Gold Cup is concerned now in the championship, it's the Iron Dames that are well clear of inception racing. So that's going to give uh, a pretty long afternoon, therefore, to Frederick Schandorf and Ollie Milroy to bring the car back into contention because they've just lost 10 points. Never mind losing the lead, they've lost 10 points to uh, Sarah Bovey, to Rahel Frey and Michelle Gatting. Now, we've got two and three quarter hours to go, so I'm not for a moment suggesting this is going to be the finishing order, but uh, right now, the Inception Racing McLaren has got work to do. Slam dunk comes to mind, but I think that's a bit premature. And the Iron Dames Ferrari pooling clear of Giorgio Roda in the Porsche. So they're in that nice sort of clear air zone, sufficiently far behind. Uh, Sarah Bobi is behind Alex McDowell. And then she's got that little bit of a gap to Giorgio Roda. So Sarah Bobi can get on and do her own to choose her line, not having to make any compromises or any moves that would not be what she would like to do. Clear track, ideal conditions. So the Ferrari comes over the brow, battle on behind as well, look, because they were running side by side down towards turn 13. Chris Froggart trying to make a move against Giorgio Roda, didn't quite do it, Porsche stays ahead. And the race leader, Alessandro Pierguidi, getting away a little bit more, 3.3 seconds to the good now, over uh, Jack Aitken, Klaus Backler still running in third place, Christian Clean going through in fourth. The Barwell Lamborghini just goes through shot there as well, with Alex McDowell running in uh, currently 29th place overall. Nice attempted pass by Louis Machiels and the Ferrari got alongside coming out of turn 16. He'll run all the way down into turn one, but look behind the Audis that as the boots and racing gets up the inside, has to back out of it. Oh, okay, has to back out of it big time because clearly it was a closing door and you don't want to go into a closing door. And there you can see number 52 Ferrari, that's the Louis Machiel's car running second in Pro-Am at the moment, so uh, the Pro-Am leading car is actually another Porsche, it's the Allied racing car there, just going through shot, Alex Malikin, sharing with the very quick Turkish driver, the Porsche Super Cup champion, Aichen Guven, and now that we've effectively lost uh, Chavez and Ramos and West from the race, then this is how we stand in the championship in Pro-Am, Machiel's, Bertolini, Constantini, way clear of Valentin Pierberg, Dominic Bauman right now, but again, there's a long way to go. It's all been surprisingly trouble free other than those little incidents we saw coming into turn 16 there's been a few hip and shoulders around the racetrack but basically for a 48 car field to spread out as quickly as we've seen it there's race leader coming across the line gap up to 3.4 seconds still Jack Aiken running behind Klaus Backler and they're pulling away from fourth place Christian Clean and, and followed by Nicolas Schiergarten and then Junker Della who's the principal challenger to the Iron Lynx Ferrari. Indeed, so Ollie Wilkinson there heading that second wave of cars. So 11th from back have dropped away from the leaders. And as the field comes pouring through, 
without that. Incident Nine between laps. car 27 and 7 in turn 12 under investigation. OK, so that's the Brendan Areeb uh, moment being hit by Isaac Lopez. It's under investigation. It doesn't give Brendan Areeb his places back if there's a, an outcome, but uh, it might penalise Isaac Lopez. So uh, for his zealotry, a penalty may come. The stewards are going to have a look at that. Greg Masters and Richard Norbury, the two... Very, very experienced uh, British stewards that are part of the permanent team of stewards for this championship. So right now, it's advantage Mercedes still. Let's have another look at this. The Lamborghini went for a gap that was never there. I mean, it's a very difficult place to pass at the best of times, but sticking your nose up the inside with a car that is virtually on the race line on the entry into a corner, I mean, all you do is you tap the rear of the car. There's the view from Brendan Nareem. He'll be thinking, what have I done to deserve yeah. this? And that was clearly a penalty, in my view, that'll go to the Lamborghini. Well, also very lucky, though, was Alex Malikin, because he was right on the scene in that blue Allied racing Porsche, just managed to avoid Brendan Reeve by, and that's what's it, and therefore damage to the McLaren was avoided, as it was to the Porsche. So here, you're looking at the fight going on between Christian Klein and Nikolai Sheergaard. This is pro versus silver. It is also fourth versus fifth. And while they're squabbling, look, the race leaders are getting away, which is significant in as much as Danny Junkadea is in sixth place and he can't do anything about catching. The team manager of the Leipzig Lamborghini, Isaac Lopez's car, has got to go to the stewards immediately. And Giancarlo Fissi Keller's progress, 33rd overall, 15th in class. A bit stuck in traffic again. The higher up the order he gets, John, the harder it is to get through. He was behind Frogert, and uh, Frogert's got through the Porsche, so now fisichello has got to find a way to get his Ferrari ahead of the Porsche. Uh, Porsche runs pretty wide on the exit, coming out of turn 16. So he's getting now into the zone where the performances and the ability of the car and the drivers. Oh, boom! Now that's a big lump of bodywork, and it that's is. done. That's at the chicane. That, that's it? under the chicane, indeed. Yeah. It is. It's not on the racetrack, but it's sort of. I don't know whose car that is. Well, it's made whichever one it is a lot lighter. Uh, there, through the traffic, goes 112. Like Fissi Keller, that's a car from the back of the grid. So, Maciej Blazic uh, in a bit of a hurry now. So, uh, Giancarlo Fissi Keller, as we've been saying, running now 33rd, having started 47th on the grid. Not bad progress in 20 minutes. And we understand that that bit of bodywork may have come from 911. So have a look here in replay. The Porsche is going to be behind the Ferrari, and yes, he gets a hit in the back, I think, doesn't he? Which is why that bodywork crumples as the car spins, and he was hit by, couldn't quite make it out, something yellowish looking in that uh, battle pack. So it is Porsche bodywork, and that means that, so number 911 falls away. There you can see it's the left front of the car that I wonder, did he do that himself, actually, on the curb? Mm. Because Maybe, yeah. what was behind clearly wasn't the damage. That's part of the left front bodywork. So, I so it, I said he was hit by something yellow. Well, the, the Lamborghini number 27 was the next car in the queue. But you're right, that bodywork from the front, that would have just come off with a hit from the back, would it? But whether he got shunted and then hit the curb or whether he hit the mm. curb on his own, but certainly he'll not be wanting to do an awful lot more lappery the car like that because the whole front part of the car is about to detach and I suspect that he will be in the pit lane rather sooner than later the gap first to second still just under four seconds and Fis uh, not Fisichella but Pierluigi Alessandro Pierguidi is um, just having so far the ideal day not using his car in any other than a very positive way pulling away from Jack Aiken fairly comfortably that Porsche that we've just been looking at with the, the, the damage, it's getting to the point where the scrutineers may well give the mechanical warning, the meatball flag, to say, in you come, that needs repairs, because if any more bits start to fly off it, then it could get risky. Uh, the battle might be shaping up for second place now. The leader, as you say, getting away nearly four seconds to the good, Alessandro Pierguidi, but Jack Aitken, class battle together. Fisichella gains another place there, look, on the inside of Giorgio Roda, so he's 32nd now, or is he? Well, I don't know if he has or not, because the Porsche was on the inside going into turn five. So off the contact, Fisichella through and goes through. So have a look at the back of Giancarlo Fisichella's Ferrari. I think that might well, have been hit by... It's difficult to tell, there's so many on, yeah. black streaks on yeah. the back of the Ferrari anyway. 
but he's managed to get ahead of the Porsche, which is the key, and he, he can now focus. Let's look and see what happens. So Ralph Bone glancing the back under braking of Fisichella, who got away with it, but that's where the, the bodywork was uh, ripped from the Porsche. And there is a bit of a witness mark on the back, but oh, yeah, Fisichella got away with that very lightly, given what's happened to the Porsche. So he's making progress. He's up another place, as we've seen. 32nd now from 47th on the grid. And that's Miguel Molina watching the progress of the car. He will take over on the pit stops. Pierre Guidi now over four seconds clear up front. Leading silver is still Sheergard. The leading uh, gold is still Hubert Haupt. And in Pro-Am, it is Alex Malikin who is leading the way at the moment, 36th overall. And there's a group of four cars with Sheergard, Junker Della, El Engel and Charles Veitz. They're all covered by under a half a second. So there's not a lot of gap between them. There is the, the last of that lead group of cars, Valentino Rossi, who is still keeping in touch with Giotto, just under a second behind Luca Giotto as we look down further through the field. This is the second group of cars now coming down into turn 10. Drive through penalty to car 27 for causing a collision, a collision with car 7. Drive through penalty 27 for causing a collision with car 7. So you've heard the penalty given to Isaac Lopez drive through for turning around Brendan Arib. just going back to John's point about the Audis as you look at this second group of cars uh, Charles Weir's eighth overall his is the best placed Audi so giving away a huge amount of time relative to the leaders because that's 13.8 seconds dropped already there is Charles Weir but again he's a bit stuck in the traffic isn't he behind Mario Engel who's stuck behind Junkidea yeah there are two Mercedes directly ahead of him and both those cars are highly competitive cars both with their star driver behind the wheel, not in the, quite, quite in the case of Junkadella, but certainly in the case of the number two Mercedes, that is Maro Engel, and for the following uh, Audi, Charles Vietz. Um, and where's he going to find the place? All he can maybe hope for is if I can't get it done on the racetrack, that legendary WRT pit stop that we've seen time after time after time that's given them so many successes in the past, that's maybe all they can hope for. So Danny Junkadella chases on in pursuit of Nikolai Sheergaard, keeping at bay Mara Engel. There is Scholwitz in eighth place. They've returned to their rear, spats on the rear of that 32. Over the weekend, they were running at the rear of the car. Look at the bodywork. Now, that was not the bodywork they were running in the car mm. through Saturday. But today, the WRT Audis join the others with that all-enclosed uh, rear bodywork, the, the spats put on. The Finley Hutchison WRT Audi out of the race with its damage from lap one. Theo Russell's Lamborghini out of the race with damage, and Alexander West is back in, but six laps down now after a very, very lengthy pit stop, having been caught up in the skirmish on that first lap of the race. Charles Veert's just sitting, one might say patiently, but he hasn't really got too many other options. Christian Clean defending from Nicolas Schiergaard, I think the 159 in the garage, the garage 59 McLaren is the quicker of those two McLarens. Uh, then Junker Della is sitting watching what the two McLarens are up to. Well, right now, Antonio Fuoco would take the championship, outscoring the Accordis ASP Mercedes, so that highlights the point that Junker Della and Gruno and Marciello are in for a long slog here to get up the order because right now they're not even close to overtaking another car. The margin between Sheergaard and Junkadea is very nearly a full second, and the margin between Pierre Guidi and Danny Junkadea is the best part of 15 seconds. So the Mercedes is losing ground while it's stuck in this little traffic jam here. And all that's the consequence of starting the race back in the fourth row of the grid, and that illustrates just what they lost in qualifying. They don't know where the time was. The car certainly didn't perform at the normal level that we had seen in for previous races, previous seasons. And now you're locked into a group of cars with very similar performance to yours, and you haven't got any answer. How are we going to find a way past these two McLarens? Well, so far, there's been no indication that Junker Dell has got anything available to help him get past them. So the cars once again storm down through turn six, and in terms of uh, driver consistency, our race vision powered by AWS graphic, take five laps back to back now that we've had 14 of the race with no interruption. Alessandro Pierre Guidi being the most consistent, that's his average over five laps. These are the pro drivers, there are other graphics that will be for other groups, but this is for the pro category. 
and it highlights the fact that the pros can run at this almost metronomic rate, banging in the laps to within a tenth, maybe a hundredth, lap after lap after lap. Alessandro Pierre Guidi leading the race, getting away, and being the most consistent within that pro category. Charles Vetch manages to close down onto the back of Maro Engel through this sort of final sector of the circuit, and closing down, he'll be encouraged, but once he gets on to the straight at the exit of turn 16, then... Well, Charles Vence is just going to sit there, push his foot flat to the floor, nothing more he's got. Not enough straight line speed advantage over the two Mercedes AMG GT3s. And uh, Maro Engel can breathe slightly, but he knows that he's got a challenge on his hands from Vertz for what will be a uh, seventh position. There is number 71 then, that's the leading car, that's Alessandro Pierre Guidi, who is here in part to win a race, but really his main focus is to do the best for Antonio Fuoco. Uh, he's not done the championship this year, although of course he is the reigning endurance champion, but right now the aim is to try to outscore this car and to give Antonio Fuoco the title. Extraordinary to think that it's come down to this, given that Fuoco was in the gravel early after contact with his teammate at Hockenheim, and then in the last 20 minutes this car retired with a mechanical problem. Well, Hockenheim was a catalogue of disasters for many, many teams, uh, unfortunately for the Iron Links, Ferrari was a, one might I say, a self-induced issue, and others had mechanical problems which never had reared their heads before. And it gave us a very jumbled result at the end of a good race. Hockenheim was a, a, a good venue for the Endurance Cup to go to this year. Now, here's the fight still for fourth place. Christian Klein falling away from Klaus Backler. Nikolai Sheergaard next in the queue. Now, of course, uh, the next stint, which will begin in about half an hour's time, will have different drivers in the cars, and therefore the pace may be different, and the order might be different based on what's happened within the pit stops. But right now, Christian Klein having to defend that fourth place. He's losing time against Klaus Backler. And then you're looking now, will Aka, Akodas bring their car in, bring the 88 Mercedes in, maybe a lap or two laps earlier to get out of this battle that's going on directly ahead of them between fifth and sixth positions, use their pit stop skills to maybe leapfrog the JP Motorsport and the Garage 159 McLarens as we look further through the field. Klaus Backler, as he closed down, he's well, just under half a second. You can see, you don't even need to know the time on the screen. So Klaus Backler, there you can see, taking out of those previous three laps, tenth of a second, a quarter of a second, and whatever. So the Porsche has picked up pace, and Jack Aiken is maybe losing some pace. The gap between first and second has quickly opened up from 4.7 to 5.3 seconds over that last lap. And the last lap for Jack Aiken was a 148.3 and Backlid at a 48.2. So looks like to me the 63 Lamborghini not quite able to maintain the pace we saw on those opening laps. So Klaus Backler running in third and uh, staying on the tail for the moment, at least, of Jack Aitken. So again, you've got a driver here defending. That means that his uh, lap times are slightly compromised because he's having to think more about what's going on behind than ahead. And Klaus Backler does not have to worry about what's going on behind. Look at the gap that these two have pulled now over Christian Klein. They've just come out of turn nine, where the fastest through that is Jack Aitken. Uh, Alex McDowell, the second fastest. Alessandro Pierre Guidi, then Christian Klein and then Sebastian Bode. So Lamborghini, Lamborghini, Ferrari, McLaren, all cars of a similar shape and, and design, you could argue, but the Mercedes of Sebastian Bode, a very different type of GT3 car. Yeah, mid-engine, mid-front engine against mid-rear engine for the quickest four. Uh, Jack Aiken, 154 kilometers per hour, about 95 miles an hour. It's a daunting corner, no less daunting here, turn 16. As we come up to go on to lap 17, there is our race leader, and the gap is now six seconds. So whatever's happening to the Lamborghini is giving Alessandro Pierre really an easy run, and he's beginning now to pull by the lap two or three tenths here and there. Uh, you know every round of an Endurance Cup uh, gets a sort of running saga. Well, I think that Isaac Lopez could be it. So remember he got a penalty for turning around Brandon Reeb. Well, uh, he's now been reported to the stewards for speeding in the pit lane while he was serving his drive through for turning around Brandon Reeb. Well, drive through penalties breed drive through penalties, <laughs> undoubtedly. <laughs> See what you did there. Uh, very good. So. Yeah, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, he's done the fastest lap of the race. He's also just done an absolute best in the first sector. You're looking at Hubert Haupt here, who is the leading Gold Cup driver, 23rd place overall. 
and if you take the driver consistency from the Gold Cup over five laps, Hubert Haupt is the most consistent. Sarah Bovey, then Chris Froggart, then Ralph Bone. Well, bear in mind, he had that spin, so he's had to sort of reset. And Maciej Blazic up from the back of the grid. Uh, he's flown under the radar a bit in the Gold Cup this year because he's very, very quick when the car permits him to be. So this driver consistency will, at some point, pay dividends. Those that are the most consistent will hopefully be the ones that get the success in their specific categories as we watch the number five Mercedes exit Herbert Hart, exit out of turn five, leading right now the gold category. So the team owner and team driver sort of wearing two hats at one time. Player manager, isn't it, really? Like uh, Michael Bartels used to do in the Vita Foam, Vita 4 1 days. So Alessandro Pierre Guidi, as I said at the start of the lap, he just done an absolute best in the first sector. Middle sector not quite so good. 27 minutes or so away from the first round of pit stops. And there is Hubert Haupt, who is at the moment well clear actually in class. This car shared by Florian Schotter and Arjun Mine. Schotter, I would imagine, would do the next stint. This is the leading Pro Am car, Alex Malikin, that we've seen a lot of in British GT this year. It's only his second season of racing, started in the British. Uh, Porsche Sprint Challenge for the Cayman 718s last year and has stepped up to the big league in British GT and Fanatec GT this year. So down into turn 10, eases the Porsche in and yeah, Alex Malikin. Just really not much more you can do through turn 12. You just don't overdrive is the key, I would suggest, in this final sector of the racetrack because if you do that, then you will end up wearing your rubber out very quickly. It's about being neat, precise, and tidy. There are other corners you can maybe be more adventurous with, but not that final sector of the racetrack. You know every Endurance Cup race gets a running saga. Well, Isaac Lopez, that turned around Brendan Areeb, got a drive-through for turning around Brendan Areeb. Uh, he's been looked at for speeding in the pit lane after turning around Brendan Reeve and serving his drive through, but he also hit a bollard coming into the pits and therefore crossed the green section that's a, a no go zone in the pit lane. So there's now speeding and a pit lane entry uh, possible offence being investigated by the stewards, and he's only been in the car for just over half an hour. I think he might be one of the early stoppers just to get out of the car <laughs> and forget about his afternoon. He might be right. One of those weekends where it's not really fully um, evolved. When it's not your day, it's not your day. Right, Pierre Guidi has gone across the line in the lead. You're riding with Charles Wirtz, who is still staring at the back of Mauro Engel. We've had a change for 12th place. Philip Eng is ahead of Lucas Legere now. And through turn 16, Charles Wirtz bouncing off the curve out of the chicane, but then back onto the racing line and onto the pit straight once more. Behind him run Luca Giotto and Valentino Rossi still in the top 10. Now, Rossi, in terms of time, dropping away slightly. Fraction here, a fraction there, but he's still in the mix, ready to give that car over to either Fred Vervich or Nico Muller in the next stint. Yeah, Valentino's 23.2 seconds, to be accurate about it, behind the race leader, but principally, he is the tail of this lead group of cars, and he is, well, right now, he's about six and a half seconds ahead of the third-place McLaren. That's Ollie Wilkinson and the Jota number 38. So he's reasonably comfortable. He's not being challenged from behind, and all he needs to keep is, is his focus, and that is on the tail of the number 12, Luca Giotto. Car collection, Audi. Now, Charles Witz is looking a bit more threatening, isn't he, as far as Mario Engel is concerned. Engel, likewise, is stuck in the traffic behind Junkadea. And as the cars then now come down to turn seven, right, the curb on the inside, that takes you up to the curb on the out. This is the Pro-Am Championship leading Ferrari going through, being chased by another of its rivals. Louis Mackiel's ahead of Ian Loggy. Ian, who is British GT Championship leader and very likely to be the champion uh, later in the month at Donington Park. Uh, he has gone over the timing line and now goes into turn one. There also Mercedes mounted Jens Liebhauser in the Windward Racing car. But right now you've got Mackiel's and Loggy together. Ian Loggy knows this type of car inside out. It's his regular mount in British GT. And uh, although he doesn't know the circuit, perhaps as well as one or two others, he's showing good pace in Pro-Am. Certainly is. Um, it's not quite the same as racing at Alton Park, David, and uh, that's your local circuit, but it's the big wide open spaces here in oh. Barcelona on a circuit that is tricky. No, it's not the layout of the circuit that's tricky, it's the way the circuit responds as the clock moves forward through the day. And uh, just being able to get the best out of your stint with your equipment. But Loggy's pushing hard. 
Oh, he is indeed, and he's caught up to the Ferrari. So, out of the 48 starters, two have retired already. Ian Loggy runs currently 41st overall, but third in class. This is a class battle. This is for second within Pro-Am. Louis Mackiels has done many a mile around here, and the Ferrari staves off the attack of the Mercedes for now. But I have to say, the pace that the Mercedes is showing, if Loggy gets a sniff of a chance, I think he's going to find a way around Louis Mackiels in the Ferrari. It just looks to me as if... What Loggy has got and what McKeels has got is um, defence of a position and a big threat from behind from the number 20 Mercedes AMG GT3. The track limit warnings are coming. Uh, one of the significant ones to Giancarlo Fisichella as there Louis McKeels exits the chicane, accelerates now down into turn 16 onto the pit straight once more, chasing after Nico Gomar's Lamborghini. And look, he stretched that margin over Ian Loggy, hasn't he? He did. He just takes one corner where you make a little error, and that's where the gap opens up. But what's interesting, if we're focusing on what Giancarlo Fisichella was doing, his excellent progress, he's up to 31st position, but he's been trapped behind Chris Frogger in the 93 Sky Tempesta for, well, the last five or six laps, and he, is, can't, he can't make any further progress. And a spin there, that was the boots and Audi, wasn't it? Carrie Moje has gone around, coming out of turn two, so that throws that car down the order. So Carrie Moje gets away, and rejoins and there is 52 with a punctured tyre so coming up towards turn three this is going to make it interesting in pro-am because the championship leaders with a puncture limp round and they've got a lot of lap to limp absolutely he's just come out of turn three in the car he needs to be aware that the speed he's running out of that tyre starts to fall further apart at the minute he can get back but uh, if you, that's how it starts to, you can see how much it's oscillating. Wait and see it down the straight. Well, oh, there it goes. The tyre's been deflating over the previous lap, and then the tyre just eventually super overheats, and that's all it can do. The tyre just gives up and uh, breaks the bead between the tyre and the, the rim. And that's, well, that was a self induced spin. So, and luckily, Carrie Moje got away. To be taken at the next pit stop for speeding in the pit lane and entering so the, Audi, the pit lane. Uh, rejoins in the, the background. Alan Adam just mentioning that number 27 Lamborghini has now got a 10 second penalty to serve at its pit stop for speeding in the pit lane and the pit lane entry violation. And there's a yellow flag or a yellow light blinking there. Look as the car's turned uh, down through turn four. Ollie Wilkinson still under attack, but uh, now Benjamin Goethe trying to work his way through the field. And behind him, number 14, Lamborghini, that's Constant Lapalina. And so out of all of this, I think Wilkinson has fallen back. He has behind uh, Lucas Legere. So the Audi, the Santa Lock Audi, has gained a place at the head of this queue. Yeah, there's the, the BMW head of that group of cars coming down into turn 10. So Philly Bang just outside the top 10 and 11th position. But the trouble is, he is 8.3 seconds behind the next car up the road, which is Valentino Rossi. Let's look and see where the pass was made. Well, that was a brave pass by Philippe Eng, because doing it down the inside. Opportunistic. Did it stick or not? Not quite. Ollie Wilkinson did well to defend that, but he couldn't stop Philippe Eng coming through the 25 body over. That's why he was able to secure yeah. that position. Will that be again looked at, or was that force oh. majeure on the part of Ollie Wilkinson? Let's find out, because he has uh, eventually gone through, but a lap later, he's fallen back behind Legere. So I think he gave the place back, didn't he? So it's BMW, Audi, then McLaren. So, yes, Ollie Wilkinson skipped off the circuit and has given the place back. Louis Mackiels in the Ferrari with a puncture has just come into the pit lane as they're bouncing over the curve, Consul Lapalina. So there's a bit of shuffling going on up and down the the mid-teens within the order right now, and it's going to shuffle again in Pro-Am. So Louis Mackiels comes down the pit road, but a very, very slow in-lap, of course. Yeah, no, he had no choice. He had to come in at a pace that would not do any additional damage to that corner on the Ferrari. As this group of cars, Christian Clean under even increasing pressure from Nicolas Sheargarden in the Garage 159, or Garage 59, car one up there, looking at the right rear corner. Just checking to see has any additional damage been done. Doesn't appear to be the case. So fresh tire goes on that right rear, and waiting for the team to wave him off. And off he goes, Louis Mackiels. But that's a very time-consuming lap that he had to spend coming back. It is now for the overall position. That's less relevant. It's the class result, and he's helped by one of his class rivals already uh, being six laps down, Alexander West. Charles Wirtz here though, closing on Amaro Engel. 
So with effectively 18 minutes of the stint remaining, because you can anticipate people to pit at the hour mark, Charles Wirtz closing. But when we get into those sort of last five minutes of the hour, that's when people might start rolling the dice a little bit. So do you bring somebody in early to get them out of traffic? I think the two Mercedes directly ahead and the 32 Audi will be amongst the earlier stoppers to try and use that early stop to, to do the tire wheel change, driver change. Both teams, top teams, when it comes to making their pit stops, and possibly that's the only way they're going to make any further progress. Wirtz goes through, still being chased by Giotto. Valentino Rossi still rounding out the top ten. As there goes Christian Clean. Nicola Sheargaard still tucked up behind him. And then you've got Danny Junkadea in that sixth spot. Now, Pierre Guidi's lead is up to seven and a half seconds. He is just driving away from them here. And so far, even though he's been out of this championship all season, he's arrived in style, hasn't he? He helps to get pole position, takes the lead at the start, and drives off into the distance. So that is exactly what Iron Links need him to do. And the same to be carried on in terms of race pace by Alessio Rivera into the next stint. Yeah, I mean, just a, he's a class act. He had put well, the car, had pulled position, and he got the lead into turn one. And once he had done so, then he had clear air. He could do more or less what he wanted to do anywhere around the racetrack. And gradually, it's not been a massive acceleration between first to second. We've seen Jack Aiken drop back probably as much as the Ferrari pull away. So he's done an excellent job and will hand that car over to whichever the two, LSA or Rivero. Yeah, soon there'll be Antonio Fulco will take over for the final stint. Would well, certainly make sense to do it that way, wouldn't it? So as there, Luca Giotto turns through. Christian Clean, in a way, has been the cork in the bottle here, but Nikolai Sheargaard, in a, a similar car, just can't find a way past him. So Junkadea is trapped, and uh, Christian Clean comes down through the chicane. Accelerates now up towards the end of the lap. But, yeah, for Junkadea, this has been a really frustrating 45 minutes thus far. He can not make progress, and the team can see that, and they can see that the car they're fighting in the championship getting away up the road. Yeah, but we know that the McLarens have been quick down the straight all through the weekend and uh, that's a great advantage if, if you've got it the car is still very good around the rest of the racetrack but that little bit of advantage down into turn one frustrating all the way through the field Danny Yukadea, Maro Engel and then the first of the Audis Charles Wirtz. Wirtz to Giotto is still seven tenths and another second back is Valentino Rossi in terms of the absolute fastest speed anywhere on the circuit. BMW has that on at 271 kilometers an hour from Neil Verhagen, Benjamin Goethe, Oli Wilkinson and Maciej Blazic, 270. And there, look, you can see in sixth place, Mario Engel giving Junkadea a tough time now. So this isn't necessarily Mercedes team helping Mercedes team, is it? Engel wants to get up and pass and see what he can do about those McLarens. Why not? I mean, except they're individual teams, they're racing for their own particular honors. But if there's no way that Junkadella has been able to deal with the McLaren directly ahead of him, then maybe Maro Engel might be the person to do so for Mercedes and then in the process allow Junkadella to get through. But we're coming up, what was it, 15 minutes or so before, well, the pit lane will open in another 10 minutes. So there you see the speeds. Out of turn 12 into turn 13. And Charles Vetch just hovering behind Maro Engel, gets close through that tight left right. Engel runs slightly wider on the exit, but uh, doesn't really lose any time. Charles Vetch would have hoped that would have been given him slightly more advantage. Vetch is probably as close as he's been at any point to the rear of the number two Mercedes. Indeed, so. And now we'll see as he got the grant in a straight line, pulls up from behind that Charles Wirtz on board you can see the picture in picture down through turn one he pulled out he had a look but not able to make a move against the Mercedes so Charles Wirtz this year's sprint champion three years in a row he and Dries Van Voor have been the sprint champions and they're still stuck here behind the Mara Engel Mercedes just watching through turn three looks to me as if the RD has got a little bit more grip more bite the Mercedes seems to be sliding more you can see again on Turn four, the Audi seems to track the exit of the corner slightly better than the number two Mercedes is doing. But of course, it's all about track position. Maro Engel has got that track position currently running in seventh position. And there's nothing that Charles Vets, in spite of potentially being quicker in a lap, has been able to do. So 
Alonso looking back from John Gadea's car. The inset picture is Charles Weir's view. So between both is Mara Engel's Mercedes, and he's having to defend again as they come up the hill. Now into turn 10, so under braking there. Deep into the corner goes Engel. Witt gets close, but doesn't get the drive off the corner in order to really be able to challenge that. No, I mean, the, 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 it's, Mara Engel is really, I think, struggling for overall levels of grip, whereas Charles Veert seems to have a lot more available, but hasn't got what he needs to be able to consolidate on that extra grip. But in the meantime, Christian Clean, as you pointed out, David, is the cork. Maybe it's a screw top rather than a, a cork in the bottle, but whatever it is, he's managed to keep that fourth place all of his own all the way through the start, right to where we are now. And he's not doing anything wrong, Christian no. Clean, in his defence. He's keeping Nikolai Sheargaard at bay by positioning the car exactly where it needs to be. And dives now down to turn one. So again, there's Charlwitz closing further back. The silver leader, silver champion, uh, John Baptiste Simonau, Benjamin Goethe, and uh, Thomas Neubauer's Audi has gone through. It is in 14th place overall right now. Benjamin Goethe at the wheel, fending off Consta Lapalainen. They're both in that silver cup, and they're second and third within the class. They're squabbling, but they're second and third. A long way behind Nikolai Sheargaard. So now we're getting to the point where the different teams' brains trusts are starting to think about what they might be able to do to help gain track position, because on the road it's clearly difficult to do. And therefore, if they do something clever on the pit stops, then that might just be able to vault them up the order a little bit more. Creativity is called for coming into the first round of pit stops. I still believe that the number two Mercedes and the 32 Audi will be amongst the early stoppers because there's no point in hanging behind a car that you know that you're quicker than in a lap, but you can't overtake on the racetrack. So do something that might enable you to, and then who's going to get it with Ricardo Feller, I suppose, will take over yeah, so, yeah. from uh, Charles Vets. And then in the case of the Mercedes, well, Jules Gugnon has told us he'll be second in the car, it'll be Raffaele Marcello will drive to the flag. So there, Ollie Wilkinson's McLaren through. The next traffic jam going round turn 10 in the midst of all of that, number 26 Audi, which is the car Nicholas Bart started. And further up the road, still Christian Clean is this traffic jam really with cars all around him. Alfaisal Al Zubar's treble seven Mercedes goes through. Uh, Neil Verhagen in the junior BMW again running his own race, running in 15th position. But Thomas Drouet looks like his 87 Akuda's Mercedes has got the, the legs of it, but can't find again, as we're seeing all the way through the field. People can catch, yeah. but they get to a point when they come onto the straight, there's nothing left. It's so, so difficult, given how the BOP makes the cars evenly matched to really be able to overtake. And again, you, you've seen it when people do finally get through, they can pull away, catch the next car, Incident and they struggle. 77 and 11 in turn eight, noted. So there you've got uh, Danny Junkadea, perhaps having another last push. I'm not suggesting he's been taking it easy, but as he's coming towards the end of his stint, have one last go to see if he can split those McLarens. Yeah, it looks as if Christian Clean is beginning to struggle. His last lap was a 49.5, and that then was reflected also by Junkadea, who's directly behind him. So whatever was happening, sorry, not Junkadea, he's behind the Sheargaard. The two McLarens slowing one another down. Porsche battle. Giorgio Roda versus oh, Ralph Bone. And not again. Around goes Giorgio Roda. Ralph Bone has a case to answer there. So anticipate the race director to start talking about that being noted shortly. So Ralph Bone's battered Porsche still in the walls. Right, clean. Sheer guard. Then Jean Cadea, fourth, fifth, sixth. Here they come up towards turn 13. And that's allowed Valentino Rossi to close up to the back of Luca Giotto. The pace that Clean is running at now is just drawing the following cars and who dived into the pit then? Is that Christian Clean? It is. It is. And and a, he can, it's a very early pit stop. Morrow Engel in as well. So in they come. Got one of them right. I don't know why they're coming in so early. I mean there's no reason why they're well when does the pit stop window open? It's not for another four, three and a bit well, minutes. The, the maximum you can do in a stint is 65 minutes. So as long as they distribute the rest of the race time divided by uh, divide the other two drivers across 65 minutes and no more each, then they can effectively pit when they want. So Christian Clean out of the car, 
perhaps feeling he was struggling for pace and therefore put some fresh tyres on, it might give the car proper momentum. They're, they're fresh, they're not new. So Clean yeah. was clearly over those last three or four laps. He couldn't do any more than he was doing, and Incident his pace was drawing up the following cars. So that Valentino Rossi became a part of that group of cars in that second group. So Mauro Engel in as well. Also Ollie Wilkinson in. Neil Verhagen in. And Alfaisal Alzuba in. So quite a few trying to get out of traffic jams. And what's left of Ralph Bones' Porsche is into the pits as well. Now that Shergaard cleared, or the Christian Clean JP Motorsports McLaren is in the pits, I wonder whether Shergaard would be able to draw away from Junkadella. Junkadella was hoping that uh, he could clear both of McLaren's, but that's not happened. Equally, we're seeing Charles Fretz. There is the number two. Mercedes back. He needs to get clear of the Ferrari into turn one. Was he going to? No, not quite. And that will be, again, a frustration because now he's got to get past the car on a set of fresh tyres. Well, he's done it. That's the difference between a set of fresh tyres and a set of tyres that has been on for the best part of, what, 53 minutes? But look at that Mercedes. On the pit stops, it's jumped ahead of Christian Kleen's McLaren, hasn't it? So now you've got then uh, number two, which is upper place. Into the pit lane now comes Junker Dea. Into the pit lane now also comes Charles Weir. So this is another important stop for Danny Junker Dea. Valentino Rossi is in as well, and so is the leader. Alessandro Pierre Guidi comes into the pit lane. I don't know why they brought the Iron Lynx Ferrari in. They didn't need to, they could have stayed out. But they will be looking at not about what time they come in, it's about when they go back out. Where will they fall back into the, the what a remaining field? We've got another, we've still got 46 cars in the race. So they don't want to put that Iron Lynx Ferrari out behind a group of cars that he will struggle to get clear of and therefore potentially lose to the 88 Mercedes, which might be more fortuitous. And also, they're perhaps thinking about tyre life. So if the tyres are starting to go away at the end of a stint, as people were predicting they would, then uh, that's another reason to bring in the car. Back into the race goes number 911, Porsche then. And so here, coming towards us, is the Ferrari. Alessio Rivera has taken it over. Well, there's no sign of the 88. They all came out much at the same time. There's the incident still up. between car 911 and 56 is under investigation. That's the contact between the Porsche we'd heard about. Right, away goes Gunon and just stays ahead of the Audi, though, as he comes down the pit lane. That being the uh, Gulf Audi. And there, look, is the Mercedes of Stein Scotthorst. And so Gunnar will be ahead of him as they come back onto the circuit. So the Akodis ASP car has made progress, and they're 32 behind. So uh, Jean Cadea's car, now with, Gun with uh, Jules Gunnar at the wheel, stays ahead of number 32. Number two Mercedes, then, is the one that's lost out on that round of pit stops. Yeah, two positions, and, uh, I mean, that's the rule of the dice in the pit lane. You make your best efforts during a pit stop but to lose two places particularly the 88 Mercedes they were running behind virtually for the entire race so the 63 also in Jack Aiken doing an excellent job in his opening stint but had taken over the lead of course uh, when 71 Ferrari pitted Nikolai Sheergaard is into the pit lane as well so the order gets very jumbled like all of this and there the Audi bouncing over the curb delaying itself that gives Good on a chance to get through traffic on the outside. He's done it. He's cleared another slower car, getting away all the time yeah, getting from Ricardo Fella. Getting through, coming up into turn nine. You see the 32 Audi coming down the hill. Ricardo Fella behind the wheel. And Stein Schrothorst, oh, off track. Up at turn 13. I'd like to have a little view of that moment. So that's the Porsche that was running in that leading trio earlier on, wasn't it? That's the car that Klaus Backler started. And it's Alessio Piccariello at the wheel now of number 54, which goes through. Here's your answer. So Piccariello to the outside. And uh, in the midst of all of that was Giancarlo Fisticella, who certainly got his elbows out. Well, there's just no way you could go around the outside of a car coming up into turn 13. That's the natural exit of the Ferrari. And if you're on the outside, you've got to be prepared to find yourself running out of road. Back into the race, Nikolai Sheergaard, and there's Jules Gounon, desperate to try to clear him, gets in the middle of traffic, gets past the Porsche, can't get past the McLaren, but there's a right old scrum of cars here, and the one that comes off worst there, look, was Stein Scotthorst, because he was briefly blocked by number uh, 91 Porsche that goes out wide, so through that battle pack has come Jules Gounon, but he's not yet been able to clear the McLaren, and through on the inside line there goes Ricardo Feller, Feller takes a place away from Gounon. Good pass by Feller. 
again using the opportunity with traffic and reading the situation very well indeed up the inside can they already get through oh very close indeed but i uh, know mclaren just about was able to consolidate but ricardo fella got past 88 mercedes and jules Gunnar will be very upset with himself for allowing that pass to take place and dropping one position only one position it's still going to be hard work to get that back it will and he's worked so hard to try and get there but now he's going to do it all over again so there's another line of cars coming down the pit lane right move to the inside line there look the mclaren goes diving through manuel maldonado tries to squeeze past 56 which he does the porsche not fighting for position so lets the quicker cars go through has gone ricardo fella and there to the outside line goes Scott Horse, tries to go through. Very difficult on the outside. Porsche does give him room, lets him get through, but it cost a little bit of time. The 12 body likewise is having to go the long way around turn 13. And this is the, the congestion you get when the track gets very busy. But look, oh, oh contact. Who was behind the wheel? Was that Valentino? So, no, that oh. was Nico Muller. No, right, getting that's... a replay here. This is the Porsche going wide. Now, look, as Gunon goes wide, up the inside goes Ricardo Fella, and the Audi got the drive off turn three to go through and take the place. So there, in replay, into turn four, up the inside, Ricardo Fella. Good job done. But the number 56 Porsche, as you've just seen, turned around uh, by Nico Muller. The Porsche has come into the pit lane, Giorgio Roda's car, but uh, I think Nico Muller now has a case to answer. Well, Ricardo Fella looks like he's the driver on the move right now. And uh, McLaren will be fearful because... Car 77 and 112 speed in the pit lane under investigation. So Ricardo Fella looking to find a way around McLaren. And if you've got that momentum, as he has picked up very quickly indeed, he'll want to clear the McLaren, which he, I suspect, believes he's got the pace to do, but whether he'll have the opportunity is another matter. Well, the McLaren all over the track coming through turn seven and eight. The fellow looks to go up the inside into turn nine, but no possible way. Turn 10 will be an option. I suspect to see defence coming from the McLaren down into turn 10. Alessio Rivera, of course, clear of all of these cars further up the road. Alessio Picariello's Porsche trying to get back into the mix as well. There, number 63. So that was started by Jack Aitken, and that car now with Albert Costa at the wheel. So the pit stoppers, that is effectively the second place. Picariello is third, Maldonado fourth, Fella fifth, Gunon sixth, Cottrell seventh, Christopher Hazer eighth, and Christian Kleen ninth. Christian Kleen's McLaren lost out badly on the pit stops there. Yeah, I mean, it was losing potentially out on the racetrack as well. Albert Costa would like dearly to find a way around the Iron Dames Ferrari. And thought he might have had a chance down into turn one, but not sufficiently alongside. Let's watch again and see. This is Nico Muller trying to go to the inside of Giorgio Roda, and there's the contact. He was almost alongside, backed out, but then another bit of contact turned the Porsche into the wall. Yeah, and that will be looked at indeed as the... Well, 63 has gone through, and uh, Albert Costa's got Porsche and I hard on his tail, so clearing one car allowed the 54 Porsche to slip through as well. So Picarello is uh, focused on the back of Albert Costa. And I don't know which of the two car driver accommodations. Right now, you have to think that the Porsche might just have the legs of the Lamborghini. Indeed. And, of course, while they're squabbling, as they did in the first stint, so the Iron Lynx Ferrari getting away, but Albert Costa, for the moment, keeping at bay the Belgian driver, Alessio Picariello, who's done... Much of his recent racing out in Asia. Good to have him back in Europe as the Porsche then turns now through turn 12. Another climb up the hill, up to the top of that section, and then into 13, drop all the way down through the chicane here. Incident between car 31, 7 and 77 at T15 at the beginning of the race will be investigated after the race. Over the timing line goes... Albert Costa, Alessio Picariello in touch, but the margin between them, three tenths of a second. But where are they in relation to Alessio Rivera? They are 7.8 seconds adrift. If the Porsche could get through, you get the feeling, yes, I think I agree with you, that it could do something about reducing that gap. But again, that Lamborghini is positioned exactly where it needs to be to hang on to the place. Well, Albert Costa and a Lamborghini here in Barcelona ain't going to be any walk in the park, but runs wide. 
coming out of turn three needs to be aware that those are potential penalty zones he's running in. But is that because you know, he's already running short of grip or is it because he just let the car free up on the exit to try and gain an extra mile an hour or a kilometer per hour on the exit? Whatever it is, you can get away with it maybe once, but if you make a habit of it, that will certainly come under the attention of the race director. Absolutely so. They're in traffic. They've got the number uh, eight Lamborghini just up the road. Mike Perry in the wheel of it. 5154 in turn 12 noted. Or investigations from race control going into the system in the background will Incident concentrate mainly on the penalties I think when they come as they're diving through the traffic on the inside noted. goes then Albert Costa and he's taking with him Alessio Picariello so this is now for sixth and seventh on the track but it's really still for second and third place Albert Costa Incident with the Porsche right on his tail then up towards turn 13 no further they come Picariello turns no now through the right hand and drops necessary. down the hill heading towards the chicane but Again, everything he's got in his armory, Albert Costa has an answer to. Yeah, I mean, Albert Costa, obviously, very familiar with the Barcelona circuit. As we look at the Ferrari, and driver change taking place, seat belts being done, Louis Michels gets out. That car, of course, delayed early on after its puncture. The Iron Dames Ferrari is in, and there, look, Manuel Maldonado now uh, under attack from Ricardo Feller, who's way up the curb. Feller is... is doing what nobody else can do and that's really have a, a go pretty much everywhere yeah I mean it looks like he is doing what it says on the tin he is a racing driver and the speed some of those car even though it's only 50 kilometers per hour it looked pretty quick as the Iron Dames came into the pits behind the the number three Mercedes and it gets complete does its driver change wheels and tires refueling take the bars or the hose bars are right before you drop the car off the jacks there we go Look at Feller, look how close yeah. he is. All over the back of Maldonado. Traffic up the road as well, so there's a gap opening up on the inside here, and into it goes Feller, but it's the outside line for the next corner. Maldonado knows that, gives him a bit of a squeeze. Ricardo Feller stays on the outside as best he can. He wants the undercut, but he doesn't get it. Or does he? He Again. might think about it up into turn seven. There's a very big chance to take. Mm. He's not far enough alongside, but certainly the pace that we're seeing from Ricardo Feller has been, I've been impressed by what he's been doing all afternoon, well, since he's been in the car, which is only about 15 minutes, maybe even 10. That little clash, by the way, between Nico Muller and Giorgio Roda, no investigation necessary, say the officials. So uh, that car, the Porsche, deemed to be partly at fault as well. There, look, still, Gunnar on the back of Feller. So he's tried and failed to get past the McLaren. That's dropped him back into the clutches of Jules Gunnar. And Gunnar has closed that gap while Feller has been battling to make up a position, that's allowed Jules Gunnar to close up. And every time we see Ricardo Feller going slightly offline to give himself maybe an option off the exit of a corner, now here's the big chance that's been all waiting for. One of the, I think that's the 20 Mercedes to head up the McLaren. But they all just spread out as soon yeah. as they get onto the straight. So the flash of the lights, Manuel Maldonado comes up to have a go then now at Valentin Pierberg. He goes to the inside line, also committing his fella. And what about Gunon? Has he been able to go through? Yes, but you see how much the Mercedes lost there in a straight line. So the traffic for the moment out of the way, but Gunon is the one that's lost out on pure pace in a straight line. Yeah, likewise, the number two Mercedes is having to be patient, waiting to come through the exit of turn three. But fella has... Again, he's using the traffic, using the opportunities, I think, extremely well. Yeah, and also through on the inside there, Christopher Hauser chasing after Stein Scotthorst. Behind them, oh, 11 is Nico Muller. Yeah, through the, on the inside goes Feller, and also there, Muller through the traffic, but at the other side of the corner, through has gone Ricardo Feller. He's done it, he's got ahead of the McLaren. That's, that's what I call proper racing. So, it can be done. They can get past McLarens, and uh, Ricardo Feller doing what Charles Wirtz couldn't do. Next person to come and have a go at Manuel Maldonado will be Jules Gunon. Here it is, on board with Feller. Yeah, the McLaren slightly unstable, coming out of turn four, and all of a sudden you see the Audi gets the opportunity, gets up down the inside, forces the issue, and good work by both drivers. That could have been a bit of a rub, but they stayed apart now. Can Feller begin to stretch his legs? He's looking further forward. 
to Schulzer in the Mercedes. Yeah, Florian Schulzer, who's taken over number five from Hubert Haupt, the Gold Cup leading car. So Alessio Rivera leads on the road now by 6.9 seconds from Albert Costa. Now, last time around, Costa lapped a little bit quicker. Is that the pace of the Lamborghini or is that down to traffic? In third, it's Picariello's Porsche. Fourth now is Ricardo Feller. There he is. In fifth place, it's Maldonado. Sixth is Gunon. Seventh is Scott Horst in the background. Eighth is Christopher Haza. Ninth is Nico Muller. And tenth is the recovering Vincent Abrel. And Haza now is giving Scott Horst a really tough time of it for seventh place. Well, it looks as if to me that the Audis are actually working probably as well, if not better, than any of the other brands here this afternoon. It looks as if they've got a little bit more they can do in terms of where they are on the racetrack. Others around them seem to be moving around more than the Audis are doing, so that'll be what Christopher House is looking for when he runs up to the tail of Stein Scotthaus. So Gunon is aware that you can get past Maldonado, but look now that Ricardo Feller has done it, how much he is pulling away by. He was already a second clear uh, by the end of the previous lap. He'll be more than that this time around. So now Feller setting off in pursuit of Picariello. But that car's nearly 23, yes, 23 seconds up the road. I mean, there's, he might cut into that 23-second deficit, but if he can get it down to single figures, it'll be an outstanding drive. I mean, you've got to deal with other traffic that you're going to be catching and lapping. But um, nevertheless, Feller has been impressive in the way he's managed the traffic and used it to his advantage. But what's going to happen here with the 88? I mean, that's just Jules Gugnon is... I don't know what he can do. They're just stuck, aren't they? They don't seem to have the pace in a straight line. He's going to have to be bold and brave to come for a reasonable way back to send it up the inside of the McLaren. He's losing time all the while at the moment. The best hope a Codis ASP seems to have is if something befalls the Ferrari, because they're not being able to threaten on pace. No, and of course, if you take a punt on the inside and you misjudge it and then you have a collision, then not only you possibly will damage the car, the other car, but you'll damage your own car. So yeah. there's a lot to be lost by being a little bit courageous um, and just hanging in behind. You never know will the McLaren struggle in the second part of the second stint and will that give Gunnar the opportunity to find a way around it but as you point out David he's sitting there and uh, the 71 Ferrari is what 32 seconds down the road they're talking about a third of a lap virtually yeah exactly so a safety car would be needed to bring the gaps down but even then that doesn't gain in places he's still got to try and uh, overtake uh, speed so. of car 188 in the pit lane under investigation so it's going to be really the best hope now for that Mercedes team that there's a, a problem for the Ferrari and you never know, you know, we've seen out of nowhere things happen, whether it's been here like that puncture early on for Louis Mackeels or at Hockenheim late race for different cars, so you never know what's going to happen as there, Maldonado makes a mistake, does he run a little bit wide up the curb, I thought for a moment there that Jules Gounon was going to be near enough to attack but it didn't work out that way. No, um, the McLaren did run wide between 7 and 8 so um, it didn't really benefit the 88 under any Jules Gounon did not. Either he didn't read it or it just wasn't in the position to take the advantage that was offered to him. He wasn't going to be able to overtake, but he might have been able to draw himself a little closer to the back of the McLaren. As in the 12 Audi of Christopher Hauser, never ever underestimate Christopher Hauser, or for that matter, Nico Muller, who got involved in that incident uh, down at the exit of turn 15. You're looking back then at Stein Scotthorst, who is running in seventh place, looking back from Jules Gounon's Mercedes. So right now, it is looking oh so easy, isn't it, for the Ferrari? They are metronomically ticking off the laps. We've done 38 of them, as there, again, look, Gounon shadowing Maldonado. Christopher Hauser all over the back of the number two Mercedes. Short horse had, had to go defensive. He had to go to the middle of the road to prevent the Audi sliding down the inside, and again, just contrast the way these two brands are able to use the racetrack. Audi uses less racetrack, in my view, than the Mercedes is doing. In the meantime, looking at what Gunnar can do, can he find a way around the McLaren? Well, he's as close as he can get without coming into contact, but not close enough to offer any threat. And think of the four cars as Christopher Hassan, and to some degree, Nico Muller, who are going to be the quickest of this group of five cars. So again, they plunge down towards turn six, that little kink. And at the back of the pack, Nico Muller closing on Hauser, who in turn is right there on the back of Scott Horst. But 
because Scott Horse is defending from the Audi, so he's not able to really get up with Gounod, and therefore Jules is thinking of attacking as best he can. But again, look, by the time they get here out of turn nine, he's not on the tail of that McLaren. He can't think about a move at the end of that straight. But for second place, it is possibly doable for Picariello. Look how much closer he is again to that Lamborghini. Incident involving car 77 and 11 in turn Well, the Porsche eight, clearly no quicker again in an overall lap. But when it comes to straight line speed, Albert Costa is just able to consolidate the Porsche shoes its nose. I mean, all you're doing is trying to frustrate the car directly ahead of you. But there you can see on screen over the previous three laps, there are very small segments of time, but it's always going favorably towards the 54 Porsche. And Albert Costa knows he's got a battle on his hands. He's running in second place. He wants to stay in second place. He doesn't want to allow the Porsche to get through because that gap then first to second, currently 6.1 seconds. Eliseo Rivero with a virtually comfortable lead. I wouldn't say it's overly comfortable, but he's on challenge. He hasn't got anybody around him to have to reflect backwards or think about overtaking other than the back markers which will come sooner if not later but we are seeing that lead gap coming down a little i mentioned it a few laps ago it was down by a ted for two and i was wondering if it was traffic or whether it was the actual pace of the lamborghini but certainly it's coming down so we're down now to 6.1 seconds rovera to albert costa florian schultz is still leading in gold and that car is currently 26th overall, but this is the Gold Cup lead battle. Look who is behind Schultz. It's Michelle Gassing in the Iron Dames Ferrari. So not only are they looking good in the championship, they're looking good to try to win the championship by winning the class within the race here. And the Ferrari goes to the inside line. Another quick Ferrari then pulls out, pulls back in. The move wasn't made. The other Iron Links car, that of Miguel Molina, who's taken over from Fissi Keller, is up to 29th from 47th on the grid. But all three of these Ferraris showing very, very good pace, aren't they? Yes, and the Iron Dame is doing a very good job, and that was a pass. Wasn't quite alongside the Mercedes, but uh, you can see again the overall lap time of the 83 Ferrari is quicker than that of the Mercedes directly ahead of it, but against the usual rule story, you can catch for where you're going to pass. Now, we've seen a few passes coming into turn five. That's a big commitment. You've got to be alongside the car, and you've got to get a degree of cooperation from the car that you've put under pressure um, so Michelle Gadding behind the wheel again the Ferrari seemingly using less track than the Mercedes all the Mercedes to me appear to be struggling with overall grip compared certainly to Audi's and look again seeing with the 83 Ferrari directly behind the pass potentially down the inside there's going to be a big ask but uh, you know, if you don't sometimes attempt it then it's not going to be offered up to you. Fastest speed out of turn nine is Michelle Gatting out of the Gold Cup. And the move to try to take the class lead is almost on. Now, remember, she came close to doing it a lap ago. So it's Ferraris heading the gold. Michelle Gatting, Cedric Sprezioli, and down towards the chicane they come. Then absolutely nose to tail here. This is for the class lead, remember. And Michelle Gatting is a little bit neater and quicker coming out of the chicane. She's got a good position as she comes out of turn 16. What those three car lengths or so between herself and the Mercedes. Previous lap, she showed the nose of the Ferrari coming to this point, just pulled out. Not likely to do the same thing again, not likely to make a last minute dive down the inside. There wasn't the opportunity. So, around the rest of the circuit, clearly the Ferrari is the quicker of these two cars. Now, where's the third place car in the class? Uh, it is number 911, which is Alfred Renault's Porsche. And that car is having to get itself up through a bit of traffic. So that's not going to threaten this battle for the moment. As Michel Gatting does commit to the inside at turn four, goes through. Great move. Yeah, good move. Caught unexpectedly, I think, the Mercedes and she put it down the inside. Held her ground and got the advantage coming off turn four. Then clear of the Mercedes into turn five. And now that car will drive away because it is clearly quicker in an overall lap. Running in 27th up to now 26th position with that overtake. Good overtake. It was, and straight away, as you suggest, getting away from Florian Schultz. So this is the perfect way to win the championship. Now, while this car is leading, uh, down in 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10th in class is the Inception Racing McLaren. So Ollie Milroy is doing his best to get back into the mix, but 
the time lost early on when Brendan Ariba was whacked into that spin really has cost them dear. So it rather looks as though his trip from America is going to be for nothing. And Michelle Gatting and the rest of the Iron Dames are looking very, very good right now. Now there you can see Nico Muller. And uh, let's hear from Valentino Rossi, who's completed his stint. He's with Gemma Scott in the pits. Vale, that looked like a very good stint. Did you enjoy it? Yes, I'm happy. It's uh, the, the best stint of the season because it's a long one, it's one hour. And uh, I did a good start. I was able to gain uh, two positions. And especially I was the last of the train. But uh, stay all the stint with the top guys, with the pro, the pro drivers. And I stayed there new, with the new tyre. I had a good pace. And also especially at the end with the old tyres. I was able to stay on the tail of Giotto and, uh, and it was good. I, uh, I enjoy a lot. And uh, now we are there. It's in an interesting race. It's very long, everything can happen. But uh, I'm very happy about my last stint of the season. Absolutely. Can you sum up very briefly this year? Sorry? Can you sum this year up very briefly for us? Yeah, it's, uh, it's good. It's, uh, it's a difficult challenge because we have uh, a lot of fast uh, drivers, but it's more or less what I expect. Um, you need uh, to improve uh, your skills to, ride, uh, to drive the car, uh, but also you need to learn a lot, a lot of different aspects uh, of the endurance races. That for me is a completely new world because uh, MotoGP races is completely a, another way to, to race. So you need some experience, uh, but uh, I'm happy about the season, I'm, I'm happy about the team, and uh, I enjoy it. Coming back next year? Coming back next year, yes. yes. Fantastic. Thank Thanks, Valley. Thank you. Ciao, ciao, ciao. He's back next year. Great news. So, Valentino Rossi, and it's a, a valid point. It, it was an uninterrupted hour for him. Yeah, I mean, and what he said was absolutely 100%. The, this was his best stint of the entire season. He got a good start. He got onto the tail of that lead group of cars and he kept in contact. He didn't fall away, as we've seen maybe on other occasions. He managed to keep the pace. Luca Giotto, who you mentioned, you know, a driver of a lot more experience and skill and stayed in, look, there we are, well, <laughs> doing the business. There's a smile on his face. I haven't seen a smile like that frequently. Uh, yeah. And I think he knows that he's made a step forward here this afternoon. Yes, turned a corner, hasn't he? And that pace and experience will hopefully be reflected next year. So we're about 10 minutes away from the halfway mark. And Alessio Rivera is being caught. The gap, which I think we had at nine seconds at one point, is down to five and a half. So. Whether Albert Costa gets there before the next round of stops, we'll wait and see. But the gap is certainly coming down. Another slide by Maldonado has brought Gunon a little bit closer. And there's traffic up the road. But Gunon is still absolutely stuck behind that McLaren. Yes, you know the straight line speed of the McLaren. And on the inside, oh, Shul, it is a very high risk overtake there. And that's what I'm afraid of, that if you, you, you take a punt, maybe in desperation to bind away ahead of the McLaren, you can put yourself into serious jeopardy. And you can see almost in the frustration, he just gets the headlight flasher going, come on, you know I'm behind you, you know I'm faster than you, let me go, I'm in the, in the hunt for this overall championship. But the progress cannot be made, still, 88 is stuck, and uh, there is the leading car, so... Alessio Rivera leads the way. Now, let's start looking at sector times here. His first sector is better than that of Costa, better than that of Picariello. So maybe it is traffic affected. But uh, as I say, the gap has been coming down consistently over the last few laps. There in the background, look, is that second and third placed fight. Antonio Fuoco, though, is still on target, if things stay as they are, to win the Drivers' Championship. It looks very much as if the Ferrari was getting through those slower cars. That's accounting for where the time might have been lost. Now that he's cleared them, we've now got to see how Albert Costa and Alessio Piccarello, Piccarello can get through up the inside. And that says Gunion gone through. He finally may have gone through. He has, I think. Yep, so he's done it. He's gone by. The Mercedes comes through. And now, look, also Stein Scott Horse on his toes. And there's a bit of rubbing between him and Maldonado. And the Mercedes moves across. Maldonado tries to stand his ground on the inside. Now Christopher Halser goes to the outside line in the Audi. Can he get the inside line for the next corner? Yes, he can. Has he got the drive up the hill? Yes, he has. And Halser goes through. So Maldonado, boop, 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 three places lost in about three corners. Yeah, it frequently happens. You get one position lost, and all of a sudden, the train of cars behind you capitalizes on your slightly wayward line, and uh, then they all go through. So the two and the Audi likewise have gone through the 12. So 
big loss for Maldonado in Garage 59, but it's released Jules Gunnar, and what can he do? Let's watch it again, coming down the hill, out of turn five through six, side by side, into seven and eight, but the Mercedes had the, the track position, and there was not very much Maldonado. He tried, tried to come back, going up the hill into turn nine. That's taken about 44 laps to do that move. Look how close the McLaren yeah. is to the back. I mean, virtually, virtually hanging on. It goes to the left to try and take the long. And that's the reason why he lost more positions. He made a decision to try and go the long way around the outside of turn nine. And the track out there is dirty. Now, Stein Scott has got a good offensive to preclude Maldonado getting down the inside as well. And now Nico Muller, likewise, heaping more pain on Maldonado, but he's on the outside of turn five. Will he look for the undercut on the exit of it? I don't think it's going to be a deal. Oh, he can't no, try, though. No, he can't do it. He had the idea, didn't he? But he didn't, have the, uh, didn't get the car hooked up to really challenge for that pace as they come now down towards seven and eight. So Nico Muller clips the kerb, gets sideways. Maldonado rattles over the kerb as well, and that does really affect the exit speed, especially given that it's a climb uphill. So you can't really be giving away tenths of a second there. Now the run over the brow, down towards turn 10. Maldonado versus Muller at the start of the lap. The margin was a fifth of a second, that's all. Yeah, I think, oh, Maldonado runs wide into turn 10, uh, but Muller not in a position. I, I was going to say that Maldonado looks like he's finally regrouped, having lost those positions, but uh, makes an error down in turn 10. And again, Nico Muller all over the back of the McLaren coming up into turn 13. So just keep turning the screw on Maldonado, and you never know, Nico Muller, you might get a result sooner than later. Well, at the moment, for fourth place, Ricardo Feller, then fifth place, Jules Gounon, but it's a massive gap even between those two. Remember that Feller was able to clear Maldonado and get away. Well, he is now seven seconds to the good over Jules Gounon. There you see him go through ahead of uh, Stein Scotthorst and then Christopher Hauser. The lead gap's down again. He's down to 4.8 seconds. This isn't a blip, is it? This is consistent lap after lap. A little bit of time lost by Rivera. That's concerning because I thought that time lost was due to the traffic. But then the following cars, uh, Albert Costa and Picarello, had to deal with that traffic likewise. And the gap first to second is reduced by the best part of a second. McLaren, look at the way it's moving around. Uh -huh. The back end of the car looks very, very uncomfortable indeed for Maldonado on the entry into turn four. And Nico Muller just patiently, patiently waiting and watching. Again, the back of the yeah. car just skipping sideways under drive. But Muller not yet able to commit to a move to get himself up into eighth place as they go now up the hill. Again, Matt McLaren looking the more ragged, but Maldonado, for the moment at least, being able to just hang on to position. So down towards the hairpin at turn 10, hard on the brakes. This is where Maldonado went wide a lap ago. This is the apex a little, but Muller tries to get the drive off the corner. Can't do it, though, can he? No, um, I mean, I don't know how Maldonado's continually getting away with it now into turn 13. Look how slow the McLaren is. It has to slow down because it hasn't got the bite, the grip to enable it to go through any more, any quicker than it is doing. So it's frustration for Maldonado because he can't do any more. He's defending as best he can, and he knows he's got a serious attack on his hands from Nico Muller running directly behind in the 46 RD. And, Fred uh, Verbeek getting all yeah. pumped, and <laughs> Valley's getting all pumped as well. Talking about the car bouncing over the curve there, right over the timing line. They have gone lead gap, 4.6 seconds. Maldonado to Muller has gone up a bit, actually, four tenths now. So that McLaren still having a, a, a good run within the leading group. But even you can see under braking turning into turn one, it looked not particularly comfortable or stable. Maldonado is he's doing a brilliant job to keep the car in its position and uh, deny Nico Miller the opportunity to get through. Now the flash of the lights in the traffic there from Stein Scott Horst, who has got Haas right up behind him. And there in strife is a Lamborghini that I think is facing the wrong way coming out of turn one. Spin turns the car. Now, who is that? Stuart White, the South African, who was a real gun at Hockenheim. That's going again now. Don't know whether that was self-induced or an assist. Don't normally see too much action down at turn one of a car running on its own. So Stuart White, consolidates, gets back up to speed, and uh, we'll hopefully let's watch as though there's the reason why. Had to be another car involved. It was a chance down the inside, but the 30-yard didn't concede. So, 
a net net loss mm. for the South African. Jean Baptiste Simonard at the wheel of number 30, which is currently second in silver to Manuel Maldonado's McLaren. Scott Horse versus Hauser as they make the run up towards turn 12. And we're about halfway through this middle stint of the race right now. But Alessio Rivera, 4.2 seconds ahead of Albert Costa. It is still coming down as the Mercedes then goes through the chicane, sixth, seventh. The car behind is a back marker, so ignore the other WRT Audi for the moment. Don't ignore Christopher Hauser, though, in the car collection, Audi, because he means business. Does. And watch and see what Hauser has got. Probably got a better overall level of grip, a better car balance as well. But, of course, the circuit, once you leave turn one all the way back to turn 16, is a technical circuit. It's not an awful lot of places you can find a way through cleanly if you into turn five has been probably the most popular. Turn four, in, entry to turn four at the exit here of turn three used to be a, a, a place, but the, the, the performance equality of all these cars is such that there's very little options, very, very few that uh, you can really make work. So Hauser continues. He's in seventh place right now. Uh, Alexander West's McLaren that was delayed early on, he's given it over to Miguel Ramos. That has got a 10-second penalty on the next pit stop for speeding in the pit lane. This is the fight for second and third places, which is still getting closer to that car that's just gone out of shot. The margin, I think I told you, was 4.2 seconds at the start of this lap. It could be down again because uh, Costa being hustled along by Picariello closing on the leader, and they've got a back marker to clear, which is the number 87. Mercedes, Casper Stevenson at the wheel of it. That might just affect the pace a little bit, but as they come over the line now, Rivera, 48 laps in the book, is ahead, and he's ahead by only three and a half seconds, so quite a lot of time lost on that lap. Yes, indeed. So, well, Costa will have to deal with the 87 Mercedes somehow or other, because Piccarello will think, look, again, you can see that the, the time is taken half a second, six tenths of a second, one tenth on the 46. He's closed up for the best part of a second and a bit over those last three laps, and um, Albert Costa will be acutely aware that the Porsche's pace currently quicker than that of his Lamborghini. Now, there is Picariello in third. Jack Aitken was running second for the bulk of the opening hour of the race, and uh, Jack's with Gemma in the pit lane. Jack, obviously watching the pressure that um, Albert is under there with the Porsche all over the back of it, but also again up front, he's closing in. This is a tough one. Yeah, it's all uh, kind of converging again. I think uh, Albert's doing a great job to hold off the, the Porsche because they look really strong. Um, I think the Ferrari, maybe they're just saving the tyres a bit now because there's no point for them to have a huge gap in case there's a safety car. So really, it's all going to be decided in the, the final laps. Tyre wear is really high because it's so hot now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going well for now. <laughs> and you're enjoying watching or just stressful? No, I'm happy. I'm, I'm done, so I can relax. I'm trying to stop sweating, but it's not going so well. It is very, very hot. You go and cool off. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, thank you. And that heat is affecting the tyre degradation, as you are hearing from drivers. Now, for the lead in the first sector, time gained by Rivera. In the middle sector, time lost. And you can see now that Albert Costa is certainly closing on the back marker. Casper Stevenson to put a lap on him. Through goes the race leading Ferrari. 3.2 seconds the gap is down to on that lap. Another three tenths pulled back by Costa. Interesting, Jack Aiken suggested that Ferrari was actually backing off rather than trying to consolidate his advantage. I, I'm not entirely sure that is the reason. I don't think I would want to have a six and a half, seven second advantage halved just for the sake of saving tyres. If there is an issue with the tyre on the Ferrari, then it's not about backing off, it's just survival, I would suggest. So there is Albert Costa, still with Alessio Picariello, only seven tenths of a second back as the cars head again down into turn five here, drop down the hill. Sausage curve on the inside there to stop people taking liberties on the approach through the corner, and then downhill again, that little kink at turn six, but you set the car up, ready for seven, look left, and there's the leader. Rivera goes through, so Casper Stevenson is being caught by Albert Costa. He's on the lights to warn the Mercedes of his progress. Alessio, Alessio Picariello in third place, and in fact, for the leader, there's more traffic up the road as well. We are at that point, of course, where traffic is virtually a regular occurrence, corner lap 
uh, corner lap everywhere you find it. So uh, there is the Ferrari in the lead and Rivera in the first sector of this lap was fractionally quicker, but again, he's slower in the middle part of the lap and that seems to be the pattern. He's, he's okay in the first third, but through the middle and the twiddly bits here, he loses pace and he's likely to lose a bit more shortly when he comes up behind slower cars, but Costa has got to clear Stevenson first. Yeah, and that's not going to be easy with the pace of the Mercedes and uh, certainly the straight line performance between the Lamborghini and the Mercedes, not a lot to pick and choose. So unless Casper Stevenson decides to step aside and let this battle for second place, which could be a battle for first. Now, Albert Costa gets alongside. I suspect that we've seen the Mercedes lift and coast, is the expression, lift off early to let the Lamborghini get through. Now, Porsche in third place will be hoping to get the same kind of gift, but uh, that's for Albert Costa. It is the opportunity he would just to give him some breathing space. He can now see the next car up the road is the, the race leading Ferrari. And Picarillo has still got to find a way around Casper Stevenson. Ferrari, of course, looking good if you think championship here for overall, for gold, and for Pro Am. Uh, there is the Porsche of Alessio Picariello third, and there Scott Horse versus Haas. Uh, Christopher Haas tries to get up alongside. That's the inside for turn three. He's almost level. He's run out over the curb. He stands his ground on the inside. They rub again. I am coming through, says Christopher Haas, and he's done it. He's gone sixth. It was robust, but it was hard racing. And that's what I want to see. I want to see good professional drivers racing, and that was a good move by Christopher Haas. Again, he's been working lap upon lap upon lap. And whatever occurred in turns one and two, because that's where that overtake all began, gave Hauser the momentum to get up alongside in the inside into turn three. Now drop down the hill, and you can see that once you've gained a place, it's very easy to get away. You're in clear air. That's the leader. That is Rivera on this lap, quicker in sector one, slower in sector two. And let's hear from Antonio Fuoco. Is he concerned about this, or is it all part of a grand plan? Antonio Fuoco is with Gemma in the pit lane. Antonio, obviously looking on, looking rather nervous at the moment. What's the situation? Are you conserving tyres here? I mean, we are trying to do, to do our best. We knew already it was uh, quite, uh, quite uh, tough for us for the race, but uh, I mean, we are, uh, we are trying to do what, uh, what we can do. We, we are pushing and uh, we try to push until the end. Any concerns over the pace at the moment? Uh, I mean, at the moment he was struggling a bit, but uh, it's, it looks like it's all under control and uh, we see. I'll let you get back to the team, thank you. Well, under control <laughs> maybe, but the gap was down to 2.8 seconds last time. I, I don't think Antonio Filco actually was aware that the gap had reduced on that last lap. I think if he had seen that, he might not have been maybe so uh, optimistic about the pace of his car, which he'll be getting into in the not too distant future. Again, catching up to a group of cars that they may not be fully aware until the pit lane might say, look, the race leader's coming through, don't impede. But uh, this one thing, catching and again, finding a way around, and that'll be manner from heaven for Albert Costa, who's just 2.8 seconds. So the Lamborghini, as you can see, just coming through the exit of turn nine, pulling away now from Picarello and the Porsche. The Porsche was all over the Lambo for many, many laps, but seems now the gap has extended, well, sorry, there you see it coming through yeah. the exit of turn 10. But look at the plight now of Rivera, because he's got not only two back markers ahead, but they're squabbling for position amongst themselves, aren't they? So number 911 is the first car that he's got to try and sort out, which is Alfred Renauer, and he, in turn, is looking for a way past number 163, the Andrea Cola-driven Lamborghini. So the leader now, look, coming up to a, a proper battle for position, and the margin... 2.8 seconds last time, Rivera to Costa is now, across the timing line, 1.492 seconds. Whatever happened to waved blue flags? I haven't seen any flags other than a yellow flag. Is there a blue flag being used to tell a, a back marker that there's a, a quicker car, the race leader in this instance, wanting to get through? Certainly blue lights. I think the cars also have a, a flag system in the car, don't they? So you arguably don't need it externally because it goes straight into the car on instruction from race control. There, Rivera picks his way through on the inside of the Porsche, but the gap under a second and a half now, and we're still looking at about 20 minutes of this stint to go. Bear in mind also that uh, 
Alessandro Pierguidi came in relatively early, so they can't bring the car in too early this time. Otherwise, there won't be enough time in the race for uh, Antonio Fuoco to, to comply with the regulations. He'll be outside of his 65 minutes. So he gets up the inside into turn seven and eight. And uh, now Albert Costa will be thinking, oh no, I've got to get past these two cars. This will allow Rivera to stretch his advantage from that rather miserable one and a half seconds. And there is Costa and the two, the Porsche and the Lamborghini are sort of battling amongst themselves and they're side by side coming through. Turn 12, Costa gets up the inside. He's at risk oh, here, he's, of of he's got through, he's cle cleared both those cars. So that was opportunistic and uh, fortuitous. Albert Costa now has got the Ferrari with what will be about a second when they come across the start finish line. And still, a well, good what, 20, 20 minutes before either of these two cars. Ferrari might be the one that would be the earlier stopper. We wait to see. Okay, so right now, Picariello in traffic. But yeah, the contact made, bodywork flew. And the gap between the leaders is now 11 tenths of a second as they go by. Albert Costa with the lights on means business here. That last lap was a 48-8, a 49-2 from Rivera. Now it's Picariello who's got to pick his way through the traffic, but all eyes on Albert Costa then, the local hero trying to catch Alessio Rivera. In a sense, they don't really have to worry about that car for the championship, the Lamborghini out of contention, but they can't really afford to give away points because they never know what might be going on as far as 88 is concerned. Through the traffic now goes Picariello. Gunnar is still in fifth place, by the way, but his lap times are not really bringing him any closer to Ricardo Feller. Michel getting up the hill into leading the Gold Cup category. And been a very impressive drive from Michel Gatting, very good overtake. So it's looking good right now for Ferrari. But what about Sarah Bovey of the Iron Dames uh, team? She is uh, Five second time able to penalty. offer a thought on all of this. To be taken In the pit lane the next pit is uh, Sarah for Bovey, she's with Gemma Scott. Entering the Sarah, at this point, you've done all that you can do yourself. And just watching on. Yeah, well, you know, when we arrived this morning at the track, we had one idea in our head, it's uh, let's go back home with absolutely no regrets. So uh, we gave everything we had in, in, uh, in the pole position this morning in the quali. And uh, right now I did the first tint, I took the start. I was extremely careful because uh, we have a lot at stake. But at the end I was able to have a good stint and to have a good pace. Uh, I left absolutely nothing out there and now Michi is doing exactly the same. Rael is going is gonna to finish the job. And, uh, Cross finger that uh, you know, luck stay with us. So far, it's doing okay. Thanks a lot to our team because uh, the car is absolutely amazing to drive. Thank you very much. So it's all looking good in gold then for. Michelle Gatting right now, class leader, and there is Alessio Rivera. Look, again, much, much closer as Albert Costa. Yeah, I know there's traffic up the road, but even so, lap after lap, after lap, after lap, this gap has been coming down. Good second part of the stint for Albert Costa. He's closed the gap, he's extended the, the gap between himself and third place, uh, Picarello Pica, Pica in the Porsche. And now there's going to be options as the race leader not being committed. Look at Costa, he's trying to force the lead Ferrari into making a move. I mean, he almost thought about diving down the inside into turn five. Wasn't close enough to make it stick, but I mean, he's going to put the race leader under such pressure, and of course he's caught behind the Mercedes. Funnily enough, of course, this might be the best chance for a Codis ASP. If Costa gets stuck in and there's contact and the Ferrari is delayed or worse, then it might just bring the Mercedes of uh, Jules Gounon back into the mix. But look now, a bit stuck coming down towards Turn 10 is Alessio Rivera. He's not prepared to commit to a dive there because on the one hand, he knows he's got to win the race, but he doesn't want to put himself in a position where he's jeopardising points for Fuoco. Here comes Costa. I think he's got to do it because Costa, look how close him is to Fuji, touching the back of the Ferrari coming through turns 12 into 13. He's got to think of something because if he's not going to do it, Albert Costa will think for him. I mean, he's right over the back, of, on the back of the Ferrari. He'll get a draft down the street if he can come on to the... Look how close he is. If he can't get yeah. any closer, that's going to give him, hopefully, sufficient aero draft. And I would imagine the Ferrari's going to plonk itself right in the middle of the straight 
to preclude Albert Costa diving down the inside, which is what he's doing. And Picariello is catching back up as well as they go down towards turn one then. Still the back marker ahead, so Alessio Rivera couldn't commit there. Albert Costa right on his tail in the Emil Frey racing. Lamborghini comes to the outside line out of turn two into turn three. He wants the inside line now coming out of the corner for turn four. The back marker is still ahead. The Porsche is back with them in third place. This is for the lead. And now as they come towards turn four, still Rivera can't find a way past Florian Schultz. We've seen in the past on occasions, Florian drives a, a, a wide car. Hopefully he's now going to stay on the inside line, let them all go. Yes, he does. So Rivera goes through and Albert Costa now trying to attack and defend. And the Porsche likewise, all three get through. So this is the battle, a three-way battle for the lead. And we've got another 18 or more so minutes, maybe a little bit less in the case of the Ferrari before that final pit stop. And Albert Costa has, well, to say he's got his dander up, he's driven an excellent second part of his driving stint. Now, why is Rivera losing time like this? Because he's a quick driver. Is this that the Ferrari setup isn't quite right as the, the temperatures and the track is changing? Is it that the tyres are going off sooner on that car? Uh, or he worked them too hard earlier. Look, Costa swarming all over the back of him. Looks for the inside line now up towards turn 13. The Ferrari covers off the inside, but it was a bit scrappy, a lap ago down at the chicane, and it could be so again here. Rivera having to fight this rear guard action. Costa breaks later, quick into the chicane. Picariello right there as well. Needs to be careful, he's bumping over the curbs. Albert Costa needs to be careful when he runs too close to the back of the lead Ferrari that he doesn't accidentally tag the back of the Ferrari. And likewise, Porsche Picarello sitting back now, having regained ground he lost over the last, what, five, six, seven laps to the Lamborghini, back in a position where he can afford to sit back now. He doesn't have to challenge either Costa or the lead Ferrari Rivera. They're going to have their own little battle, and that little battle itself might lead to the Porsche actually becoming race leader. Through they turn then, Ferrari, Lamborghini and Porsche, one, two and three. Their lap times, of course, now are in the 48, sorry, 49s, whereas in the 48s is Ricardo Fella and also Jules Gounon. So for the moment, I don't think they're going to be caught by those behind, but they are certainly losing a little bit of ground to the Fella Gounon 4 5th train. There, again, you can see the lap times. Well, that looks to me as if there's a lack of grip for the Ferrari. I mean, sometimes you have to say there was traffic as well. Maybe that 149.9 was the traffic that caught when they were catching the Mercedes. But it just seems that Ferrari, strangely, because when that car did a supening stint with Alessandro Pierguidi, the car looked absolutely perfect. But maybe this middle stint, Rivera's found a different set. You, know, there, there are, you can have small variations in sets of tyres against other sets of tyres. Whether that's the cause for the lack of pace from the lead Ferrari, don't know. And no doubt. Gemma will be in the pit lane when he gets out of the car, and hopefully he'll give us a clear answer. Equally, Pierre Guidi did pit slightly earlier than we anticipated, so maybe tyres were going off at the end of his stint. A little more traffic up the road. It's a Lamborghini, it's the Barwell car. Uh, number 77, Jordan Witt at the wheel of it. as the race leaders now. Uh, again, drop down towards the chicane, so Alessio Rivera, in fairness, he's doing a good job of defending, but from nine seconds, we're now looking at four tenths as he comes onto the pit straight once again. Albert Costa close, close, close as they come up towards the line. They break the beam, margin between them, 0.493, now 0.436. Through the traffic goes Rivera, through the traffic goes Costa, so he can't think about attacking, but he can stay with the race leader now. Rivera looks the more cautious of the two, oh. in fact, the three lead cars. He's not quite taking opportunities or forcing opportunities. He's got a lot to lose. I mean, if they finish second and Gunnar and the 88 Mercedes finished in currently in fifth position, that still would favour the Ferrari and the championship. They want to win the race to win the championship. That's what their, their plan is. Absolutely. And so right now, Alessio Rivera leading. But look, Costa, now you come back to the balance of performance, don't you? He's done all the hard yards, he's done the catching, but now he's struggling to find a way past because at this point, the cars are so, so similar. There's no demonstrable advantage for the Lamborghini. It's sitting in the dirty air and struggling to find that gap. So now Costa needs to try to force a mistake out of Rivera. Up the hill, the Lamborghini exited more quickly and again gets onto the tail through turn nine, then the drop down into turn 10. Again, the Ferrari is going to stay towards the middle of the racetrack. No, I thought he might have done, but he felt he had enough gap to enable him to take his regular race line. But it's here that the Lamborghini clearly closes back down. You can see the gap, which was coming into turn nine, was 
well, double what it is here through turns 12. So that's just simply, to me, an issue of grip vis-a-vis -vis the Ferrari and the Lamborghini. So Rivera, again, under attack, down towards the chicane. Picariello, not quite on the tail of Costa, but maybe this is all part of the plan. Just lag back a length and see what pans out, because it is conceivable that it might get a bit fractious between those two before much longer. Rivera goes through them with four tenths of a second in hand last time, with three tenths of a second in hand this time. The Iron Lynx faces were not those of contentment, were they? They were a bit anxious. And again, look, Costa closing, 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 down towards turn one, but not able to make a dive. Somehow Albert must think it's dark outside because he's got those headlights on full beam. <laughs> I don't know what he thinks is going to do it. I think Rivera's looking in his mirror or the, the monitor that he would have on the car to see what's going on behind him. Don't think that's going to have much benefit whatsoever. But, you know, you've got all the tricks in the book, you've got all the tools in the cockpit, use what you've got. Jack Aitken watching on in the pit box as he sees his car that Marco Bortolotti will take over running in second spot. Behind them still is Picariello, and there, look, a tighter line down towards turn five for the Lamborghini. Albert Costa couldn't get up alongside the Ferrari, but the intent is there. The Ferrari gets a good run out of the corner. About two lengths between them, but that's just enough to preserve Rivera for another couple of corners. He climbs the hill here. But it's from this point onwards that the Lamborghini and Costa seemingly are able to pull back whatever the gap, the opening coming into turns seven and eight. So down the hill once again. So Rivera doesn't have to stay in the middle of the road. He can take his own entry because he's not being pressured. The Porsche Picarello closing again, fractionally onto the tail of the Lamborghini. So the pace dictated by the Ferrari is affecting the Lambo and allowing the Porsche to close up yet again. Indeed so, over the brow. And of course, with every lap that Rivera defends, we're getting closer to the next round of pit stops. And again, it might be that they bring the car in as soon as is mathematically possible, given the drive time for Fuoco in that last stint, so that he doesn't have to think about defending. And again, as he does defend, he's using the tyres pretty hard, but so is Albert Costa by sitting in the dirty air. To the eye, that gap has grown this time as they come over the line. Three tenths it was, half a second it is. Picariello in third place, so Costa now sort of plateaued. He's, he's brought the gap down from nine seconds to virtually nothing, and now he's stuck. Well, he's been running so closely behind the Ferrari. A, you may find yourself getting your fuel, your oil and uh, water temperatures peaking, but more importantly, maybe the, the lack of air getting into the air and takes the front of the Lamborghini are causing him to not be able to brake quite as late or quite as heavily as he has been doing earlier. So maybe he just needs to fall back let some cool, cool air, or cooler air rather than cool air, get into the front of the Lamborghini, and then he can push the reset button and have another pop before he'll be vacating the car. Again, look how close he can get into turn five. Whatever the issues that Albert Costa is having to face, he's got the quicker of the two cars. And in spite of that, he can't find a way. Oh, bow well of bail. Is that a, a, a motor go or something? A lot of smoke coming from the engine cover on the 77 Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini. So down the hill yet again. It's a downhill braking area. It's not always the easiest part of the racetrack to overtake unless you're well alongside the car before you get into the braking zone. Then it's more or less your corner to, to win. Now, if that Lamborghini is stranded trackside, does that mean that we might have an interruption here? Jordan Witt out of the car. The Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini is again. The leaders come diving down towards the chicane. They all concertina this up to the end of lap 60. And through comes Alessio Rivera. Credit to him. He is under huge pressure, but he's not putting a wheel wrong. Pressure in terms of Costa behind him. Pressure in terms of having to win a championship, in a sense, for Fuoco here. Win a race for him, at least, so Fuoco can take the title over the line. Now, Jules Gounon runs fifth at the moment. If that's where he stays and the Ferrari wins the race, then it's the championship to the Ferrari. If Jules Gounon comes home fifth and the Ferrari finishes second, then Gounon and colleagues are champion. So that Ferrari cannot afford to give up the race lead. Simple as that. Well, that's a very clear statement for Ferrari to have to respond to. And what Rivera is doing is, is driving now, waves at a, a stationary or wave yellow in that zone. The car is not in a position that's, in my view, a hazard, but that's up to the race director to decide he may not want or like seeing a car in that gravel trap of that part of the circuit. 
So yellow flags, as you say, in that middle sector, as they're again riding the curb, coming out of turn eight, uh, is Alessio Rivera chasing after him all the time? Is Albert Costa? And once more, they come over the brow out of turn nine. There's more traffic up the road. Now, this again could be a factor. Race leaders make the run again into turn 10 here. Break hard at the end of the straight. Turn into that left hander. Make sure you don't run wide because it's a climb out of the corner. So you don't want to lose any momentum, any exit speed. Marco Bortolotti gets ready. So pit stops are imminent. Albert Costa could not be closer this time. But who is going to be the first one to bail for the pit lane out of these two? Costa thought about a jig to the inside, thought better of it. Down they come into the chicane. Lap 61, Ferrari, Lamborghini, nose to tail. Rivera versus Costa through the right-hander, out of turn 15, and neither pit this time. Then they're going to do one more lap at least. Certainly, that is the case. Ferrari can breathe again another lap where they have got that advantage. It was, well, it's but still four, four tenths of a second. The lap ago, still four tenths of a second, and the Porsche is just half a second behind the Lamborghini in running in third place. And, I mean... What goes through a driver's mind when he's been stuck behind a car, which he knows he's capable of lapping quicker than, but he can't find a way past it. So Albert has got to contain and sometimes his exuberance overcomes his judgment. In this instance, he's driven a very well-judged, an outstanding middle sector, in fact. So Marco Bortolotti will get behind the wheel of that number 63 Lamborghini. Antonio Fuoco will get behind the lead Ferrari. What will happen in those pit stops? Albert Costa looks up the inside, but really more just to sort of keep, or well, kicks up the dust on the exit, and that was a little bit unnecessary. Didn't need to drop that wheel off. So Nevertheless, they... not really harmed his position. No, it dropped him a length or so back, yeah, hasn't it? But it, again, he this throws it back up again very quickly. Exactly, this is the part of the circuit where he is able so to do. You've seen Mirko Bortolotti getting ready to take over. Antonio Fuoco, for perhaps the most important stint of his career, will be getting on board as well. Picariello is not going anywhere in the Porsche, as in he's not dropping back, but equally he's not gaining places. He's just, again, stuck behind uh, Albert Costa. Fourth is Ricardo Feller, 20 seconds back, and uh, there Mirko Bortolotti gets set, gets ready to go. He knows the importance of this stint, and the Emil Frey racing team knows the importance of the pit stop. Let's just see the traffic ahead. Just want to quickly see if there's either of them yet for the pit lane. And the answer is no. not this time. It's putting a lot of pressure on the respective teams because whatever they do in the pit lane will either win them or lose them this race. So whether Emil Frey can beat the Lynx team or not, we'll find out very shortly. Second time penalty to be taken at the next no, pit the background, stop. Alan and I'm talking about a 15-second penalty at the next pit stop for number 11. Now did the refueling time. Uh, wasn't correct to the regulations. There's a regulation time that the refueling hose must be connected. There, round the outside, goes Alain Valente, who's been racing in both GT3 and GT4 this weekend. He tried to go round the outside, it didn't work for him. And so now Michel Gatting comes up through on the inside line, takes a plate away, and there are the leaders, look. So again, three back markers battling, three race leaders bearing down on them. This is a, a tense moment for the race leader, and for second and third, because now there will be opportunities. Whether Rivera is going to be more bold than we've seen so far in his stint behind the wheel of the lead Ferrari or not, or whether Albert Costa will make something happen. Gunnar Should in the pit lane. So Jules Gunnar yeah. in, so out of the traffic to put Rafael Marchiello in to see what they can do. And also in has come Manuel Maldonado. Right, so we've got uh, Rafael Marchiello set to get on board 88. Here are the race leaders then trying to work their way through the traffic. Rivera has to commit to the inside line here. Yes, he gets alongside, and the ground was basically conceded. But look up the inside, the Porsche gets up alongside Costa, and that's a hip and shoulder, but Costa's on the inside into turn 12. Porsche will not really succeed going around the outside, falls back in behind the Lamborghini, but that was a tense moment. Could have been a change of position. Indeed, could have been even worse than that, couldn't it? They've survived it, but they've also got stuck in the traffic. A little bit, Costa dives up on the inside line there, goes through, gets himself past uh, Alan Valente. And now Picariello goes for the pit lane then. So he couldn't quite go through. He comes into the pit and Rivera just slightly impeded, I thought, by a back marker coming onto the pit straight. Through he goes in the lead. The margin was half a second between Rivera and Costa. It's down to three tenths. I think it was a timely pit stop, a pit call from Dynamic Motorsport to bring the Porsche in. Side Higgins by Costa. side, down. does the lead change? It has changed. Through goes Costa. He's taken over the race lead on the inside line. The car ahead coming out of the pit lane was Raffaele Marchiello. He now has got to stay. 
a lap ahead, if you like. He's got to stay ahead of the Lamborghini. The team is absolutely delighted. And Mirko Bortolotti then is going to get into a car that leads the race. And suddenly things are also a little bit more optimistic, maybe, for a Codis ASP, because that Ferrari effectively has got to win the race. And right now it's been bumped into second. And right now Marcello is on a, probably on a brand new set of Pirelli rubber. And once he gets settled in, he will be able to, in, I think, with ease, pull away from the pursuing the Ferrari that's been the dominant car all weekend or all day, all afternoon, now in second place. And, well, Albert Costa has done what he had to do. It's taken him a long time. He will feel it a large degree of satisfaction from that overtake. Especially given that there was contact half a lap before, if that, uh, with the Porsche. So uh, it could have been very dramatic. There is number 54, Matteo Cairoli, now joins the race. And we await then the next round of cars for the pits out of that leading line. So there, look, Costa having cleared Rivera, getting away. And the pit lane may beckon for Albert Costa this lap because you've seen Mirko Bortolotti is ready. Antonio Fuoco will be getting ready for 71 Ferrari as well. But the gap has widened in the space of a lap. I would bring this car in now. I don't want to get bogged down behind other lap cars. So wait and see. Costa's in. He is indeed. And Rivera is in as well, so he's lost his lead, but uh, let's see what happens in the pits, because if it's a, a slow pit stop, the pace could be reversed back again. Uh, we've got Dean McDonnell, by the way, in number 159 McLaren, straight away doing absolute best in the first sector. Best lap of the race, still that of Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Right, so two crucial pit stops, Costa in for Bortolotti, Rivera in for the man that wants to win the championship, Antonio Fuoco. There he is, ready to jump on board. So out gets Rivera, out gets Costa. Marco Bortolotti, who has another mission this season, which is to win for every Lamborghini team he's driven, whether it's been Grassa, whether it's been uh, FFF. He's also won for a non-Lamborghini team, which is WRT, but he wants a win for Emil Frey, and this could be the one. So new sticker tyres go onto the car. There is Matteo Cairoli, who is out of sequence, of course, having already pitted. Albert Costa rushes into the garage ready to celebrate the fact that he got the lead, tear off the windscreen of the Ferrari, so it's clear vision for uh, Fuoco. And look at how pleased Costa oh, is. He's absolutely destroyed the garage there. Fantastic. Absolutely pumped, like you can imagine. And he did, a, I mean, a sat, a tried, and eventually, at the end of the straight, made that pass, and wow, was it a great pass. But he's ahead coming out in the Ferrari. Fuoco has jumped back ahead on the pit stop, so Albert Costa's work is in vain. Matteo Cairoli has taken over the lead of the race, I think I'm right in saying, on the track in the Porsche, but look, on the pit stops, Arn Links are back ahead of Emil Frey racing. So, little good did it do Emil Frey. Yes, it was a good move by Costa, but in terms of a pit time, it was a 1 minute 12 for the Lamborghini, a 1 minute 9 for the Ferrari, and that therefore means that the Arn Links Ferrari is back ahead. Oh, Mirko Bortolotti, you're made of stone stuff. You're going to have to stand up, Albert Costa. Well, you can see the joy when he came into the pits absolutely over the moon about his drive and securing the lead but it came into the, the pits basically the lap following but nonetheless a great drive from the Spanish driver. Fastest lap of the race Raffaele Marchiello his first flying lap and the lead car is the Porsche in a sense out of nowhere but having come into the pits out of sequence it got out of the traffic and on fresher tyres Matteo Cairoli now has been able to lap quicker to therefore jump ahead on that next round of pit stops because the three were so close that extra lap on new rubber was enough to catapult them ahead so the Porsche now leads the way and there is Matteo Cairoli with in second place for Woko look at the gap now and where is Bortolotti he's dropping back a little bit well, Fawoka, we know, is blindingly quick in the Iron Lynx Ferrari, but it's like Rice Merkel bought a lot. Let's watch and see as the Ferrari. And there was the, the Lamborghini follows. Yeah, so it's just a better pit stop from Iron Lynx, wasn't it? And over the course of the lap, Bortolotti has dropped away a little bit, so he's waiting for those tyres to turn on. Here then is Antonio Fuoco coming across the line, but it is Matteo Cairoli ahead. Now, Stuart White is the on-the-road leader, in fairness, but he owes us a pit stop, so it's Cairoli that's the, the relevant one, and then Fuoco is behind him four seconds back, and then it's 1.8 seconds uh, to Mirko Bortolotti. The Emil Frey team congratulating Albert Costa, but they need to look at their pit stop because they lost three seconds in that stop against Iron Lynx. 
Well, it, it took a little bit of time to get the seat insert that Albert Costa uses out of the car to get Bertolotti into, but that didn't affect the pit stop. The pit stops were lost either in the refueling or, well, it would have been the refueling. They didn't get the fuel in that they needed, so in and out one minute and nine seconds for the Ferrari. It was 69 seconds versus yeah. a minute and 12. So, you know, three seconds were lost and that cost them a place. Simple as. It was a slower pit stop. If they'd have been in the 69 second bracket, they would have kept the position ahead. So there's the full pit time. 1 minute 12.478 cost to Bortolotti. Ooh. And it's cost them a place. Mamerko slides the back of the car through turn seven and eight. Now, don't know why he would be doing that with a fresh set of tyres, but maybe he just he's too pushed. He's trying to gain, the, you can see the gap of what was it last time across the line. It's about run about second and a bit as the Porsche goes through the slower traffic. And Antonio Fuoco has seemingly got the 63 Lamborghini in control. Well, yeah, Fuoco on the, what, he's now down two laps of the stint, has been able to pull clear. Uh, markedly of Bortolotti. Fastest lap of the race, as I say, much yellow. But, yeah, but the Ferrari's just gone fastest sector time in sector one on this lap. So what he can do in sector two, well, it's good, but it's not as quick as some of the others. And uh, there is that second place Ferrari. And Luca Bortolotti with a lot of work to do to find a way to get back on terms. Well, let's hear from Albert Costa then. Pleased about getting the lead, but probably not very happy that they then lost the place back on the pits. Albert, that was an incredible amount of emotion you showed as you got out of the car, dropping to your knees and coming back in here. But frustrating for you now, after all of that, to watch the result of the pit stop and Mirko now slipping slightly? Yeah, I mean, for me, this means a lot because this year I struggled a lot to show my real potential as I've been blocked by someone always. But uh, yeah, today I, I show I can do it when when I have the opportunity always, and the car is running. So one day I will tell you all the truth behind all of this, but uh, yeah, I'm very happy to, leave the, to take the car in picture, recover seven seconds to the leader, pass him and enter into the pit, on, to the pit stop with, uh, some, uh, with P1 in the, in the car. Unfortunately, we lost it. Uh, I don't know why, I will check it now. But yeah, I'm very happy because personally, I did a very, very good job, which I'm happy, and I'm very happy with the, for the boys. And over the radio, you said you're not coming in until you were in P1, didn't you? I was saying, I'm coming, I'm <laughs> coming. I knew I was coming so slowly, because the tight degradation, as I told you, is a key for this race. So I really managed it, trying to save. I never pushed for a super lap, I just was a boom, 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 like a hammer, and it worked. Well done, Thank you. Well, Albert Costa's delight, and there you can see it in replay, tempered by the fact that they lost the place. So, came in in the lead, goes out, having fallen. In fairness, not only behind the Ferrari, but they both dropped back behind the Porsche. Yeah, and you've got to love Albert Costa's enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. I mean, so pumped, it took him a long, long, long time to find a way around the lead Ferrari. Then, disappointment, obviously, that in the round of pit stops, they've fallen back again. And watching Mirko Bottolotti, the back end of his Lamborghini, to me, doesn't look as planted as the Ferrari does, particularly coming through into turn three, out of turns one and two, but more so around okay. turns seven and eight. Speed of car four in the pit lane under investigation. Speed of car four in the pit lane. That's uh, yeah, pit exit is exit under there. So this is how we stand for the championship right now. Antonio Fuoco would have uh, 84 points if things stay as they are. Junkadea Gun on a March Yellow would be on 83. But it isn't relevant in a sense at the moment because there are lots of cars that owe us a pit stop and therefore the order is shuffling all the time because there are a good number of cars between the Ferrari and the Mercedes that have yet to pit on their second round of pit stops. So the order is going to shuffle again. So uh, although that's how it stands at the moment, it's going to change again in the next few laps. So Stuart White runs second overall, but that car rows as a pit stop, and Lorenzo Petrese sixth, he owes as a pit stop as well. Interesting, interesting. Enrique Chavez has just gone fastest overall in sector two in the McLaren, the 188 McLaren. And that car currently is running in 44th position. Now, Raffaele Marchiello still doing the fastest lap of the race. Interesting how that car straight away has been demonstrably quicker than anything else out there when Junkadea and Gunon couldn't seem to do anything with it, but Marchiello is absolutely on a mission. 
possibly he got a he got the brand new set of tires. Mm. Oh, up the inside and running wide on the exit of turn 12. Oh, bouncing. Oh, down. Looks all on tidy and messy between the Audi and the Mercedes. That's Lorenzo Patrese getting himself through on the inside of the now Arjun Maini driven Mercedes that was leaving Gold Cup earlier on. Number 12 there. Matteo Drudi has taken it over. Pro Am, by the way, has been. Uh, played into the hands of Alex Malikin, he's up the road clear, leading the class, there over the line goes 88 then, so Raffaele Marchiello is seventh at the moment, but as I say, this is going to become effectively fifth on the next round of pit stops, because we've got a couple of cars ahead that uh, are due in. Well, I mean, I don't, we don't know what tyre set that Akotas were able to fit to Marcello's car, but if you're going to put your, basically your your fastest driver in at the last stint, you want to give him the best opportunities. So he has got that fastest race lap, and he needs then for those other cars that are due a pit stop to clear to give him whatever chance he has of running and challenging the 71, which is currently in second place. And Porto Lotti has dropped back two seconds on the Ferrari. Indeed, so uh, it's a curious one, this, as to why the car is dropping away so markedly, having been so good in that previous stint. Uh, look, let's find out about Rivera's stint, first of all, in the Ferrari. Why did he lose pace? Well, Gemma is there to ask the questions on him. That was a very, very tough stint you've just driven. Were you losing pace as you were coming towards the end of that session? Yeah, the stint, the stint was horrible uh, on my side. It was really difficult. I didn't have the pace from the beginning. And I really don't know why, because uh, during free practice and also qualifying, everything was good. Uh, my teammates are fast, so I'm really sorry. Uh, but now we have uh, still 55, 52 minutes, and uh, Antonio is super fast. He will give everything. Away. We've seen how quickly things can change and how much the pit stop was really relevant as well to the situation at the moment. Yeah, thanks to the guys, we regained the position on the Lamborghini. There is still the, the Porsche uh, to pass that did uh, an undercut. We'll see. Thank you. So, uh, Alessio Rivera, conscious that he might be perceived as the weak link there, but, uh, yeah, saying he was struggling for pace all stint. And in fairness, others have been in the same boat. And look at the way that Raffaele Marchiello is now going, because he continues to be doing good lap times. Now, it is, as a, a sort of race order, Cairoli from Fuoco from Bortolotti, Stuart White down to fourth, but still yet to pit. So, effectively, fourth is going to be Van Thor and up into sixth, which will soon become fifth, is Raffaele Marchiello. But if Fuoco finishes second and the Mercedes fifth, I reckon that's still enough to give them the championship at Codis ASP. So second versus fifth, it's still going to go the way just of the Mercedes drivers. This is on board with Fuoco. Comes out of turn 11 into turn 12. And you just have to be patient all the way through that long turn 12, then into... 13, you can roll the car into 13 to carry a certain amount of speed, but now you've got to get it straightened up, slow down, and then hard on the gas here on the exit of 15. So the gap between the Porsche and the Ferrari last time through was 3.9 seconds. Wait and see what it is when it comes across the line to see if that's reduced. 3.7, so just under two tenths of a second in round figures. And then down into the braking zone into turn one once again. Indeed, so Antonio Fuoco with uh, a car that looked good in terms of the balance, still have a good set of boots on it, comes through, and it's a clear racetrack ahead of him because he is 3.7 seconds back from Matteo Cairoli. So going into this final 50 minutes of the race, the last lap for the Ferrari fractionally quicker than the Porsches, that's Stuart White who's come in, he was leading silver, and that's the last relevant pit stopper, really, out of the leading group. Also in is Oli Milroy, who had got himself pro tem into the lead of the Gold Cup. But the last pit stops now cycle through. So at the end of the, the next lap, we'll have a proper order, if you like, going into the last 50 minutes or less now of the race. But that Porsche, by getting out of the traffic a lap before, has put itself into the lead of the race. Yeah, it was a good call by team, the Dynamic Motorsport team. Unfortunately for Raffaele Marcello, their pit stop was a minute and 14 seconds, and that's about five seconds slower than the two lead cars did. And that's probably part of the reason why they've dropped back behind Dries van Thor. Uh, they're currently running 13.8 seconds behind the fifth place Audi. That's going to be a big ask 
for Raffaele Marcello to, first of all, catch the fifth place Audi, but more likely to find a way around it. Yeah, it's not the first time that we've seen Akodis lose time in the pits against other squads. They were behind that 32 Audi anyway when it was being driven by the charging Ricardo Fella. Here in the meantime comes Nicholas Nielsen, number 51 Ferrari over the line. That's running in 25th place, now 22nd, having gained on the, the last round of pit stops. And Valdemar Eriksson just going through shot in the pink Mercedes. There's the leader going through. Their second is Fuoco. That gap, three and a half seconds. And on the last lap, Fuoco fractionally the quicker. Will the 51 Ferrari make it easy for the lead Porsche to get through? Or will it make itself a little bit more awkward and allow the second place Ferrari to close that gap down? We shall wait and see. But I know exactly where you're coming from because this would certainly help the Arn Lynx yellow Ferrari to get back closer to the challenge for the race lead. Right now, though, Matteo Cairoli comes down the hill on the tail of Nicholas Nielsen, whose car started at the back of the grid. I think Cairoli would like to think that, you know, it's a battle between the two drivers on the track and, you know, team play is, uh, OK, it's part of the rules and regulations as long as it's not too overt. So right now, this is the situation. It is enough at the moment for the Mercedes to take the crown now that it's in that fifth place. So, as I said a few laps ago, winning the race is essential for Iron Lynx. And right now, even though the Mercedes is only fifth, that would be enough to take the title. So you understand why Fuoco is pushing, pushing, pushing to try to get back onto terms with Cairoli. Wait and see the gap last time through, first to second to 3.5 seconds. If it's reduced, then you have to think maybe there's a little bit of team strategy going on with the 51 Ferrari, which is currently directly ahead of the, the lead Porsche. As we look at the 88 Mercedes, Raffaele Marcello down into turn 10, and the car looks perfectly fine. Last lap of that car won 47.5. But that's slower than what Dries van Thor did in the Audi. He did a, well, that big much 41, yeah, 41, 47 1. So the pace of Raffaele Marcello's car, not as quick as that of the car he's pursuing. Into turn 16, they come. There you've got the race leader still stuck behind Nicholas Nielsen, and the gap down by half a second last time. Was a lap ago 3.5 seconds, now down to three seconds. Caroli on the lights, you know, I've let me through. And of course, further traffic up the road, so Nielsen wants to clear that traffic, he's on his headlights. And Caroli sitting there, unable to really do it very much. Yeah, it's not that he's not close enough, is it? So, as they come through together now, the Porsche driver is being impeded, so three tenths lost in the first sector. And likewise, Nielsen's trying to get himself up through the traffic. Down they come into turn 10. Klaus Battler watching his Porsche. So he was the man that started 54. The car now in the lead, and uh, Klaus is with Gemma. Klaus obviously watching on intently at the moment, all over the back of the 71. Um, I mean, now we are in front. Uh... Honestly, I watched the race now, the 51 Ferrari is in front of us, uh, he is a lap down or two laps, I don't know what, uh, but at the moment he is uh, slowing us down a little bit, uh, I hope we soon get a blue flex uh, that we can uh, pass him, because for sure the 71 behind us is also quick, and uh, would be a really nice end of the season if we could win this today. Absolutely, I know you've had quite a lot of highs and lows this year, it's been a tough one. Yeah, it's... I mean, we were always fast. Uh, we were leading in Paul Ricard, we were also leading in Spa, but then uh, two times we had in uh, DNF, uh, which is hard. There's a lot of points also in these two races. But uh, we came back in Hockenheim with the podium, now we are leading. Uh, honestly, we had a great season in terms of speed, but uh, the luck was not so on our side. And uh, anyway, it would be nice to end the season with a victory. Thank you very much, Klaus. So the gap for down closing a to with two seconds between Cairoli and Fuoco because he's losing time by being stuck behind the sister Ferrari. Yeah, and I mean, I can't say I'm surprised. I have to say it was predictable. And there you can see on screen how much Fuoco was taken out over those last three laps. Second on 73, half a second on 70, 
two and just a tenth or so of a second on lap 71. But visually, the second place Ferrari is closing down on the lead Porsche and still the sister car, the 51, has not yielded to the race leader. So we're getting time penalties being offered up now. 911 Porsche, the battered Porsche for causing a collision. Number four for speeding in the pit lane. So these penalties are going to be added on at the end of the race as you ride on board then now with Antonio Fuoco and he must be starting to grin because he can see that Porsche ahead getting bigger and bigger and bigger because it's being delayed and delayed and delayed by his teammate. I think I said on the first lap of this race that the 51 Porsche might hover around the back. So 51 Ferrari might hover around the back of the field. It's got further through the field, but the, the, what it is doing is a team game to allow the 50, sorry, the 71 car to close up. And well, there may be blue flags or there may be blue lights in the car, but it looks like Carola hasn't, Caroli hasn't got the pace to find his way past. But the last lap of the Porsche was a 148 as opposed to a 47.5 from the second place Ferrari. And that's basically the story. The Porsche has lost pace because the sister Ferrari to this car is just doing its team's job. Indeed, and still stuck there is Matteo Cairoli. So the team Dynamic Motorsport asked for a blue flag and it comes and the Porsche now goes through. So finally, Matteo Cairoli gets by. He's got more traffic up the road, but it'll be much easier. Look, look at the way <laughs> the Porsche is just I mean, allowed to I mean, sort to pass. How blatant yeah. can you be? I mean, you should have waited maybe a couple of corners, but just immediately steps aside to let the sister car go through. But he's done his job. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he wasn't weaving. He was driving at his pace. So... Uh, you can understand the frustration at Dynamic Motorsport. And that's the Iron Dames Ferrari in a problem. So the car that was on target to win the Gold Cup, Rahal Frey at the wheel of it, is off the racetrack. And just as one Iron Lynx Ferrari helps another, the third is off the road. Now, is that trying to rejoin? It is. It's a strange way to stop. I think yeah. you could have moved. The car rolled to the very edge of the entry into turn four. And that looks to be... A hydraulic, electrical, mechanical issue. The team are looking at their, and the Sarah Bovey absolutely distraught, but looking at her face. We have done, having done a great job, Michelle Gatting also doing a superb job. Now the Ferrari engineers are looking at the onboard information that they have, and um, it's at a reset. Well, there it is, the car going slowly on the exit of three. It's almost in limp home mode. It's going that slowly. In fairness to Rahel Frey, she did a, a great job of getting off the racetrack. The, the road was, was clear, and there they studied the data and trying to work out what's dipped, what's gone. Oil pressure, fuel pressure, hydraulics, whatever, if they can look at the data and analyse that and then try and assess whether it can be brought to the pit lane. But that's got a sense of... Doomed. Yeah. It yeah. looks to me as if they're not going to get that car back. If they do get it back, they're out of position anyway. So that is a very sad end to a very fine effort by the Iron Dames here this weekend. It's in a marginal position because I think that car needs to be removed mm. from, it's just too close to the edge of the racetrack. But it could be that under a yellow flag, a, a snatch vehicle go and just drag that away because it's on the tarmac, it should be an easy removal. We'll see, we'll see. The uh, information is that the car has stopped at turn four, the team fully aware of that. So that puts now, despite the damage, Robert Renault's Porsche, into the lead of the class. It's got a five second time penalty though to add on at the end of the race. And the Iron Dames now, they know the car isn't restarting anytime soon. They know that they're losing time, losing laps. Full course yellow is called for by the race director. Well, there's no surprise on that whatsoever. Look at the bodywork or lack of bodywork yeah. on that. I mean, it's, it's a sort of a semi open wheel Porsche. It is, and that's going to give the championship to Oli Milroy, Frederick Shandorf and Brendan Arib after all, if things stay as they are. Right, full course yellow comes that, believe it or not, is our first interruption. So two hours and 20 minutes just, and uh, finally there's a, a full course yellow, and I would imagine this will go to a safety car, but we'll see. It'll not really make a lot of difference in the top three. It will, uh, it will actually help Mirko Porter a lot in most, because he's the one that has dropped back from the lead to his nine seconds behind the second place uh, Ferrari, so he will gain if it is a full course yellow followed by a safety car. Yeah, 
and also Fuoco will gain because he'll get back onto the tail of Kai Rowley. The theory is that it's a gearbox issue for number 83, so if it can hit one Ferrari, could it hit others? Uh, the uh, Antonio Fuoco Ferrari, if this, as we expect, does become a safety car period, that will get right onto the tail of the leader. Uh, just on the, the next shot, assuming we go back to the race leader, let's see. Uh, yes, look at that pink Mercedes that's ahead of the Porsche. Now, at the wheel of that is Valdemar Eriksson. Now, don't ask me how he did this, but Valdemar Eriksson was injured on the grid and spent much of the first half an hour of the race in the medical centre with uh, treatment for lacerations to his head. He's been past fit to race. I know, he tripped over a straw and a hen kicked him. <laughs> That'll be it, the fa famous Barcelona hen. Uh, so, yeah, despite his head, I mean, how you injure yourself to that level on the grid, the mind boggles, no, no, but he's frankly, in the car. You just trip. Yeah. You trip over something, some of the mechanics, uh, you know, the, a, a jack or something, and you, you tumble down and you don't get your hands down quickly enough. And Well, at least he's able to drive the car and we wish him well from a self, a sound, probably a self-inflicted injury, but whatever, it's an injury and he's doing an excellent job behind the wheel of his car. Indeed so, yeah. I hope it's not too painful. The adrenaline will be helping at the moment, that is for sure. Right, so this full course yellow, just to reiterate, is so that the uh, Iron Dames Ferrari can be pulled off the circuit. And then with 38 minutes of the race to go, we anticipate a safety car to get the race back underway, really, to up the pace, to get the tar temperatures and pressures back up. But we await confirmation that the safety car is going to be needed. Again, it partly depends how long the full course yellow period lasts for but uh, there is the Matteo Cairoli Porsche they're still studying data but studying is one thing being able to find a solution is another I mean there's no point in looking at the solution basically the car there it is I mean I think they're having difficulty getting it pulled I mean, look at the destroy look look the girls are absolutely up destroyed but they've done a brilliant job yeah, here absolutely. all weekend absolutely. and they were about I mean, Michelle Gatting's overtake, I thought, was one of the star overtakes of the race. So, having won at Spa, having been looking strong all the way thus far this weekend, fate is being cruel to the Iron Dames, and Iron Lynx could be in for a bad run in the next 40 minutes or so, couldn't it? Because uh, you can see, as the cars come out of the chicane, the number 71 championship contender for the outright crown, still only in second place, and that's not enough to take the title. So is Iron Lynx, having looked as though it was going to win everything, going to go away empty-handed? It will, as I suppose, depend when or if or how long the, the, uh, the safety car will be deployed, because the big beneficiary of that would be, I would have thought, Raffaele Marcello will bring him onto the tail of, of the uh, fourth-place idea of Dries van Thor. Whether they will make any further progress getting past the Audi is another matter, but at least it gives uh, Merco, but, uh, not Merco, but, I beg your pardon, Raffaele Marcello, an option which he didn't have prior to this full course yellow, immediately followed by a safety car, we would imagine. Now, the leader goes through. Fuoco is going to be on his tail. Third place car, Merco Bortolotti. Look how much time he'd lost as well. So Bortolotti was falling away. And then in fourth place, you want Dries van Thor, who is coming over the brown next. And only onto the pit straight is coming Raffaele Marchiello in the 88 Mercedes. So he's a, a long way back in terms of time, and there's a lot of traffic as well. Uh, he's 19 seconds at the moment, even behind Van Thor. And you can see that there are a good four or five cars in between as well. Yeah, it's a big ask for the 88 Mercedes, but, well, Marcello's with the safety car deployment, will use whatever opportunities he has. Um, it's a to find a way to catch the 32 Audi, uh, let alone overtake it with, what, 35 minutes of the race remaining currently. And there it is in P5, you can see on the screen, 005. Go safety car. So now the pace quickens. This is ready for the restart of the race with 35 minutes to go. So, yeah, gaps will come down, but again, it could be a gap to a back marker that you still have to overtake. And there the safety car tries to blend in ahead of the leader, which is successfully achieved, ready for the resumption of the race. So Matteo Cairoli was showing good pace. Is he going to be able to build the lead or is this going to give the advantage to Fuoco? 
He's got, of course, look behind him, Nicholas Nielsen playing rear gunner, in case anybody else wants to try to get up and challenge the Ferrari. Where's Bortolossi? One back marker, two back markers between there he him. Is. But a funny start to the stint for that car, having looked so good at the end of stint two, the start of stint three, not impressive at all, was it? Falling back. Absolutely. I mean, they've got to understand we've seen throughout the, I mean, the Rivera stint in the Ferrari. We can't explain why he lost all that time. Uh, Costa did a brilliant job in the 63 Lamborghini and, and eventually got the lead. And now that car doesn't appear to have the pace that had when Costa was behind the wheel. And it's not a reflection of any of the drivers. There are reasons why. And, um, well, maybe come the end of the race, we'll find out some of those reasons. Well, there's the all. Gold Cup situation. Oli Milroy, Frederick Schandorf, Brendan Nareeb on target to win now. So despite being punted into a spin early on, the car is fourth in class, and it might even do better than that, because bear in mind that Renault's Porsche uh, has a five-second time penalty anyway for the end of the race, and they're on the back of Lucas Auer's Mercedes. Frederick Schandorf might be able to gain places uh, naturally and stretch the margin in terms of points over Renault, Bowen and Alfred Renault, Robert Swift brother. So we await news as to how many laps for the safety car. In part, um, it's to let some of the, the stragglers go. So Valdemar Eriksson, who was just ahead of the race leader, needs to be given a, a lap safety or so to try to get clear. In slam, in slam. Right, we're going to go racing at this time, and that will give us just over half an hour of the race to go, won't it? Yes. So by the time they come back across to our finish line, there'll be about 31 minutes, maybe just over 30 to go. And Antonio... Fuwuka has got to get himself glued to the rear of the Porsche as they come through that sequence at the end of the lap to whatever threat or challenge he can make on Matteo Caroli in the lead Porsche. And Caroli will have to stand up and uh, defend that lead for the best part of 30 minutes. He will indeed. But of course, he can control the restart. He will know when he can accelerate, so he can try and get away to an extent on the restart. He's warming up the tyres again and getting the pressures up. Fuoco has got one job, though, and that's to get past him and win the race. If he wins and the 88 Mercedes stays in fifth place, then that's enough for the Ferrari to win the championship. If the Ferrari stays second and the Mercedes stays fifth, then the Mercedes wins the championship. At the moment, it's as simple as that. Ferrari has got to win the race. Well, I don't know where I'd put my money between the lead Porsche and the second-place Ferrari. Can I also just quickly mention that the Valentino Rossi, Fred Vervich, Nico Muller, Audi is in sixth place overall. We've not really seen it since Valley got out of the car, but uh, Nico Muller did get involved in that tangle with the Porsche, but Fred Vervich up into sixth place. Seventh is Patrick Niederhauser, eighth is Lucas Stoltz, ninth Nick Yellily, who's also done a good job, and tenth is Dean McDonald, as ever doing a good job, and he's leading silver from Thomas Neubauer. Well, Dean McDonald has done an excellent job here all weekend. Mm. Single fastest lap in qualifying this morning and again a standout newcomer to this championship safety car lights off here's the instruction safety car lights off then so the safety car with uh, jeremy doval at the wheel of it will head for the pit lane this time matteo Cairoli versus antonio fuoco the two italian drivers about to go toe to toe for the race lead but fuoco well for him it's more than just the race lead it's the championship lead so there's a lot hinging on this restart for him and he can't overtake until he gets to the line, and Matthew Cairoli will decide when he accelerates. So, into the chicane. Doesn't go yet, doesn't go yet. Green flag, green flag. Green flag on the start line. Now, out of the chicane, Matteo Cairoli floors the throttle, pulls away by length as he comes onto the pit straight, and Antonio Fuoco is not staying with him. Look as they come across the line through the gap as we go racing once more with 79 laps in the book, six tenths. So a little bit of weaving on the straight to try and get tyre temperature back up. Tyre pressures to a lesser degree. You can see Bertel Lotti pulling out to the right, trying to get down into the inside, into turn one, but on board with the Ferrari following the Porsche as they make their way now through turn three. And a great start by Caroli. He did it perfectly just on the exit of turn 15, floored the throttle. The Porsche leapt out of the corner. And Fuoco, who was right on the tail of the Porsche, but just the advantage was to the Porsche driver. But I reckon Cairoli now is going to be able to build this gap. Let's see, Fuoco knows that he's got to get on with this. He's got to get past. The team will be telling him this as well. They'll have kept him appraised of the situation. So Antonio Fuoco now hustles on 
Uh, March yellow to drive through penalty to car 10. Okay, that's the Carrie Roger, Adam Mateki, and colleagues. Car, the uh, number 10 Audi with a track limit offence, uh, one too many. So it's Adam Mateki at the wheel of the car now, but uh, it's getting a drive through for track limit offences. Uh, what's happened? The inception has been overtaken left, right, and centre. What has gone on with this car? This is the car that could have won their championship. Got a problem, hasn't it? It has a problem. It's been overtaken, yeah. as I say, left, right. Uh, there it is, coming down into turn oh. 10. Literally, Lim not Hobo. quite a limp road mode either, but that car is going to go straight into the pit lane. So, Frederick Schandorf isn't necessarily going to be the Gold Cup champion because that car, as John rightly says, is heading for the pits. It's got a problem. So, Frederick Schandorf comes through turn 12. It's, is it stuck in gear? It's in second gear. I don't know what a stream, but he's on the steering wheel. Weaving around, or I can't understand. It's still in second gear. I think it's stuck in gear. It's got a gearbox problem, hasn't it? So the McLaren. Oh, a lock up of smoke coming from the back of the car. It's, it's got, got a puncture. puncture. That's what it is. It's a puncture. Okay, he, so he was in second gear because yeah, yeah. he was coming slowly. So he's been either been tagged or he's picked up something around the racetrack, and that is again, I mean, unpredictable. And well, that's what you get at a restart. Yeah. The car got punted at this part of the racetrack early on, and now, well, that's contact or whether it's just misfortune. Whatever it is, ultimately, it's going to affect the outcome of that championship. It is indeed, right. So, we'll come back to gold in a moment, because that will put the advantage the way of the uh, Herbert Motorsport Porsche in terms of points. Cairoli is now 11 tenths of a second ahead. It was 6 tenths on the restart, 11 tenths by the end of the restart lap. So the Porsche is getting away the dynamic motorsport car that's been there or thereabouts all afternoon has certainly come good in this last stint and there's nothing at the moment that Fuoco can do. Bortolotti, likewise, absolutely mired now a long way back and it's like a different car, isn't it, compared to the one we saw Costa driving? Yes, and I mean, it does take the drivers out of the equation. It's probably down to just whichever set of tyres was available to the respective drivers as we look at driver consistency. Once again, and these are the pro drivers, so it's Raffaele Marcello. I suppose there's no big surprise in that. Fuoco and Caroli, Dries van Thorpel. You've got five of the top drivers in the field, and so unsurprisingly, they're the top, consistent top five. Doing what pro drivers have to do, be flat out and smooth and consistent lap after lap after lap. So, Matteo Cairoli, the third most consistent, is ahead of Antonio Fuoco, the second most consistent, and the most consistent, Raffaele Marcello, is in fifth place, but Fuoco, as I've made the point, is slightly better on the average than is Cairoli, but actually the gap's opening up between them. Yeah, one and a half seconds just over that, and Fuoco has got no answer for the pace of the development over design Porsche 911 in its current GT3 configuration. Out of turn three then go the race leaders, but the margin three laps in a row has been on the increase now. Uh, Mirko Bortolotti behind, his last lap was a 1.49. He's actually being caught a bit by Dries Van Thor. Yeah, but he had to make his way around. He had about like, two cars or three cars between himself and the Ferrari. And he tried into turn one to do that. I don't know what happened on that lap, but he will have made his way through. But that's maybe where the time lost, second to third, has occurred. The inception puncture, uh, Gemma tells us from the pit lane, was down to debris. So that's why the McLaren ended up with a puncture and yes was in second gear because it was going slowly so as not to do more damage it's back on the circuit down in 37th place now but it's the class position that will be affected and therefore as you look at Antonio Fuoco dropping away from Cairoli so we think we now know what's going to happen for the overall championship but what about for the gold cup well that is very much up for grabs because now down to provisionally eighth in class is Frederick Schandorf Van Thor still closing on Bortolotti for third place. They, they just came into shot in the background, so the Lamborghini doing nothing at all about the Ferrari and being caught by Audi number 32. Now, is this where the McLaren of, Brendan, of uh, Frederick Schandorf picked up the damage? Let's see. Yeah, that looks like so either he picked up something or clipped the kerb. Sometimes if you catch a kerb badly, the sharp edges are cut through anything, let alone a piece of rubber. So that was where it all went wrong on the exit of turn eight. And of course, Murphy's law is that, as it was a restart, everybody was around him. There are occasions in the race where the gaps that have opened up and you wouldn't have lost as many places. Uh, you look at Antonio Fuoco going out of turn two, the Iron Dames Ferrari has just been brought into the dead car park 
uh, opposite our window here on the pit straight. But the lead gap is now two seconds. And I don't think necessarily that a Codis ASP can force a smile yet because look behind Marciello, you've got Fred Vavish only now uh, a couple of seconds adrift and that gap's coming down as well. So in goal still, it is by a point, Milroy, Chantorf and Irib that will take the crown, but only by a point. But on track, Marcello is in jeopardy of losing a place and therefore losing the title. Well, there's a couple of cars between himself and Babiche, and Marcello has been working his way through this traffic likewise, so it's maybe a bit of give and take in terms of the gaps between Marcello in fifth place, Fred Babiche. But Fred Babiche has been, I mean, the, the 46 Audi has done a great job all the way through, starting with Valentino Rossi, staying in contact and coming in in 10th position. So, Marcello up the hill. Is there any family assistance for the 88 running down now into comes gets looks to go down the inside, but was it going to be a conceded? No, it's not. And Marcello will be disappointed with that. The only good news is that Fred Babich hasn't been able to make any progress on those back markers either. So there is Fred Babich in the sixth position very busy up around the top of the circuit up into turn 13 so the busier it is the more difficult it's going to be your pace is going to be dictated to by those slower cars directly ahead of you and how do you find your natural momentum to get past and now onto this long virtual kilometer straight here in Barcelona the balance of performance virtually equals out any straight line advantage any one of the brands might have hoped they would have had If Raffaele Marciello loses one place to Fred Vervich, he and the, if it's second, Fuoco Fer Fer Ferrari would tie on points, OK? Then there's a count back. Or there is. Yeah. Now, they've had the same number of wins. Oh. If the Ferrari is second, they'll have had the same number of second places. They've also got one third place each. Uh, so we now need to go back to fourths if, if, if Marciello loses a place. This is going to be one of the tensest tie breaks. It would help matters hugely, Raffaele, if you don't let Fred Vervige pass, trust me on this, but the Audi is getting closer, look, and likewise, Raffaele Marcello wants to get through those back markers as swiftly as he possibly can here. Yeah, and, uh, well, Fred Vervige has got... He's got the pace, clearly, but again, he's got to deal with all the traffic likewise. So up the hill we go into turn 10, sorry, turn 9. But not really in a position to affect an overtake down the hill and traffic blocking and that was a bit clumsy yeah, just look at Fred Babiche frustration setting in you can see just all the way through this long turn 12 the Porsche directly ahead of the Mercedes it's sort of using all the road and more as this the 87 car oh, down the inside is there going to be contact is there contact? Well, yes, there is. The Porsche and the 87 Mercedes. What a surprise that was. You could have written the script for that. So more drama down at the chicane, and that Porsche has had such a seesaw race, hasn't it? It carries on. It's got another queue of cars behind, and now up towards the line they come. So across the line, Fred Vavish, two point three seconds behind Raffaele Marcello. Marcello, unfortunately, an 8.1 second gap to the fourth place, the potential fourth place of Dries Van Thor. And Van Thor himself is now only 1.3 seconds behind the third place, Mirko Bortolotti. And number two, we haven't seen an awful lot of number two. Lucas Stoltz down in eighth position. And that was a car that one would have thought might have been well, they did start back on the, the fifth row of the grid, but it's not really come forward at any point. Lucas Auer's got a bit of bodywork on his. Mercedes on the left-hand side, whether well, that's a suspect contact. As the 25, Santos Bacardi follows him through. So back up the hill into turn nine. And that's a real case of follow my leader as they drop downhill. You can see Vavish there, just turning into turn 10, 57, and that's a car that's not in this race. It's just a number of cars are being overtaken, lapped. Look at the bodywork damage on that left side. 
Right, 20 minutes to go. Matteo Cairoli through in the race lead still, and Antonio Fuoco hustles on behind him. That margin is 1.9 seconds now, so it's not coming the right way, is it, for the Ferrari? So it is still for the championship, the Mercedes that's got the advantage, assuming they stay ahead of Avish. So Hop skipping a jump over the curb in turn two for Antonio Fuoco. 1.9 seconds behind the Porsche, and the gap is extending fractionally, really, by the lap. 19 and a half minutes of this race remaining. And it's still not a done deal, both for the race win or for the championship. Fuoco has taken time out in those couple of last laps. A small amount on lap 85, a slightly better amount on lap 84. But overall, the gap, 1.9 seconds. So there we've got the lead situation, nearly two seconds between the pair. Mirko Bortolotti still dropping back in that third place, but Dries Van Thor for the moment has plateaued as well. 1.4 seconds back, and uh, that they are just in the background of the shot. Now, Raffaele Marciello. Incident between car 911 and 87 in turn 14 noted. OK, so that was the most recent incident involving the Herbert Motorsport Porsche number 911. Uh, right, what about uh, Raffaele Marciello? Is he clear of the traffic now? He is, and he's getting away once again, isn't he, from Fred Vervich. That margin has gone up a little bit. Vervich being held up slightly there, look, by number 11 Audi. Yeah, but does a good, clean overtake up the inside and uh, didn't really lose too much momentum. So Fred Vervich continuing to that charge. It was 3.2 seconds behind Marcello as they came across the line at the start of lap 86. There is the 88, so there is Fred Verviche. So he is closing down. You can see one lap, it took nearly a second. I suspect that was traffic then. The following lap, he himself lost over a second and then just under a second. So I suspect that that was traffic related. Over the timing line goes Fred Verviche then. So running in sixth place. And also going nicely on the inside there, number 25. That is Patrick Niederhauser. He's running seventh, the Hockenheim winner. The Santa Lock out has been another one that's been under the radar a bit in this race, but we've had an awful lot else to think about, especially within this last hour. 17 and a half minutes to go. Uh, 1.7 seconds, the lead gap. Down slightly last time, Cairoli against Fuoco. And Marcello is still there in his fifth place. So that is still good enough with the Ferrari seconds to give them the championship. Silver being led on track by Dean McDonald there, having carried on the good work of Nicolai Sheergaard and Manuel Maldonado. So we've got the 38, Judo McLaren ahead of uh, Garage 59, 159. And that's just happened, I think. Marvin Kirchhofer has just got ahead of Dean McDonald because Kirchhofer was behind at the start of a lap. So that has happened on this lap. They came across the line, the positions were the other way around, so Kirchhofer Certainly justifying his position in the Jota McLaren team and Dean McDonald not on his race and let the other car go because Dean McDonald's position is uh, very strong. So there is 159. Dean McDonald still looking good. This is the charging Fred Verviche, but charge he might, but he is falling away now. Three and a half seconds he's dropped back from Marcello, and there's also a back marker between to act as a buffer. So now things are a little bit more positive for Akonis ASP. Tense, but a bit more positive perhaps. One car that sadly has, has fallen away over the course of the race, having been good early on. It was a slow first pit stop, I'll grant you, but 1-1-1, the Christian Clean, Vincent Abril, now Dennis Lind, McLaren, down in 13th place. It was fourth, remember, for the first hour, but it's not featured at all since it lost places in the first pit stops. But uh, here for a top six finish to round out the season, Fred Vervich, Nico Muller and Valentino Rossi, that will be a really good way to end the season. Yes, he'll be happy with that. It's always good to end the season on a positive, a strong note. A lot of drivers like to start the season strongly and sometimes it doesn't follow through. What a mix of different classes all almost tripping over one another to try and capitalize on a slow car directly ahead of them and wrong foot the one that might be challenging them and look at Kirchhofer right on the tail now of Nick Yellowly in the 98 Rover Racing BMW so through they turn 
there is Dean McDonald then, having now uh, got ahead of Thomas Neubauer, a few laps back, but Neubauer coming back at him in the Audi, so uh, on track, this is the battle for the class lead in the championship, of course, WRT have already won it, uh, Thomas Neubauer, Jean-Baptiste Simonau, Benji Goethe, but for the class win in the race, still Dean McDonald just hangs on and he tries to get that Mad Panda Mercedes between him and his rival. Yeah, it's a nice pass, I mean, the Mad Panda didn't make it difficult for Dean McDonald and the steps out of the way, so... Well, that is right now. You get his Yuzuki Alperez compact behind the wheel. So he did a good job as aware of what was going on around him, let those two cars continue their own battle. But look how close Neubauer is to the back of Dean McDonald. And you have to think that right now the Audi looks to be the car with the greater momentum. But he's got the momentum, but he may not have enough gas in the tank to find a way around. Well, we've seen how difficult it is to make easy progress look at the way that Albert Costa in that middle stint caught and then had to work so 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 hard to find a way through so there is then the Audi Thomas Neubauer at the wheel of it crawling all over the back of Dean McDonald 13 and three quarter minutes of the race to go now gap 1.6 seconds first to second both already falling back five seconds behind the second place Ferrari so really it's now just a two horse race not just to the chequered flag, but to the championship. Absolutely right. And although they can't win the silver championship, Dean McDonald can at least win a class. Uh, Jules Gounal probably doesn't know where to look for the overall situation. Right now, though, he could be, should be champion, Gemma. Jules, you're literally standing here with your fingers crossed on both hands. Just tell us, at the end of your stint, you had a slow puncture? Yeah, we actually are really, really lucky. I had a slow puncture three laps at the end of my stint, which is the pit window open. You know, in GT World Challenge, you cannot exceed a driving time of one hour five, and uh, I couldn't box, so I had to finish the three lap with 0 0.80 bar on the tire at the end, so it was kind of very, very lucky. I don't know, 20 minutes to go, something like this. I don't want to watch anymore. Danny is having a massage to not watch, so we don't want to watch. We just cross fingers. We'll keep them crossed for you. 14 minutes. Thank you. It's going to be one heck of a massage to relax him for all of this uh, stress and tension. So, yeah, I mean... How to win a championship it's not always about winning the races it's about being consistent keeping out of trouble and an element of what befalls the opposition of course and in the case of the akodas 88 mercedes it was a bad pit stop they lost five seconds in one of those pit stops and that is something you cannot afford to do with the quality and the competition directly ahead of you nick yellowly has a little look down the inside ahead of marvin kierhofer who would probably like to follow him through down to turn one they go then they're number 30 that is the Thomas Neubauer driven Audi falling away look from Dean McDonald so they were close a lap ago but Dean now asserting himself and stretching that margin uh, heading up towards uh, the one second mark now 12 minutes are on the clock again a huge amount of traffic turns through Nick Yellowly up into ninth Marvin Kirchhoff a tenth on his tail so BMW versus McLaren that actually is, is looking as though the gap might be coming down given Kirchhoff as pace but behind them there's the Silver leading McLaren, still Dean McDonald's hustling on. Now, what's going on in gold? We've got another new leader. That's now Lucas Auer, who is ahead of Arjun Miney, who's Mercedes led early on with Hubert Haupt at the wheel. And third in gold is Norbert Siedler, whose car started last of all on the grid. Kirkhofer goes through. And he's certainly getting closer to Nick Yellowly, isn't he? So as Nick flashes the lights at the traffic ahead, in fact, at Arjun Miney, who's on a, a different lap, so Marvin Kirkhofer closes right onto the tail as they break for turn 10 now. I thought Nick Yellowly was not just feigning a move, I thought he might take the punt down the inside, but he felt that he was too far back, not to, didn't want to risk it, so he still has got the Mercedes right in his face. Coming up again to the conclusion of lap 91, Lucas Hauer in that gold leading Mercedes. There is the BMW, there is the McLaren directly behind. So it's a problem for Nick Yellowly to find a way around the Mercedes. And I suppose one would think, oh, look, that's getting a little bit testy coming down into the braking zone. 
Well, number four, Mercedes, Janis Fitcher, 57, Lucas Auer. Uh, Lucas Auer, the man that leads the Gold Cup at the moment, but look who's on his tail, it's Arjun Maini. So the middle of those three Mercedes is in jeopardy of losing the class lead. Arjun Maini now tries to make a move, but first of all, Lucas Auer wants to get past Fitcher, so he covers off the inside line, round the outside, tries to go the Indian driver there. And all of this is ahead of Nick Yellily. Miney gets run out wide. Yellily gets up the inside. They're on different laps. So this is a battle between back markers ahead of a car on the lead lap. Arjun Miney doesn't want to let the BMW go. He doesn't want to lose out against the sister Mercedes. And there's the McLaren directly behind yeah. Kirchhofer, who's sitting there watching. Now, look, Nick Yellily's gone all over the racetrack. Parts he wouldn't probably use to try and put himself into a position to find a way past these three Mercedes. So he comes out of turn eight slightly quicker. But again, the, the opportunity doesn't exist. So uh, through turn nine and the run down into turn 10. And well, what do you do? You haven't got the pace to find a way around as these three battling Mercedes seemingly oblivious to what's happening behind. Out of turn 10 then. So Lucas Auer defending for all he's worth against Arjun Maini. So yeah, the team will be telling them probably about the traffic, but the main focus is on their lead battle for the class, 25th and 26th overall by R, as you can see on the Lumi rank display that uh, switches between the overall position and the short code for the driver's name, so the fans here know what they're watching and who they're watching driving the cars. Into turn 16 they come, but Lucas Auer for the moment looks like he's just asserted himself enough. And those behind the BMW and the McLaren likewise are being dictated to by the pace of those three Mercedes. So where are we? 1.5, se 1.6 seconds first to second. Then a further seven seconds behind is the final podium position to the Lamborghini and Marcello is 10 seconds now behind Dries van Thor with only eight minutes remaining. So he ain't going to make any further progress other than of something unforeseen in these closing minutes uh, were to, to arise. And he's just seen Dennis Lind as well charging along. He's put himself onto the back of Thomas Neubauer now. So Audi versus McLaren here. This is the 12th place overall. And they're all getting a bit stuck because of the Mercedes gold lead fight further up the road. There is Lind going through in the McLaren. It's good to have Dennis back in the championship. We saw him in uh, sprint, of course, at Valencia as well as these endurance rounds. And like all the McLaren teams, JP has made good steps forward with that car over the year. You know, look, Lucas are getting away a little bit. Here's the leader. And how many laps is he going to squeeze out of this? It's going to be seven and a half minutes on the clock. He's got about four more laps, hasn't he? Yeah, the, 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 the lead was 1.6 seconds a lap ago. Wait to see what it is as they come across the line. And it is 1.5, so just under a tenth of a second in, in round figures. But it's, again, the same old story with seven minutes or so remaining. You might get onto the tail of the lead car, but will you find a way around the lead car? But there's a man who's on a charge. Dries van Thor closing down that gap to third place. And it's not inconceivable that that Audi could be the final car on the winner on the podium. Mm, absolutely right. So Dries van Thor charges on the farewell, if you like, of the Audi WRT relationship. Might end with a podium. It will do in silver, but uh, not necessarily overall, unless Dries can be a real hero with just under seven more minutes of the race to go. He's back on the power now, coming out of turn four. Drop down towards five. Rhodes plunges down the hill. Sharp left-hander, back on the power. It opens up a little bit, kink at six, and then another sharpish left into the more gradual uphill right at turn eight. Well, two very good natural-born racers. And it'll be the same old story you can catch, but where are you going to find a way through? And certainly, I can assure you, Mirko Bottolotti is not going to give him an invitation to take away that third position. He'll do whatever he needs to do with seven, sorry, six minutes now of the race remaining. Indeed so, as they come once more down into the left-hander of turn 10. And a change there, look, Arjun Maini goes through for the lead of the Gold Cup, gets himself ahead of 57, Lucas Auer. So Arjun Maini goes back into the lead of the Gold Cup in the race, not championship, but the race situation. Five minutes, 58 seconds and counting, and a new class leader. They are still fighting right the way to the flag, aren't they? I mean, it's a great battle between these three Mercedes, each different categories, and uh, somewhat to the frustration of Nick Yellily, who's now got the... Marvin Kirchhoff from McLaren looking like it might even threaten to move down into turn 10, but thinks the better of it. Nick Yellowleek still looking for a way past the traffic, Kirchhoff likewise, and 
there. We've got the silver lead having changed as well. So that's now Neubauer ahead of Dean McDonald. And having got clear of the McLaren, he's getting away. Thomas Neubauer, the champion anyway this year, tries to break away as they drop down the hill. And Dennis Lind out of the pro class in the McLaren is right on the tail as well. So again, because they're all bunched up like this, there's the chance of more things happening up towards the timing line once again. We've now done 93 laps. We've got just over five minutes of the race to go. Race leaders go through then. Down towards turn one and look on the inside. Arjun Miney now a little bit stuck behind Yanis Vitya in his silver class Mercedes. And Neubauer riding the curb as Dean McDonald tries to come back at him. But Matteo Cairoli, 1.6 seconds to the good up front. But just about everywhere you look, somebody's got a fight on their hands. Oh, side by side, oh, coming down into turn four again. This group of Mercedes Nick Yellily thinks, when am I ever going to find a gap? And he might find a gap coming up now into turn five. He's going to down the inside. He gets the BMW alongside and inside. Finally gets clear of one of the three Mercedes directly ahead of him, and that will be what well, was a hard won position. He has to defend it. Mervyn Kierkhofer slides through as well. So he thought he could maybe relax for a few corners, but no, McLaren back behind the tail of the BMW. Absolutely right. So there, the climb as the race leaders come through. They're going to squeeze, still reckon, three more laps out of this. Uh, over the timing line they go then, and Matteo Cairoli leading by mm, 1.2 seconds. Come down a bit, hasn't it? So, it has. Yeah, is that Cairoli driving within himself or Fuoco having one last push? Don't know, but it was three tenths of a second on that last lap that he gains. That's a significant amount of time. And that's why the gap has come down from what was 1.6 down to 1.2. And three minutes, three and a half minutes remaining. So it is not a done deal, but you have to feel that everything is going favorably towards Dynamic Motorsport. That early pit stop when they came in earlier than the others, you saw the Dynamic Porsche in traffic and they decided to come in. And to me, that was the key to why that car has ended up leading this race here this evening. There's not the sap, it's not evening time here at the Circuit de Catalunya. As they're going through is champion elect Raffaele Marciello, that car running in fifth place, hanging on to the position. It's not catching, it's not being caught. Uh, Raffaele doing the laps as into the pit lane has just come Dennis Lind. So we've just been seeing him in a battle and saying how well he was going back up into 11th place and now the JP McLaren down the pit road. Now this happened late in the race at Hockenheim, didn't it? With about 15 minutes to go, the car had a problem, but Dennis Lind has just pitted. There is Raffaele Marciello looking as though the title is going to head their way after all, but it's been a nerve-wracking three hours for them, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was a, not the easiest of starts for the 88 Mercedes back in the fourth row of the grid. And Danny Yucatella took the start. And they're looking at around the front. Is that a brake issue or something suspension? I suspect it might be a brake issue. The way they haven't even removed that left front wheel to look inside to see if there's anything that has gone awry. Let's go back to Marcello. Well, he's just going metronomically through the process now. Two minutes. So they'll come across the start finish line to go on to what will be his penultimate race lap, and there'll be one more following this. In 13th place is Dan Harper's BMW, the BMW Junior entry. If that finishes on the lead lap, it will be the only car in the championship to do every lap of the season. Fascinating fact, 37 of the day. Uh, so uh, that car running in 13th place as there, Danny Juncadea and Jules Gounon have come out to watch after all because Raffaele Marciello is about two laps away from a title now. Indeed he is, and race lead gap up to 1.3 seconds last time across the line, so a tenth to the benefit of Matteo Caroli. And he will come across start finish line to complete what will be lap 96, and there'll be one final lap before the jacket flag. And unless something totally unexpected, unforeseen should occur, it looks like Dynamic Motorsport have done an outstanding job here this afternoon to take victory in the three hours of Barcelona. So Alessio, Alessio Picariello is set for his first Fanatec GT Europe win. Uh, Klaus Backler, Matteo Cairoli, who bookended the race, and it's going to be Matteo Cairoli that brings the car home. But uh, it was an inspired decision to get the car out of that lead battle, put it on new tyres and put it in clear air because that's when it was able to jump from third 
to first. And with half a minute to go off the road goes Fuoco as he arrives too quickly into the chicane. Onto the last lap they come. He's going to be closer. We're not done yet. No, and I mean, I don't know whether that could be... I mean, okay, he's taken about half a second out of the final lead. Lap, the lead is now down to 0.6 of a second. He, exactly half a second was the gain for the Ferrari going through turn 14 and 15. Now, if... I can't imagine there's going to be a change in lead, but that was a caught, uh, caught me on my, my mm. surprise to see what Fuoco did, whether he just carried too much speed and he, he couldn't make the corner. He had to make a, an instant decision. Well, the net result is the gap is certainly down, but Matteo Cairoli is not going to give up this lead without a fight. But at the end of 97 laps of racing, they're going to be absolutely together when they cross the line, aren't they? Cairoli possibly has his tyres going away, possibly driving within himself. But the main aim is to just win the race. But here, Fuoco knows that he's got to win to win the championship, so he's going to push as hard as he can. Yeah, I think Cairoli would be rather surprised to see how close the Ferrari has come to him in the space of that what, last three-corner sector. And uh, wondering, well, where did that come from? I didn't do anything wrong. So why is that car so much closer to me? Well, indeed, it was uh, because of, as we saw, skipping the chicane. But Cairoli wouldn't necessarily know that because he was concentrating on his own line up front. The gap then is down to six tenths of a second onto the last lap. It's closer again into turn 10, but it's going to be a win on the road for Porsche in the race. It's going to be a win in the championship for Mercedes. And Matteo Cairoli then now makes the run up towards turn 12 and Antonio Fuoco has pushed hard he's still pushing hard but he's going to come so close and yet so far from winning the championship some of this you can point to the car didn't have pace at Spa some of it you can point to the dramas at Hockenheim but it is going to be a race win for the Porsche because out of turn 16 comes Matteo Cairoli the final round of Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS Endurance Cup won by Matteo Cairoli Alessio Piccariello Klaus Backler by Dynamic Motorsport and by Porsche. It's a happy team. Antonio Fuoco takes second with Alessio Rivera and Alessandro Pierguidi. Not enough to win a championship because the overall endurance crown is going to be won by Akodis ASP, by Mercedes, by Danny Juncadea, by Jules Gunnar and Raffaele Marciello, who comes across the line now. They finish fifth in the race. That is the championship and there is relief as well as joy. And look at this in gold. Absolutely. No to of contact. Mighty punted off the road by Lucas Al. Two corners from home. And the class leader dispatched towards the barriers. Well, disappointing. That's all I will say about that manoeuvre. Over the line, it is then Lucas Al who takes the category win. But I can't believe that's not going to get away uh, without a penalty. So that was oh so close. And Arjun Miney, given a, a whack in the bat, turned him off the racetrack, didn't it? And the rest of the field comes flooding over the line. Uh, this is the gold champion elect, Brendan Areeb, as well as Frederick Chantorf, Oli Milroy's car. Uh, Akodis ASP have already started to celebrate. And you can understand exactly why, can't you, as the celebrations go on. Jules Gounal, Danny Junkadea now completely different people from that haunted, nervous-looking pair that they were a little while ago. Right, the incident between uh, our and uh, Miney is going to be looked at after the race. No real surprise there, but it does mean that the gold uh, race podium is going to be a little bit in doubt. So here you go, Arjun Miney, he's ahead. Lucas Auer is right with him, out of the corner, tries to go one side, touches the back, and that just turns Miney towards the barrier. Yeah, not, not particularly pretty to watch that, but there's a smiling Jules Gunnar, relieved, I think. I mean, he represents the team. That smile is as big as a... Well, incident between car 57 and 5 under investigation. It wasn't the way that 88 wanted to win the championship. They wanted to win the race to win the championship, but they, they'll take a fifth place. <clears throat> That's all they needed to do to walk away. Uh, Danny Junkadea. And it was a difficult start for him, being the star driver. Normally, one would have imagined he might have been the middle driver. Oh, there's a bit of um, do nothing. I think that's Dries Van Thor in all that smoke. <laughs> I think you're right. That car's up for sale, so you don't need that anymore. It doesn't matter what we do to it or the tyres. Happy days. And a spare, a spare, a spare gearbox yeah. to go along with it, having ragged that gearbox by doing your donuts up a turn. 13, 14, 15 in that space. There's the Mercedes still buried in the, the barrier. That was a bad end, in my view, to what was it been? 
fundamentally a great battle to watch. Absolutely right. So we'll hear from winning drivers very shortly, but uh, there, somewhere in the smoke, there's another Audi being uh, giving Pirelli some more tortured rubber. That's Fred Vavish in the Valentino Rossi shared. Entry, Nico Muller, the third driver of that car as well. They've had a good run to sixth place. So again, you've got, as we said before the race started, teams uh, thinking about a, a, a race result and celebrating accordingly. Think, teams thinking about a championship, celebrating accordingly. And uh, into the victory arch pools then the Mercedes, Rafael Marchiello at the wheel of it. There is the Endurance Cup for the champion. And yeah, it's been in some ways an understated race, a modest race for the team, but uh, the result is there. Rafael Marchiello steps from the car punches the air, he's got the message, he knows they're the champions, and there, Brendan Arib, Frederick Schandorf, Oli Milroy, they take gold. Delighted Raphael Marchiello. He can't say the car wasn't uh, the most competitive, he did, did do the fastest lap of the race, but it did rather seem to depend on what tyres it was running at a given moment, and uh, Jules Gouin on slow puncture, something we didn't know at the time, of course, but that uh, would have explained why his pace was dropping away late in the stint. Well, Raffaele, not always the most demonstrative person uh, when he's interviewed, but uh, I think that he will express himself more naturally. And there, Albert Costa comes along and offers his congratulations. A very sporting thing to do. They, their car, the 63 Lamborghini, Emil Frey Racing, ended up overall third position. And there is Raffaele Marcello with a natural hair color for a change. Normally he comes along with a variety of shades of anything from pink to whatever, orange. And sportingly, Antonio Fuoco goes over to yeah. congratulate him. That's good to see because of course he'll be hugely disappointed. Ferraris this year, as I was saying a few laps ago, didn't really sparkle at Spa, but uh, points lost at Hockenheim too. Let's hear from Raffaele then. Raffaele, congratulations. The title is finally yours. That was tough, but you held on. Yeah, it's really amazing, you know, after Spa, overall, uh, endurance, we we have been great all the weekend, uh, all the season, always on scoring points except uh, except uh, Okinheim. So, I mean, um, I'm really happy for me, the team, because we we started to win this since a long time. Absolutely. It's a well-deserved win and, and a tough, tough race today. I mean, at one point we came into the garage and you guys were like, no, 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 we can't talk. But the relief is there. Jules, you can finally uncross those fingers. Yeah, actually it was painful and Danny was also, oh, what a season, you know, what a season for the team, for Danny, Lelo, me, Akodis, to win Spa, to win the uh, driver title, we always wanted to do it, so amazing title, thanks to Mercedes, the whole team, my teammate, amazing. A year you'll never forget, Danny, look a little bit like it hasn't quite hit yet. Yeah, I mean a lot of emotions of course, and especially after a difficult weekend, a Ferrari on pole, so... Yeah, we didn't really. Uh, we were not really sure we were gonna take it, and uh, luckily, you know, we, the strategy paid in in our favor thanks to the Porsche that won. So, and we managed to get to P5, which is, I think, pretty much the maximum we could get today. So, yeah, great, great to win the championship and clinch off a season like this with Spa as well. So, yeah, fantastic. Well done. Get up on the car for the photographs. So, up jumps Jules Gounon, Danny Junkadea, Rafael Marchiello. So the 88 Mercedes has done them proud. It won at Spa, as you've just been hearing. Uh, and uh, of course, it's had a very successful season. Other than that, second at uh, Imola. Uh, it was third at Paul Ricard, the race that was won by Iron Lynx. And uh, then a win at Spa, but no points from Hockenheim, retiring late race. But here, it's celebrations all round. And uh, if that roof's a bit crinkled, it doesn't really matter now, does it? Now, let's uh, hear from the race winners next. Klaus Backler, uh, along with Matteo Cairoli and Alessio Piccariello. Guys, race winner, Matteo, we'll come to you first. That was a, a stint you had to push the whole time. Yeah, you see my face, probably. Yeah, very hard. <laughs> no, definitely, it was, uh, it was very hard out there, uh, especially seeing Antonio coming, so it was uh, not easy to manage, but, um, you know, at least for once, uh, we had a good luck on our side. Uh, we finished uh, the, season, the season on a high note, so that's the most important. I am happy for the two guys uh, next to me and for the whole team because we deserve more the, during the year. 
but uh, you know it's better uh, late than never. So Abs I'm absolutely, you know, it was a tough stint for all three of you. This race was one that was really full of action. I don't think we've had such a dramatic one all season. Yeah, I mean, it was tough for everybody actually with the tire deck, and uh, so it was, uh, yeah, uh, difficult stints uh, with a lot of fights, and uh, yeah. But I mean, at the end, uh, my teammates were great all weekend long. The team was mega with a really good strategy call with the undercuts. And I think uh, the team deserve it. I'm really happy to share it because uh, yeah, it's only two. My second race is with the team, two podiums, one win. It's really nice. <laughs> well, you got to stay now. Magic touch. Klaus, just a final quick word from you. I mean, uh, honestly, I'm really happy about this victory. Uh, the whole team deserved it. Uh, we spoke before. It uh, was a tough season. Uh, we were leading races uh, like Spa or Paul Ricard, but then in the end we did not finish. So it's a good end of the season. I'm happy about this. Uh, I think uh, we did a really strong job. Uh, from the whole crew, from the whole uh, team, strategy, everything. The car was really quick. So I'm happy and uh, I'm really happy for the whole team, honestly. Congratulations to all three of you. Well done. Thank you. Good to see Porsche coming up trumps because it's not been the best of seasons. I mean, yes, as, as you've just been hearing, they've had speed, but not always reliability. Uh, on other occasions, they've not even had the speed, have they? Well, for me, it's always a pleasure to see Porsche succeeding and uh, they did a good job. And interesting, they confirmed that that undercut pit stop at the end of the first hour was a significant contribution to the success here this afternoon. So Klaus Backler, Alessio Piccariello and Matteo Cairoli take the win from uh, Alessandro Pierguidi, Alessio Rivera and Antonio Fuoco. Third, Marco Bortolotti, Jack Aitken and Albert Costa with Dries Van Thor, Ricardo Feller and Charles Witt finishing fourth. And the champions fifth, Raffaele Marciello, Danny Juncadea and Jules Grunon with Fred Vervich, Nico Muller and Valentino Rossi rounding out the top six. So we've got the race podiums and also champions podiums to come. So it's going to be a long old podium ceremony for which the uh, SRO team have got trophies and hats aplenty. Looking further down the order uh, on the road, gold uh, won in the end by Jens Liebhauser along with Lorenzo Ferrari and Lucas Auer. But the team manager of that car has been summoned to the stewards immediately. So I'm not convinced that's going to stay. Uh, if it doesn't, then it's going to give the class win to number 112, the Matisse Blagic. Norbert Siedler uh, McLaren that they shared uh, with the team owner, Patrick Kuprinski. Uh, the gold championship going to number seven, Ollie Milroy, Frederick Chantel, Brandon Areeves, McLaren finishing in 35th. Remember that had a spin, uh, contact induced, and also a puncture, which lost it a big chunk of time as well. And one of the first retirements, Team WRT's number 31 with early damage and Emil Frey Racing had to park Leo Russell's car that didn't look damaged but had got involved in a scrape or two on the first lap and there was clearly something that put that out. An attempt to Marcus Winkelhock, Kim Lewis Ram, Dennis Marshall car also uh, we lost very early on in the race. So there is the podium, the uh, Barcelona circuit shaped podium. And as the drivers then are set, ready for the uh, podium ceremony. Just reflecting on uh, a race that for the first hour looked a bit of a stalemate, but it built and it built and it built. And uh, excellent to see the dynamic motorsport Porsche coming out on top. So uh, that Porsche with clever strategy, but again, had the pace all day, didn't it? The car had the pace, and that was ultimately the key, but that early strategy, that call, to get in was a smart move. Whoever was working in the pit lane for Dynamic Motorsport read it perfectly, got it in, got the undercut, and that's the benefit of the undercut if you can make it work. Now, there's a lot of traffic around the circuit here. It was a very busy circuit. It was fundamentally a pretty good move. He had one a full course yellow uh, safety car, which uh, for, for this race, normally there's a lot more activity, a lot more action, particularly in the opening lap. Yeah, and that took a long time to come. So let's get to the pro podium. And Mirko Bortolotti, Albert Costa, and Jack Aitken step forward for third place. Congratulations to the Emil Frey racing drivers. Second place, mixed emotions. It's a podium, but it's not a championship for the Iron Links Ferrari drivers as Antonio Fuoco, Alessio Rivera, and Alessandro Pierguidi fight their way through the throng of people onto the podium. That's Alessio Rivera. There is Antonio Fuoco, looking rather emotional, and Alessandro Pierguidi thinks, well, I've won this myself in the past. He would have wanted to have at least have won the race, but uh, it was not to be. It was second in the race, second in the championship. But the race winners step forward, Alessio Piccariello, Matteo Cairoli, Klaus Backler. 
It is a win for Dynamic Motorsport, a win for Porsche. Klaus Backler, Alessio Piccariello and Matteo Cairoli win in Barcelona. So for the Italian Dynamic Motorsport team, the national anthem is played and uh, now the drivers await the presentation of the trophies. So everybody is there. Bottles of champagne are present and correct, ready for the spraying at the end of the podium itself. So now we need a presenter who has entered the podium and there the trophies are set to be presented by Belma Nadarevic, the head of marketing for Fanatec. They go to, first of all, the third-placed crew, Marco Bortolotti, Jack Aitken and uh, Albert Costa, who gets, of course, a big, big cheer on home soil. Then the trophies for second place from Andras Semsi, the CFO of Fanatec. And uh, there, Alessio Rivera, Antonio Furco, Alessandro Pierguidi, gracious in defeat. And Antonio Furco, his time will come, I'm sure. He's been a, a, another great asset to the GT ranks these last couple of seasons and then the race winners trophies are once again presented along with the uh, winning team trophy so to Dynamic Motorsport team's trophy and an inspired decision to get that car as I say uh, out of the traffic a lap early into that last stint so there the winners trophies are presented Klaus Backler, Matteo Cairoli, Alessio Piccariello receive winners trophies and the Dynamic Motorsport drivers celebrate victory in the final Endurance Cup round of the Fanatec GT season here in Spain. So photographs taken, Champagne is there, and the Porsche drivers for the first time this year on the top step of the podium uh, aim to make the most out of all of this. And, uh, I think I said during the course of the race. Good to see Alessio Piccariello back in European racing. He's made a name for himself in the Audi R8 Cup in uh, the GT Asian environment, but uh, coming back for the Belgian driver into Europe. And uh, some people say, who is he? But it's good to have him going so well. So the pro podium done. The drivers take their trophies and the bottles clink their way off the podium. And we get set for the next of the four race uh, podiums. So this is how we are overall in endurance. Uh, a win for Jules Gounon, Danny Junkadea and Raffaele Marchiello. They end the year as champions ahead of Antonio Fuoco. Uh, then, not racing here, David Irigon and uh, Daniel Serra. Uh, Klaus Backler with a variety of co-drivers ends the year fourth. Lucas Stoltz and Stein Schrothorst in fifth. So the podium now being made ready for the next group of drivers which again is all part of the uh, SRO ethos if you like build your grid from the back look after all the customers and these different classes the silvers the golds the pro-ams to give everybody something to fight for yeah I think that everybody has something to aim for mm. as well as to fight for yeah. so the podium is going to be very busy it'll probably be nearly darkness by the time we get through all the ceremonies and all the awards but many of them are very hard earned over the course of a season some of them are earned here just in this one particular event so there will be a party i gather tonight in barcelona i suspect there'll be a lot of celebrations there this evening i think you're probably right so the uh, next drivers being called forward this is the silver podium so we've already seen uh, Constable Apollinen, Mick Vishofer and Stuart White. Now Manuel Maldonado, Nikolai Sheergaard and Dean McDonald. And then the silver winners, Jean-Baptiste Simenau, Benjamin Goethe and Thomas Neubauer will step forward. The WRT Audi squad represented as well. So the drivers all smiles. A win in the Silver Cup for Benjamin Goethe, for Jean-Baptiste Simenau and Thomas Neubauer. So for the 
Belgian Audi team. They will be the team's national anthem, and then the trophies will be presented. So the winning drivers then on the podium, they look out across the pit lane onto the circuit and see Lamborghinis hammering around for VIP laps. So uh, the circuit always being used. Uh, right, the trophies then being presented as uh, Jesus Pozzo, the uh, CEO of Escuderia Targa Iberia, the event promoter, in other words, hands over the trophies to the third place drivers, to Stuart White, to Consta Lapalainen and to Mick Vishofer. And he's done a grand job on this event because it's been a very, very busy circuit today. I mean, it's been a busy weekend, the whole weekend. You, the paddock is absolutely heaving, and that's just for the competitors. And I've never seen as many people here for one of our events in Barcelona as they've been here today. They've had a fantastic day out, non-stop action on the track, whether it was racing or demos, and they're still carrying out. The second-place drivers have received trophies. The winning team, which is WRT, uh, gets a trophy from Jesus Pozo as well. And then once more, the uh, Barcelona Catalunya circuit represented by the circuit chief executive to hand over the winner's trophies. And so Jean-Baptiste Simonard, Thomas Neubauer, Benjamin Goethe, they've had a great season, whether it's been in endurance or sprint. Anthony Comas from SRO, who's the man looking after the FIA Motorsport Games for SRO, looking on from downstairs. He's had a busy weekend too, talking to teams and drivers and. Uh, attracting attention for the motorsport games at the end of this month at Paul Ricard. Uh, now from Pirelli, there is the uh, sets of tyres that are awarded to the Silver Cup season-long entries. It's Matteo Braga, the Pirelli Circuit Activities Manager, who hands over the vouchers for the sets of tyres and uh, handshakes. And then also to WRT's victorious drivers, the voucher for the silver winners. So there, trophies aloft, photographs taken, and the champagne beckons, doesn't it? And this is going to be another messy podium. The podium becomes like a skating rink by the time yep. all the champagne has been sprayed. So you just you come out of that holding area and you need to be careful. You could end up skidding along on a rather slippery podium. One thing I don't miss in life is being the podium commentator at, at, at race events where somebody thinks it's really funny to empty a bottle of champagne over you and you have to drive home smelly, wet, stinking of champagne. Of Not course pleasant. it's funny. <laughs> David, for goodness sake, it's part of the show. Oh, great. That's where I went wrong. Others are welcome to it. Right, well done to the silver winners then and to WRT. Uh, in fact, actually, that the, the number 30 Audi, you could argue, has been this year the standout car. 32 has had its travails in endurance, whereas number 30 has just mopped up. And Benjamin Goethe, Thomas Neubauer and Jean-Baptiste Simonar uh, win the Endurance Cup for the silver drivers from Nicholas Scherl, Alex Arca and Marius Zug. Stuart White and Constant Lapalainen coming home in third. But, uh, yeah, that's something else for WRT to celebrate in what's not been the best of seasons. No, and by their standards, it's not been the best of it, but the number 30 golf-sponsored car has been consistent, and that group of drivers have grown all the way through the season. So we await the next podium. We've got the golds and the silvers. And there, the next group of drivers are called forward for the gold podium. Maxime and Arnold Robert and Rachi Tomita taking third place for WRT. Then for second place, the number one, one, two McLaren squad. That's Maciej Blazek, Patrick Krupinski and Norbert Siedler, who stepped forward, we hope. Norbert Siedler not paying attention. Well, they're all having a little chat amongst their mates. Exactly. Comparing, well, how were your sets of tyres? Yeah. Right, out they come. Maciej Blazek, Patrick Krupinski, Norbert Siedler. They are second in gold. And a very provisional top step of the podium. It's going to be Lucas Auer, along with Lorenzo Ferrari and uh, Jens Liebhauser. They have won on the road, but their team manager is already with the stewards. So you can see there's not a vast amount of joy here as Lorenzo Ferrari, Jens Liebhauser and Lucas Auer step onto the podium. Winwood Racing provisionally win the Gold Cup. 
Lucas Auer, Jens Liebhauser and Lorenzo Ferrari, victorious in Spain. As we've been saying, it could well be an amended result before too long. So congratulations to the winning drivers. One also ought to spare a thought for Arjun Maini, who got punted off on that uh, last lap. Two corners from home. I mean, the, the drama kept on coming, didn't it? The lead gap overall was down to eight tenths of a second at the end. The Gold Cup honours decided at the chicane on the last lap. I mean, regrettably, I have to say, maybe not surprised, but on the other hand, disappointed that that's the way that that battle ended up. I don't like seeing a car being punted off under in these particular circumstances. and. Uh, no, that was not necessarily the best moment for the team. So there, Jose Luis Santa Maria from the circuit presents the trophies for third. Perry Rodriguez, the uh, mayor of uh, Montmelo, a local town, he hands over the trophies for the second place drivers who could yet win this if a penalty heads to win with racing. Patrick Kroprinski, Matic Blazek, and Norman Siedler. And if they were to win, a very topsy turvy race from last on the grid, that would be quite something. I suspect the only penalty that would be applied would be a time penalty which then may see the, the winners demoted from their podium slot. And it's a shame when you go through all the ceremonies and everybody sees it and, and then you, you might have an overturn in uh, the outcome when it goes to the stewards. And there are the trophies for the provisional winners. So that means that the champagne is there, but whether they feel like... I mean, the, the, you can tell they're expecting things to change. The, the, the mood is that of sort of... What is it? Resignation? Yeah, we, we've sort of won, but we, we probably haven't. Big frustration. But uh, Lucas Auer will have some explaining to do, I am sure. Right, that was the Gold Cup podium. We've got the champions yet to crown. We've also got the Pro-Am drivers. Uh, that was the category won by Dominic Bauman, Valentin Pierberg and Ian Loggy on the track in the race. Uh, we'll worry about the championship in a moment. Uh, second was uh, number 91, Alex Malikin and Ayanchen Guven. And third, uh, 52, Louis Machiels and Andrea Bertolini, and that should be enough to give them the championship. In the gold championship, though, Oli Milroy, Frederick Chantour from Brendan Arib, victorious from Rahul Fry, Sarah Bovi and Michelle Gatting, then Robert and Alfred Renner and Ralph Bowen third. You've got to feel sorry for the Iron Dames. Yes, I think they did an, an excellent job. I mean, they were competitive, they raced, they overtook, not, not all yeah, yeah, competitors yeah. can say they actually overtook. So that was a cruel end after a very fine race, but also, you know, they won their category, the gold category in Spa 24 hours, which is a standout performance again from the Iron, D Iron Dames team. And so that now brings us to the Pro-Am podium where we uh, expect Andrea Bertolini to come forward with Louis Machiels and Stefano Costatini in a minute. This is a look at the gold champions. We'll get to them on the podium in due course, but Oli Milroy, Frederick Chantorf, and again, a spin and a puncture, they still prevail, and that means Brendan Arib's flight from America overnight was worth it. Their third in Pro-Am, Stefano Costatini, Louis Machiels and Andrea Bertolini. Uh, for second, Ayanchen Guven and towering over him, Alex Malikin. And the Pro-Am winners in the last Endurance Cup race of the year, a very happy Ian Loggy, who might be British GT champion by the end of the month as well. Dominic Bauman and Valentin Pierberg for the SPS Automotive Performance Team. Up they come. Valentin Pierberg there, Dominic Bauman, and uh, victory for the Mercedes team. Dominic Bauman again underlining his pace, and uh, arguably it's a shame that we see him in a, a pro am car rather than a, a pro entry, because again, he's blindingly quick. So there, the Pro-Am trophies brought forward to Louis Machiels, Stefano Costatini, and to Andrea Bertolini. 
then to second place drivers Action Guven and to uh, Alex Malikin and Pro Am winners Valentin Pierberg, Ian Loggy and Dominic Bauman. Andras Semsi, the CFO of Fanatec, presents to the second place crew of uh, Action Guven and to Alex Malikin. And I give seeing that there are trophies for three drivers per car, they've only got two. Action Guven says, We'll take the trophy, we'll give it to the team. Uh, the winning team will get a trophy as well. There it is. The winning team, of course, being SPS Automotive Performance. And then the trophies to the winning drivers, Ian Loggy, Valentin Pierberg, and uh, Dominic Bauman. And that was a car that in the first stint just looked nowhere, but it shows what perseverance and also uh, circumstance for others can do over three hours, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you've, you've just got to work your way through a very big field 48 car start of the race, and sometimes it's going to take more than a couple of laps you have to work your way through it the strategy also but bringing the car in at the right point can help you greatly so the champagne is sprayed one or two being a bit more reluctant but uh, in the case of the a of course the ferrari drivers they've won a championship so they don't mind celebrating and louis mackiels who says every year this might be my last season but he comes back great enthusiast and he's been a, a mainstay of the SRO grids for a long long time now represents a lot of the ethos and ethics mm. of the whole series tells you right yes so Louis Machiels Andrea Bertolini and Stefano Costantini victorious in Pro-Am and uh, they take the championship from Valentin Pierberg Dominic Bauman in second place Enrique Chavez Miguel Ramos and Alexander West in third so uh, Honours in the uh, Pro-Am Championship to Louis Machiels, Andrea Bertolini and Stefano Costatini at the end of uh, a fascinating all-action end to the Endurance Cup season in Fanatec GT. So the race podium's done. That takes us here to the championship podiums. So I think I'm right in saying that it's just the winners for the podiums. I was told it was just the winners, but we will see. I'm slightly concerned by the amount of champagne that's being brought forward. So uh, we'll find out in a moment as the uh, drivers are ready to be called to the podium. Lamborghinis go through in the background. So, Pro-Am it is, that is going to go first. And the SPS Automotive Performance drivers step to the podium. With the team. So, this is the team's champion. Uh, not the drivers, but the winning team in endurance is the SPS Automotive Performance Squad. So the celebrations for the winning team, there's a team's points award uh, as well as the drivers. SPS Automotive Performance Team, which has done sterling service within both endurance and sprint this year. And so the uh, team on the podium, with more celebrations at the annual SRO Awards, no doubt, as well. Trouble is, they want to be up there and celebrate, but from the organizer's point of view, there are so many podiums to get through. It's a case of, right, you've got your photographs, off you go now, chaps. So uh, the mechanics make their way off the uh, podium. Then we turn our attention to the next celebrations here.
all champagne prepared. The SRO officials dress the podium accordingly with all the sponsors' backdrop on the very clever backdrop for the podium. It's a, a big screen which has been showing the race action for the fans and then it can be used as the backdrop for the podium. Right, now Endurance Pro-Am drivers. So this is where Louis Machiels, Stefano Costatini and uh, Andrea Bertolini step forward as the Pro-Am champions. Congratulations to Louis Machiels, Andrea Bertolini, once again taking Pro-Am honours and the team's champions, AF Corsa in the Pro-Am Cup overall. So by taking endurance and uh, sprint together, it's Pro-Am honours in the team section for AF Corsa and the endurance, I think I'm right in saying, overall as well for Louis Machiels, Stefano Constantini and to Andrea Bertolini. So congratulations to the winning Pro-Am drivers and team, AF Corsa and Marto Ferrari's team that's normally to be found running multiple operations around the globe on any given weekend. So the drivers spray the champagne, make their way back from the podium and AF Corsa once again doing a great job. And again, a race in which they had to come back from an early setback, that puncture costing them a big chunk of time early doors. Yes, I mean, setbacks have to happen early in the race, you've got a chance to recover late in the race. And that's sadly not going to be much help to you. So, hey, of course, uh, Louis Machiels, the two of them are like, you know, strawberries and cream. Yeah. <laughs> but they work well as a partnership, don't they? So the, the Pro-Am champions then, the crew of number 52 Ferrari, AF Corsa, Stefano Costatini, Louis Machiels, Andrea Bertolini. So then we turn to the next category. And it's going to be the gold, where there, Brendan Arib, Ollie Milroy, Frederick Schandorf are ready. Out they come. And the Inception Racing team celebrates as the team's champion. So drivers and teams together on the podium. Congratulations to Inception Racing, the gold champion drivers, Ollie Milroy, Frederick Schandorf and Brandon Arib, the gold endurance team's champions, Inception Racing. So the champagne sprayed from Inception Racing and the delighted Brendan Arib making that flight from America to come and race in Spain and uh, he's been rewarded not with a class win on the track but in the championship and uh, for a relatively young team stepping up to the big league that's been quite a result. So there, the winning Inception Racing drivers and uh, engineers. And uh, Frederick Schantorf, Ollie Milroy, Brendan Arib have done a, a great job. A very happy Ollie Milroy. Ready to make his way off the podium. Somebody else that's flown under the radar a bit of late. He's done much of his recent racing in Asia, but uh, again has come back into European racing and uh, done a very, very good job. So gold won by Frederick Schantorf, uh, Brendan Arib, and Ollie Milroy and the Inception Racing 
squad taking the team's title as well. Then for Garage 59, out come the overall Pram champions, Alexander West and uh, Miguel Ramos. Alexander West, I think, has already departed. So Miguel Ramos, who has done a sprint with Dean McDonald and endurance with a different set of co-drivers, so yes, forgive me, it is just Miguel Ramos who is the overall Pro-Am champion. But a very happy Miguel Ramos who has won many a title over the years. And uh, although touring cars have been on his CV, so too have uh, been the uh, mainstay of GT racing of late. So well done to Miguel Ramos, Portuguese driver set to make his way off the podium. And Garage 59, again, a mixed day. One car in strife, that car, in fact, right at the start of the race. But the Silver Cup entry, John, showed good pace. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think Silver Cup has been a great success. In fact, there are probably more Silver Cup runners here this weekend than there were pro cars. So that has been, uh, I think, a very, very competitive championship to be in and the winners can walk away rightly feeling we've done a good job so from the pro-ams and the gold podiums the next group of drivers trying to be marshaled into place so silver i think he's going to be next which has been thomas neubauer jean baptiste Simonau, and benjamin goethe uh, for the bulk of the season, just uh, con con convincingly winning the class. So, in a moment, those drivers will be called forward. And there, the silver champions, Benjamin Goethe, Thomas Neubauer, they step forward. Jean-Baptiste Simonau will join them because he is the endurance champion, but not the overall, because he's not done sprint. Sprint's only for two drivers. So you've got a mix here of endurance uh, and of combined champions in silver. It is one podium for all. So congratulations to WRT, to Jean-Baptiste Simonau, to Thomas Neubauer, and to Benjamin Goethe. A clean sweep in silver for Thomas Neubauer and Benjamin Goethe and for the endurance, as we've been saying, joined uh, by Jean-Baptiste Simonau. But uh, we've said it over the year, Benjamin Goethe hasn't half improved as a driver. I think that you might say that was it's the most improved team, in other words, group of drivers, two or three, depending, over the season. And Benjamin Goethe certainly has made, I would say, big, big strides and coming in as a kid, what, five years ago, four years ago, and uh, to where he is now. And, being able to win their category. I think they should be very proud of what they've achieved. And for WRT, it's a success that they will no doubt reflect back on uh, with great enjoyment and pleasure. I think you're probably right about that in what's been a, a tough season for the normally all-conquering WRT, but uh, comes out on top in silver as then the uh, overall category and the overall podium, if you see what I mean, is going to be next. What used to be and is still unofficially called pro but uh, it's the overall class as there the WRT team sets off to celebrate. So the winning drivers for the uh, overall podiums step forward. And uh, the champagne being readied, the trophies are there and our next group of drivers then ready to be called forward. So in uh, endurance, Overall, we know that it has been the uh, Akodis ASP Mercedes team that's come out on top, and uh, Danny Junkadea, Rafael Marcello, and uh, Jules Gounon will be called forward in a moment. Rafael, I suspect, has done enough to win the, I think we've already asserted that, has done enough to win the Combined Drivers' Championship. 
Oh, he did that in the Valencia sprint weekend. So the WRT drivers clear the podium, and so we await our final group of drivers. So that means that up can come from Acodis ASP, our drivers' champions. Raffaele Marciello, who is the overall drivers' champion, the endurance champions with him, Danny Junkadea and Jules Gounon, and the winning team of Akodis ASP that takes the overall uh, team's championship. So there, Akodis ASP, Jules Gounon, and Raffaele Marciello with Danny Junkadea, the endurance champions. The overall combined champion is Raffaele Marciello and the winning team from Endurance this year, Akodis ASP, and that, I think, taking also the overall team's championship. So there, one mighty podium. Endurance champion team, overall champion team, Akodis ASP. The Endurance champions, Raffaele Marciello, Danny Junkadea, and Jules Gounon. The Endurance, sorry, I should say the overall champion is Raffaele Marciello. The trophy is presented, the champagne will be sprayed in a moment, and in there is the 2022 Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS. Overall champion, Raffaele Marciello. The endurance champions, Raffaele Marciello, Danny Joncadea, and Jules Gounon celebrate here in Barcelona. So congratulations to our champions. And as they celebrate, let's look back at the highlights of a great end to the season that began with the Ferrari taking the lead in the hands of Alessandro Pierguidi on the run down towards the first corner. Battles are plenty raging on around him, including Valentino Rossi, who was trying to get himself up through the order. The Sky Tempesta racing Mercedes, battling long and hard. But at the end of the first lap, the first drama came. Finley Hutchison turned around. He was collected by Alexander West's McLaren, and that headed into the pit lane with plenty of damage. Later in that first stint, Brendan Arene tacked into a spin. Others scattered in avoidance, and that put the inception race in McLaren very much on the back foot. More battles raged on all the way around the circuit. Fantastic duels going on in all the classes. And at the end of the first hour, the pit stops came with the 88 Mercedes in for Danny Junkadea to give way to Jules Gounon. Then we had Nico Muller getting involved with Giorgio Roda, although no action was taken as the Porsche ended up in the wall. And it was a good effort by Ricardo Feller in the middle stint to get himself into fourth place and tee up Dries Van Thor for a charge in the final hour of the race. Jules Gounon battled on as best he could, but his stint was affected by a deflating tyre uh, late race. And it also meant that the battle for the race lead became Alessio Rivera and Albert Costa, who eventually managed to wriggle away through just before the car stopped. But it made a bad pit stop relative to the Ferrari and slipped back behind. But the Dynamic Motorsport Porsche came in a lap earlier. It therefore was ahead. We had a full course yellow to safety car after the Iron Danes retired from the race and lost the Gold Cup in the championship. And it meant that on the restart, the Porsche led the way. Klaus Backler, Matteo Cairoli and Alessio Piccariello on target for a race win as Raffaele Marciello, Jules Gounon and Danny Drunkadeo's fifth place was enough to take the championship. Thanks for your company this year. We look forward to seeing you at the Motorsport Games at the end of the month. But from all of us in Barcelona, goodbye.